Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Alliance Tournament 18. We have finally made it. It is old enough to drink. We're going to share a mimosa. And we are going to look forward to some exciting matches over the next four days. We have 32 teams. That's quite strong. Uh, 32 teams, 70 matches. And I personally guarantee all the explosions that you could possibly ever ask for. I'm Ithaca Hawk. I've got a whole crew here with me that to help bring this incredible feat of eSports to your very eyeballs. And we are basically ready to get going. We have our first teams in the arena ready to go. It is Truth, Honor, Light, and they're going to be going up against A Hail No. Uh, I'm super excited to see what happens with those two teams. Truth, Honor, Light, of course, the defending champions in their previous guise as Hydra Reloaded. Uh, can they make it a twofer? Can they win two in a row? Will We Form Volta manage to take gold this year instead of silver? Or will it be some other team that no one knows about just yet? Well, I mean, we've got four days to find out. Um, but, I mean, I think we should get started. I, I want to see all these explosions. Um, we're apparently not ready to go to the arena. Um, so let's just, uh, let's just look at Twitch chat. Hello, Twitch chat. How are you guys doing today? Uh, I see many of you in there um, getting ready to, to watch these explosions, which, to, to point out, guaranteed, guaranteed. Um, hey, I think, uh, where is Nash? Nash is through there. So uh, let me introduce some of the other people that we have, actually. So we've got a whole bunch of people that you will see on the desk. We're going to have Mystical Might. We're going to have Black Bart Pirate. We're going to have the Basilisk. We're going to have Jin Tan. I'm joined by some incredible CCP guests. CCPB, CCP Swift, CCP Zealous is here. Uh, we have Bay Art J behind the scenes, Biohazard. Uh, we have Nash Cadaver. We have so many people making this happen. And we have this incredible venue. I mean, we are sitting right now in Jita 4.4. Uh, all the way in space, looking out the window, uh, and I. Uh, this is this is an incredible, cre incredible set. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I'm just going to ask our production crew: Are we ready to go to the arena? We're going to throw a next match graphic instead. Let's do it. Let's have a look at what's, what's coming up next. So here we see Truth, Honor, Light versus Ah Hail No. So the uh, the red team, Truth, Honor, Light, banning out the Deacon, the Ishtar, and the Stratios, whereas Ah Hail No banning out the Blackbird, the Carries, and the Jackdaw. The trickle bands uh, are Ship, Ship, and Ship, as well as Ship, Ship, and Ship. Uh, interesting choice of bands right there. I personally would ban ships as well. Uh, that's probably a good 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 move. I see what looks like a Maelstrom and uh, five Deacons being banned there. Um, so the captain of Truth on a Light is uh, Dexter, a.k.a. Uh, from Hydra Reloaded last year. And for Ah Hail Not, it is Daniel. Um, the Oh, we're back to me. Um, <laughs> there's so many uh, experienced pilots here. Um, I'm, I mean, we have Mystical Mike. He's, uh, we're ready to go to the match. Let's go, let's go see some explosions. Uh, welcome to the match, boys. Uh, looks like some of the ships haven't quite arrived yet. I think they're having some trouble warping in. But we have a triple BC core with an Osprey versus, well, at the moment, it's a single Nighthawk who's ham sitting at zero, wondering where his friends are. I'm, of course, joined by Zoo, mate. How you doing, brother? Oh, good in yourself. Interesting here. I'm just wondering if it is just a failure to show or if we're having some technical difficulties at here. Um, it seems by local chat, they're having some difficulties with warping. Referees will sort that out, but so long, we can just take a look at the comp here from Truth, Honor, Light. Seen a attack battle cruiser tornado. I'm always interested to see those because they have more of a rep of being kind of glass cannons. Um, what weapons are we seeing on that NATO and what do you think about it, Wingnut? Uh, we're seeing some interesting stuff for sure. I I'm more looking at the fact that we have a uh, Harbinger Navy with an Osprey. But yeah, those should be auto cannon nados, I believe. That doesn't look like artillery to me. So that's, also a, lot that's a lot of DPS in that team, to be fair. That's a lot of DPS. And it looks like the rest of the ships are finally arriving. Huzzah. Oh, I think, and it seems we will actually have a uh, good match to start off this tournament, luckily. So uh, teams will just be sorting them out. So rest will sort that out if there's any penalties to apply, which I assume is happening considering a bunch of warp to zeros there right now. But we will have a match on the way, and we are seeing Gila's. I'm excited to see if these things are going to um, follow through with that absolutely uh, awesome reputation they have right now. Do you think the Gila's still in a strong position right now, Wingnut? Gila's are always strong. That's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately. I'm not a fan of them. Re, please nerf. But... They're honestly going to be very interesting, interesting to go against this uh, opposing comp. I, I'm not sure what's going to happen, to be honest. This is interesting. 
is going to be interesting. Um, I like seeing the Slepnir. I like seeing the Nighthawk. I like command ships in general. Slepnir is always a tough cookie to crack in general. Teams normally face a bit of a dilemma once there's a Slepnir on the field. Um, some teams think, like, you know, kill the Slepnir once you have the most DPS on field. Slepnir having a ridiculous tank bonus and making use of XLASB shield boosting to supplement its tanks while there's Logi still on grid. So some teams think, hey, let's crack it while we have the most DPS. Some teams leave it for loss, thinking, why bother? But then, obviously, you're going to be sitting there for Slepner with a lot of self tanks on field. And we've seen a couple of matches before in the past where uh, Slepner just carries the match. But we do have the match underway here. Indeed, we do. <laughs> See what goes first. This is going to be a lot of DPS from the uh, Truth on a Light team. But there's also a lot of DPS on the Ar Hell Now team as they charge in with their the Hamhawks. So we're seeing the T1 Osprey here on the uh, true side uh, backing off there. They're all retreating back to that engineering back, being rushed right now by All Hail Now. Um, Tornado left, the Glass Cannon, they're definitely going for it, but a lot of uh, pressure on that free Logi of the Kirin right now, Ducks there. So it looks like they're trying to get rid of the Logi support first before taking out anything bigger. I'm trying to see what else they're shooting. Are they just shooting the Kirin? Okay, there we go. They're shooting the Gila now. NATO's about to die already. That's way too late. They finally got to target onto the, the Gila, but they've already lost a massive chunk of DPS. That is not a good start for them, but they are ripping through this Gila still. Looks like they were probably trying to try their luck on Dark Slayer and the Kirin there. So Frigloji obviously having a low SIG, seeing what they could apply, seeing that they couldn't apply and going for the Gila and successfully following through on that. So that's also removing a lot of damage uh, on the opposition side there of All Hail Nah. Going for the second Gila now, uh, obviously at the advantage of getting rid of these Gilas is the longer the match goes on, the more kite potential these Gilas might have to just live to win at the end. But getting rid of them now, uh, they can just uh, make this a full-on brawl if they need to. Uh, Pressure being split there as well now to the Scalpel as the second Gila goes down. Yeah, Gila's actually a painful nut to crack through. It looks like a Scalpel's being ripped apart as well, but the uh, the random unicorn of a shield hard navy is currently surviving a lot longer than the NATO did. And we see Nighthawk taking damage as well as a Scalpel and Kirin. So they're trying to go for the Nighthawk now, trying to remove the last big chunk of DPS, except for that Slepnir. Oh, that's... Uh... Bad situation here, I might say, for uh, all hell no. I mean, they're only now working on their second DPS ship. The tornado went down. Obviously, that's a lot of DPS off the grid. Harbinger Art Navy is like, looks like he's pretty much secured the kill on them. Um, so good job on there, getting a lot of DPS off the field once more. The Nighthawk of Daniel getting a bit low there. Um, but the Frig Logi on uh, all hell no side doing a good job of holding himself up, even with that split damage. So we're going to have to see here, although, you know, Logi's up still on both sides. So if this uh, command ship of the Nighthawk goes down here on all hail now's side, I think it could be a pretty good shot here for Truth Honor, and considering no pressure is coming onto that Osprey of theirs. Yeah, it looks like they're now switching onto an exact navy, but that Nighthawk is now going into Hull. He's lost his massive shield bonus, and he's about to get killed, and that's going to be, honestly, a pretty painful death knell to this comp. They're going to try and kill the Zek Navy under Osprey reps. The Osprey does have two flats of uh, Hornet ECs on him. Might buy them a bit of time, but I don't think they can rip through that as a stalk just gets deleted. Boom. Absolutely gone. Interesting we can note here, the Hakari on true side of Nith. Um, looks like he's just playing, dedicating to that screen position, making sure that Osprey stays safe. So, you know, a lot of people might have spelled blood in the water and maybe dedicating themselves in, but he's playing his role. They're keeping that Osprey safe. Unfortunately, Truth does lose another ship here going down, but I feel like they're in a quite comfortable position here as uh, all hell now loses their Skybreak here. Yeah, that's absolutely brutal. They've got a slip down. Like, there's a lot of DPS, but unfortunately that Osprey, is, as you said, is being protected by the, um, by the Hecate. But then again... Yeah, never mind. That, that's also a friendly sci-fi also protecting the Osprey. So they are really, they know exactly what this team needs to win, and they are going to not allow that to happen. Well, we'll say protected. The flycatcher there of Bulky uh, did a dive down. No one moved to intercept him. He could have probably actually made a beeline right for the Osprey, but he seems to be more focused on a rupture there right now, I think. Not to show what's happening there. He had a pretty clean sweep there. That Kade actually didn't move to intercept him now. Probably only waking up now, but... Um... Not sure if this is really a salv salvageable position, but we do see the Vulture of Nick getting a bit of damage here. What do you think about a Vulture actually being on grid here right now, Wingnut? Tanky boy. Very tanky boy. I'm, honestly, I'm not entirely sure. It probably does go a lot of DPS with the... Uh, I'm just double-checking if that's Rails or Blasters. Pretty sure that's Rails. Uh, but it's honestly a very, very brutal tanky ship, and the instant applied damage compared to the Nighthawk could be very useful. Also doesn't require that much application help. So Nighthawk does almost, uh, almost religiously require... A Loki to provide the webs to give it the actual punch it needs. Vulture True, doesn't I have think. Yeah, I think here we just seen Truth Honor Light going for, um, you know, not looking to mismatch their weapon systems. So, you know, uh, 
dedicating to the charts to just, you know, make sure they have that instant application, like you're saying, you know, get the good transversal, get the good lineups. So not really a boom headshot comp, but, you know, just instant application if everyone's doing their job. Requires a lot more skill and dedication versus just missiles or drones, but uh, can get the job done. As we see the scope will finally go down there. So the first Logi to die on today. Yeah, it's a uh, weird shadow of the old uh, uh, Octodad uh, battle cruisers. There's only four of them, and they've got a good support wing with it, but it's a lot of DPS in these battle cruiser hulls that make them very strong. And yeah, Loki's down. It, they've left the Slepnir till last, which I think is the ultimate disrespect, because that is usually one of the most dangerous ships around, and it's just been ignored. Uh, unfortunately, there's this, you know, we spoke about this right at the beginning of the match. The Stepner is not going to be able to carry much against, you know, what seven ships here right now, especially if the Logi's still up. I mean, the Osprey's got a bit of damage on him, but uh, of note, we do have to say, uh, Hell, all hell no, um, was going to look for more EC drone spread up, so relying on some RNG, which probably didn't cover them. Um, but True Fighter like going more for the DPS drones, which probably would help them just split that uh, focus between the Frigology for the win here. Yep, well, Truth on a Light gets the win there, so we'll send it back to the studio to see what they think. Mm, another great haul back from Amar. Damn, I'm thirsty. Ah, that hits the spot. Farmer's Bar could be anywhere. Have it so the first match of the day, uh, the victory goes to Truth Honor Light there. Uh, in a what looked like it could have been uh, a bit of a, a controversial match going the other way. I know uh, uh, young Mystical Might over here who joins me on the desk uh, was somewhat stressing during that match. Uh, I believe the exact words you said were, Oh, oh, please stop dying. Uh, so, how, what was your thoughts here, Mystical Might? Uh, I may have said those words, there may have been a few curse words thrown in in between. A little bit. Uh, I'm not going to repeat exactly what I said uh, watching the match, but yeah, no, I think it was a solid win. I don't think that it was even close. I never doubted. It wasn't close. I wasn't had full close. faith. Okay. Full faith. Full faith. Full faith. And you still have full faith. The truth on light going to go all the way. Yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we're not going to lose any more ships. I'm sure. We're Interesting. We're getting it all out of the way now, no more so ships. that we can we can blaze through zero to 100 every single time. It's fine. Okay, and. It's okay. Um, are you willing to put some plex on that? Absolutely not. Okay. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so I'm joined by Mystical Might and, of course, Black Bart Pirate. Bart, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing uh, super good. I am here in this amazing space station that we're in. Uh, traveled all the way from Earth. It was quite tiring, so... But, you know, I made it. You guys live here, so it's super easy for you guys. You don't understand what it's like to get on spaceships and uh, fly yeah. through the sky. So That's true. We do live in GTA 404. Uh, we're actually coming to you uh, live from Nottingham in the UK this year. Um, so this is the Evan T Studio. Uh, it belongs to us. It's completely and utterly ours. It's not rented whatsoever. Um, and the Evan T Studio in Nottingham is also in GTA 404. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the, the guys who built this whole set and everything, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, I don't think a Lions tournament has ever looked this good, uh, at least in my opinion. So... Black Bart Pirate, which teams are you looking forward to seeing in the Lions tournament this year? I'm kind of looking forward to all of them, honestly. Like, I know it's a little bit of a cop-out, and I kind of cheated there, but, like, after watching the feeders and seeing, like, the quality of the players that made it through the feeders and, like, the struggle that they had to do, I know that everybody that made it through the feeders deserves to be here. Most of the teams, like, we're seeing so many old names. We're seeing not Hydra, we're seeing Volta, we're seeing Templis, we're seeing Triumvirate, um, we're seeing PL apparently is back, and maybe this time they'll reclaim their former glory. So I, I really am looking for looking forward to all the teams. Um, I think all the matches are going to be really good. Uh, just really excited about it. I mean, this is going to be, I think it's going to be really good. Like, we already started off with an amazing match, so when the first one's that good, like, we'll see what goes down. I'd, I'd, I'd hope it's less amazing next time. <laughs> So you want like 100 to 0 victories, just boring. So you're not interested in I making these guys have a good time. You just, you're being I'm selfish. I'm interested in keeping my heart rate 
at a reasonable level. Okay, right. so That's you heard fine. it here first. Yes, That's okay. my very selfish individual. True. Doesn't want entertainment, doesn't want explosions, just wants uh, his own peace of mind. Ships. Peace yes, of mind. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we have um, the next match is going to be Arrival versus Deepwater Hooligans. Um, but actually, I'll tell you what, Misty, let's break down a little bit what happened in that last match. So mm. you were watching very closely, very closely, e extremely Close. closely. Could say I was slightly invested. Slightly invested. Um, talk us through it. Like, talk mm. us through what we just saw. Yeah, so what we saw was a kiting team on the Truth on a Light side um, going up against a Mimitar Rush team. So as you'd expect with the Mimitar Rush team, they rushed in, um, secured tackle on the Tornado and the Harbinger Navy, which meant that, as we saw at the very beginning of the match, the Tornado goes down extremely quickly. It's a high DPS ship, but it's not necessarily known for its tank. It's more of a projection glass cannon that you'd expect to sit further back in the, in the back lines, but with the limits of the Alliance tournament, you have to begin within 50 kilometers of the beacon. So if a team comes in at zero on the beacon, you're starting 50 kilometers away, and it's not really enough time for a tornado to be able to, to pull away from a rush comp, um, as we saw kind of demonstrated by the Our Hell Now team. Um, but, thankfully for me, the logistics frigates on the Our Hell Now team decided that they were going to go on a little adventure by themselves because they took a little bit of damage at the beginning. Um, and that allowed the Truth on a Light team to kill the Gilas, which put out an incredible amount of damage. Um, but they weren't in range of their logistics to get reps. So that, I think, really helped the Truth on a Light team kind of pull through towards the beginning of that match. Awesome. And uh, Bart, do you think that the Our Hill Now team could have done anything different in that situation? Uh, like, as Missy says, they brought in this Mimitar Rush team. They, they clapped that tornado really quickly, but then it started to sort of slowly fall apart. They looked like they were pulling it back at one point. Mystical Might, incredibly invested, staring at the screen, uh, almost shouting, at, in fact, some would say. Um, but what could uh, Oil Now have done in that situation? I mean, honestly, like, it, it was hard to tell, but it looked like the Al Hanel team got warped at zero, which I don't know if that was their intent or not, but uh, if that was their intent, uh, they were in a position, like, they grabbed the tornado, but I think they really needed to go after that Osprey. I'm not sure how well they would have been able to pull it off, but the Osprey did actually manage to keep so many ships alive as a Tech 1 logistics cruiser, which is pretty impressive. I mean, it's very solid piloting. Um, you know, it is hard. Like, it's hard to see, like, would they have been able to get on it or not? But there was, like, I felt like there's a little bit of overlapping, like, over-tackling going on where they were just focusing on, okay, we got the primary. Everyone tackle the primary and kill it. Okay, let's go to the next primary. Everyone tackle the primary and kill it, which is, I think everybody in EVE has had a moment where they did that and everything got away. So, but I, I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Like Hydra did a really good job splitting. Sorry, Truth, Honor, Light, and uh, yeah, they just got out kited. I mean, kiting team versus a Mimitar rush. I guess it works. There you go. So our next match is going to be Arrival versus Deepwater Hooligans, and we have some graphics to throw up and let's have a look at it. Uh, so Arrival banning out the Armageddon Navy issue, the Orthrus, and the Ishtar, whereas Deepwater choosing to ban out the Eos, the Curse, and the Slepnir. Now, if you're new to the Alliance tournament, uh, when we see these trickle bans, what this means is uh, each team gets three blind bans, for a total of six. If there's any duplicate bans, let's say here both teams had banned the Ishtar, then both teams would be given one additional trickle ban each. If all three ships were the same, uh, so let's say both teams banned Armageddon Navy, Orthrus, Ishtar, then each team would have another three bans. So, Mr. My, the Armageddon Navy issue, that's just recently been buffed uh, in the Uprising expansion. Uh, is that going to be a popular band, do you think, in this, uh, this Alliance tournament? So the Armageddon itself has always been um, kind of a scary ship in the Alliance tournament setting because it gets a bonus to its newts effectiveness. Um, so both the optimal range of those newts, actually, I'm not, I'm not sure if it gets a strength bonus. Maybe it does a small one, if any. I think it's just an optimal range bonus, um, which means that it's a very difficult ship to fly against because it's denying you an area within that arena where if you don't want to get neutered out, you can't fly within that, that space. The Armageddon Navy issue has been recently updated to bring it more in line with the Tech 1 counterparts. I think a lot of the um, faction ships have been, because they were kind of lacking a couple of the, the good qualities that the Tech 1 versions had. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt you there because the teams are in the arena and we are ready to go to see Arrival versus Deepwater Hooligans uh, with your casters Wingnut Cross and Zoo. And welcome them back to match two, Arrival vs. Deepwater Hooligans. And we have a double Golem Scorp Navy comp versus a, uh, well, it looks like another Nighthawk Rush, but it's a little more, I don't know, exotic. Azu, what are you thinking about this? 
Uh, I'm loving to see a, a double Marauder comp of Golems. Obviously, the Bastion module is not allowed, but these Golems uh, look to be set up for crews. Um, so we've seen, I think, looks like a Ham Rush versus a crew setup. So, you know, uh, going to be interesting to see what the position is. Uh, unfortunately, it's T1 Frig Logi on the uh, Golem side. So Deep Oil Hoodigan's a bit of a time disadvantage there, but um, maybe they can use that right edge advantage, use some MGD beacons, split up and, you know, spread the rush around. I, I think that's I mean, what they're... I'm they're curious, sure. by the looks of it, that triple battle Battleship plus Nighthawk. I wonder if this is one of the pseudo tinker uh, cruise comps we've seen in the past. It's looking like this might be the case. We'll have to keep an eye on it. But uh, yeah, 36 of the matches on the way. This is very interesting <laughs> to see if this rush can break that if that is the case. Actually, a good call there. So we'll look after this energy transfer is happening. That's the case. The rush is still in a good position to go because you can always go bowling and knock them out of energy transfer range. That ET is only being between 9 and 10 kilometers, not having any bonuses, but the match is underway. I'm just keeping an eye, my eyes on the battleships, to be honest. I'm not even looking at the what I'm assuming is a massive rush. Yep, there's the rush. Uh, let's see. Yep, they are balling up. This is almost definitely a pseudo tinker comp. Let's go. <laughs> let's see. So let's say uh, the pressure coming in here now. Drake Navy issue on the arrival side, getting that pressure first. Nice little pick off there always. Um, but it looks like they're just going to be looking to strip on the deep order side, that T1 Lodgy. I mean, they're easy pickings if you've got a rush and you've got the double Loki webs. No reason to not clear those things off the grid absolutely first. Yeah, they're going for the Drake Navy first as well. So that could be, potentially be a quick and easy kill. Burst goes down. That's the last of that Logi removed. So now it's just the self-rep on these three battleships and the Nighthawk. I suspect the support wing has now been left entirely out to dry. <laughs> Well, I'm not seeing any Logi bots or any energy transfers, so no real signs of a Tinker comp yet. They might just be going for, I don't know, some other ballsy player here right now, but it's full damage drones on both there sides. It is, just there it trying is. to slaughter each other right now. As the Drake Navy issue on uh, arrival side it looks to be dipping low armor, but still living to win right now. Energy transfers go to the Nighthawk. There we go. It is definitely a pseudo Tinker now. Nighthawk is going to have to try and survive the world now. It's getting, getting given all the capacity he needs, but can he survive this massive rush? Drake Navy goes down. That could maybe be enough here, but he is just tanking off a bit of armor. Oh, oh no, he's, he's not. I don't think he's going to hold this. He's trying his absolute best. Oh, it's getting spicy now. If I'm just, they need arrivals. Uh, I need to uh, see if they can pressure through this now because obviously that'll uh, be the links as well, which is going to be crucial for keeping this tinker going right now. So, uh, doing enough pressure to make him bleed oh, and gone. he does go down. So, give it a minute or two, those links will expire, making everything else a much softer target to break here right now. Looks like they're going after the Osprey Navy now with crews. It's probably not the worst of all calls, but um, they can't kill the, the opposing Logi, so they need to quickly kill the city ships before they start losing more DPS. See a Merlin now just being keep being clobbered because it can. I'm just, actually, where is that Merlin? Wait, hold on. Why is the Merlin over there? <laughs> Sorry, I just noticed. Very interesting <laughs> that we have double golems here. Paint bonus with split damage going onto the Karen, but not a single paint is being applied to the Karen right now on arrival side. I mean, if you got two golems and you're not applying any of those awesome, ridiculously bonus paints to a Karen while you're trying to kill it, I think you're doing something kind of wrong here. I believe that's because they're going for the Osprey Navy, so they're putting all their, their paints onto that. There's also, so is this a golem of Rilio moving? I think he's moving away. Yeah, he is. Oh, we'll see there. So the Tinker, they hold a good job here holding their ETs, not trying to give their cards out right at the beginning. You know, obviously, if the ETs go right off the bat, everyone knows right for sure it's a Tinker. But then again, just like you said, the ships are also a bit of a giveaway here. Um, Logi side for the Kieran uh, and Scalpel doing a good job of keeping that Osprey up. But unfortunately, Deep Order is losing too many of their crucial ships, especially without their links and all that support. Um, these Golems and Scorp Navy is just not going to do much on their own right now, I feel. They need to kill more DPS. If they can get the Osprey Navy and maybe a Loki, I think they can almost definitely tank this because they'll still be getting transferred by their friends but it's gonna be a really brutal fight for a while but that being said the scorp navy is actually holding pretty comfortably i thought mm. he was gonna start losing a lot harder but actually he's he's pretty much chilling over at 60 70 percent Whoa, and now we've seen some good volleys coming through onto the Osprey Navy issue. Uh, might just be them coordinating those volleys. Good call as the Osprey Navy does go down. And especially, like you said, stripping off some DPS, putting the battleships back into a really good position here. So now I'm interested to see if they're going to switch those paints over to maybe a Frig Logi or, and try and get those off. Or if they're confident now in the DPS to just keep hitting these high DPS ships and just keep putting themselves in a stronger winning position. Because obviously... Yeah, so, um, so what a rival needs to now do is to bump the Scorp Navy away from his friends. At the moment, they're not. They're, I think they're trying, but they're kind of failing at it. They need to get the Scorp Navy out of ET range of his friendly battleships, or he will not go down. That be said, again, I say that too early as he starts getting lower in shield. But he's really tanky. 
well, the Nighthawk also getting a lot of pressure here on arrival side. Um, I am really interested to see if what would happen if they put paints on those frig and maybe take a snapshot at them. Obviously, they don't have any webs or grapples right now, just have, really having newts and paints, unfortunately. So uh, if that SNI goes down, that's a loss of uh, damage, that's a loss of energy transfer, that's a loss of a buddy to keep this whole tinker going. Yeah, he's the Scorpion Navy is starting to go down. He's he's run out. He's trying his best. He's repping as hard as he can, but that's too much DPS. And they're going for the Nighthawk. I don't know if I like that. It's probably, possibly the most tankiest thing on grid right now. And they've gone straight for it. I personally would have maybe gone for the, one of the Lokis to try and remove something. But this, unfortunately, it looks like the Tinker will, or the Pseudo Tinker will not hold. Yeah, that's unfortunate. It looks like most of the DPS that's coming onto the Kirin right now is just oh. the light drones that they've been splitting up there right now. Once again, a big oh, volley the coming Nighthawk, through. The Nighthawk, what maybe. There's a chance. There's a chance. Come on, get him quickly. Okay, can Ooh. he survive now? That He's got such a sliver left. That is oh. a really big hit there right now. Oh, it might be able to recover here right now, but we'll Set have to 19, see what happens. Structure. Nah, he, he can't. He's still losing. He's going to go down. 11 structure, there oh. he goes. That was so much closer than I expected. Wow. You'd almost assume they were packing torps the way these volleys just suddenly come out of nowhere. But that's also what happens sometimes when a shield cracks and suddenly all that armor and hull just gets stripped off right away. Two golems is still quite a scary uh, situation to be in. Obviously, they can still support each other. But, you know, with loss of that extra energy transfer, uh, any sort of newts is just going to slowly get eat away at this capacitor. The XLASB requiring a serious amount of capacitor if it's not getting supplemented by something else. If they can hold and kill a Loki, I think they'll have it. But as you can see, that Golem, he's going to have to be repping for his life to stay alive. So that's going to be a really tall ask. And not to mention the extra DPS from the support wing, even. Like, a Swipple will still make sure, like, two or three hundred. Then you got whatever's left from the Stalk and the Bifrost. Like, it's, it could honestly add up. Honestly, I mean, we, we're sitting in about half through the match, about four minutes left. I know these golems aren't in the best position, but the points are quite close. 48 to arrivals, 40, obviously the Skybreaker goes down, uh, only a bit more to rival side. But, you know, if if these golems can actually hold out and maybe just look at getting rid of something else, like maybe take some shot of the Spitbull or the Bifrost, you know, they could be uh, in a good position to still win on points here if they manage to push through. You also just saw a Smart Bomb go off from the other golem, removing EC drones, uh, DPS drones, and potentially even Logi drones. So that golem's trying to remove what's on him, that which might, again, buy a little bit of time. I didn't see a smart bomb off the other golem yet, the, the primary of uh, Dano. I don't think I've seen him fire a smart bomb yet, but look at his tank. He's, he's actually holding very comfortably. I, I honestly thought he was going to get low there, but no, he's, he's doing quite all right. And they're just grinding away at the Loki right now of uh, Archim Hardy. Um, so it looks like they're just dedicated on getting rid of this high end, not really caring much for the support. Taking more advantage of their uh, light DPS drones to get rid of this Karen. I'm actually surprised that the Spithel of Black Tooth hasn't gone and maybe, you know, gotten rid of all these DPS drones on the Karen. So uh, the Scalpel can just dedicate all these reps to, you know, keeping this Loki alive instead of his fellow Frig Logi. Why is this again so close? Why is this still so close? The golem keeps dipping down a bit lower and the Loki's now going past 30%. Why is this so close? The golem has just dropped down to 10%. He's back up to 30. He's just bouncing. And meanwhile, the Loki is getting ever so closer. Dano needs to overheat every rep he has, whatever he's got to survive that extra like 10, 20 seconds to maybe break through this, this Loki. But I think... I think the scapula has finally stopped bothering to save the Kirin, perhaps, and is now putting everything he's got into the golem. Because notice the Kirin is slowly starting to creep down. So I think every single rep is now on that Loki, trying to buy them the extra seconds of time. Well, I'm sure we're seeing some spicy high slots here on both sides on, you know, for reps on energy transfers, everything, DPS modules. Um, if that Loki goes down, I mean, these golems are going to be in a spectacular position, points and position-wise right now. We're only about, have, it's only about two and a half minutes left, so... I think it's going to come down to a lot of heat management because one wrong move, one wrong cycle, an invul burns out or something like that, oh, and that it's Loki. just all downhill. The Loki's went down 15% shield there, so he's gone past peak region. He's, he's slowly ticking down. The reps are going as hard as they can to buy, buy, to buy more time. They're holding him just at about 30, then he dips back down the back up to 30. Meanwhile, the golem is now into hull. I think the Logi Frigs might have saved this. The last Ooh, second. Oh, it's spicy <laughs> now. Beautiful. He's gone. Okay. That's painful. And that's it, pretty much. I think they should be able to wrap this up now in the last two minutes of the match here. Um, so, you know, just grinding away the golem. Absolutely spectacular show you by Deepwater Hooligans. I didn't really give it to them, you know, right off the bat, but uh, showing some strong choice. I'm a bit uncertain about their choice of target prioritization. How did you feel about that wing neck with them focusing purely on the high end ships and not really touching support? 
I'm pretty sure with Cruz, they would absolutely struggle to shoot the scalpel and Kieran, even with target paint and a web from the uh, from their support. I I think they would still struggle going for the big end with the big ships is definitely the way to go. I think, but I don't know personally, I wasn't the biggest fan of the Nighthawk pick. That is potentially one of the tankiest things around. I guess it does have the signature of a large moon, so you can hit it pretty easily. But I don't know. I, I want to ask the guys at the desk on that one because I'm not sure on that. But meanwhile, the gold is still holding here. But fortunately, as you see by the Loki of Art Art Jump, just going right back up. Yeah, really, really strong show here. We're just seeing absolute devastation that these uh, Marauders can bring. Um, I'm interested if anyone's going to bring Vargas. Vargas obviously not doing a tinker, just more raw firepower and hope they can do in like a rush AC comp. Um, but spectacular show here with the double golems. And this is also why we do not allow Bastion, because just Bastion would have made that even more ridiculous, as we finally do see Smith here getting ground down. Yep, and good fights all in local as well. I think both teams realized that was an amazing match. Yep, one guy saying that's nail-biting. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. We got less than 30 seconds left, so thank you so much to these two teams. It would be just honestly a beautiful match. This might end up being my highlight, but then again, these matches always get better the later the night goes. Um, yeah, I'm always going to be excited for any little wild card we see throughout the day. Um, when are we going to be seeing any flagships? But without that, the battleship does go down, and the match is done, and we will be sending it back to the studio with rivals taking the win. Uh, yeah, we actually lost a bet as CCP collectively, uh, so that's why that Alliance logo is in the game. Of course, you could change your Alliance by leaving, but that would be <laughs> kind of a jerk move. That kind like, of, oh, you don't like it? Nah, uh, just leave. This, this logo sucks. I'm going to go join. Welcome to Eve Pandora. 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 Anyway, Arrival taking that victory there over Deepwater Hooligans in a very exciting, very tense match. That one could have gone either way at so many points. Uh, it, it, one part of the match, it was 40 points to 50, but uh, the Deepwater crew were trying to kill that Loki worth 17 points. If they'd done that, maybe their golem had survived. Uh, but then Arrival managed to just break through, kill off that uh, that Tinker setup, and take the W with one second uh, remaining on the clock when they took the, the final ship down. Mystical Might, uh, we, that's our first Tinker, basically, of, uh, of the Alliance tournament, the kind of pseudo Tinker. What is a Tinker and why is it so powerful? I mean, first Tinker of the tournament, second match of the day, uh, second match of the tournament. Am so I wrong? It, you are right. You are right. Thank yes. you very much. So um, a Tinker or a pseudo Tinker in this case is fitting a large energy transfer on, I think, three or four of your mainline ships. So in this case, it was the double Golem, Scorp Navy issue, and the Nighthawk that would all have energy transfers. When you get shot, you run through some extra large ASB charges. So that's a shield booster that you can load with cap charges so that you don't have to use your own capacitor to boost your shields. But eventually it runs out and then it costs a lot of capacitor to run it again. But with the energy transfers, what you do is that all of the ships that aren't getting shot give capacitor the ship to the ship that is getting shot and it can run that extra large shield booster without the charges. And that's kind of what the Tinker setup now is um, in the modern day and age. And Bart, one of the weaknesses we usually see for Tinker setups is they're really not very mobile. Like those, uh, that, that remote cap transfer is maybe like six, seven kilometers. You have to stay super close to each other. So sometimes we see teams attempting to bump those ships out of the way. We saw Arrival uh, try and bump the Tinker setup apart. They did not uh, succeed on that. However, um, Tinker setup chose to shoot at Kieran's with uh, cruise missiles. Uh, your thoughts on this this decision? Yeah, it's a, it was a pretty bad call on their part. Um, I think that actually they would have won if they had at any point chosen to not shoot at Kieran's. Uh, they only did it, they did it for about a minute and then they did it for another minute like as they tried to break something. But we saw that Loki was so close to dropping before the Golem. And there was a couple moments during the match where uh, before the Scorpion Navy issue dropped, when they had all three battleships and they chose to try and take a Kieran down. And, you know, a Kieran is a, not only is it a frigate, but it is a logistics frigate, so it has a ridiculously small signature radius, and cruise missiles, just, they can't apply to frigates that well. 
Um, they are made to take out battleships and battle cruisers. We actually saw them take a Nighthawk down with them very easily. Uh, it's just really unfortunate. I mean, it was like a little bit of target calling that I feel like if they had gone after the Loki instead of a Kieran at any point, they probably would have won. But trying to put cruise missiles on a logistics frigate pretty much doesn't work. Pretty much doesn't work. We also saw um, essentially the Nighthawk Loki rush, which was super popular during Alliance Open. Um, it's been less successful of late, simply because of the points increase for some of these ships. Uh, during Alliance Open, the points values were very different. It meant that it was a very point-efficient comp to bring. Um, Mr. Gomez, what do you think about bringing that comp in this particular Alliance tournament with the current points? I mean, I guess it's not a terrible comp to bring. There's certainly better comps that you could bring if you wanted to do a rush setup. It depends on the band's um, and what the bands were in the previous match. Um, it's a strong setup. It was stronger in the Alliance Opens because you could bring the two battle cruisers or the two command ships and three cruisers, right? That a lot of damage coming out. We saw here, you can still get a lot of damage out of these ships, but it's a little bit more like hodgepodge because the more the same type of ship that you bring, the more the points cost, and then you know um, the point values were changed anyway, so they already cost more. Um, so it's a little bit less effective, like you said, to bring that same setup. I don't think it's the best type of rush that you could bring. I think we've seen better ones during the feeders that perhaps they could lean on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess it's something that they're comfortable with based on the fact that it's an old comp. Yeah, they actually did pretty well with that during the Alliance Open, if I remember correctly, the arrival team. Um, let's look at our next match. So it's going to be the Tuskers Co versus Try. And uh, we can actually throw up a graphic uh, about the Tuskers and take a look at them as an Alliance tournament team. Of course, they've had various successes over the years, uh, including winning Alliance Tournament 14 uh, and taking home a bunch of Blood Raiders ships, the Rubisu and the Kedis uh, for the prizes there. Tuskers have fielded a total of 53 pilots uh, in their time in the Alliance tournament. Uh, some incredible veterans there. Latronicus, of course, uh, a very, very good logistics pilot. Usually you see him in things like the Scimitars. Suleiman, uh, the CEO, uh, has flown for years. He didn't fly for a bit, but he is back now this year. Uh, and look at that. Like Last match is won against Try, actually. <laughs> so they're, they're f facing Try right now. And the last time they played a match and won, it was against Try. I, I feel like this might be rigged. Because I believe it says that they are beating Try in AT18. Oh, is that oh no. what it says? Are we leaking the script? The script has been leaked. The script has been mm. leaked. Oh, there you have it. So I guess we could just skip this match and go straight on. The Tuskers Co. there taking a commanding victory, uh, 100 points to zero over Try. Uh, so <laughs> potentially a bit of a bit of a, an <laughs> issue there. Uh, Platinum Sensitivity, the last team they actually beat, and then prior to that, snuffed out Dark Side and We Form Volta. So those are really strong teams that um, the Tuskers have faced. Uh, all of them very strong teams. Well, you say all of them really strong teams, but I will remind you that snuffed out did bring four Deimoses. Yes, let's let's uh, let's talk about that some other time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's go on to our next graphic now because the teams are about to land in uh, the arena. Uh, so this is the Tri team. So 69 pilots, nice, um, and some some veterans there as well, uh, playing in a whole bunch of matches, including Annie Gardet. Interestingly enough, that was from uh, when the Volta team was in Tri. Uh, so Annie, despite not even being in Tri, one of their most valuable pilots. Um, and you can see here they beat Vidra Relolded in Alliance Tournament, I believe that is 16. Uh, then NC Dot twice, sorry, Barth, uh, Brightside of Death and Templates Calcif. Again, very strong teams the Tri team has managed to, to pull off uh, uh, victories against. Unfortunately for them, they are scheduled to lose this match to the Tuskers Co. <laughs> uh, which is somewhat unfortunate for them. Uh, and we hope that fate will will prevail and maybe they will actually pull out a W. Uh, we never know. Teams are landing right now in the arena, I'm being told. Let's have predictions. I feel like the fact that the script might have been leaked might sully this prediction, but Mystical Might, I'm going to come to you anyway. What do you think here? I'm going to have to say Tuskers based on the script writing for this <laughs> particular match. Um, I, think, I think they're a strong team in general. Um, if they've managed to bring back a few of their players um, with some of the recent changes to the game, perhaps sparking their interest in the tournament again, I think they have a strong chance of taking this. But I also know the tri team strong, so it's a 50 50 for me. But Tuskers. Excellent non committal answer there from uh, from Mystical Might. Bar, are you any more committal? Sure, I will uh, say that Tri is going to win because of the script. <laughs> and maybe we're just trying to mess up people's Twitch channel points here. So it's all this like mind game to uh, make sure that <laughs> the right people get skins. Which one that is, you know, we'll find out. But no, I, I do like Tri's team. Um, I think last year they didn't do particularly well, but it's looking like they maybe have some of their 
you know, original group back together. And uh, Tuskers, they haven't performed particularly well in the last, like, couple days, so, or a couple, uh, couple tournaments, so I'm kind of going for try. I uh, just kind of want to look at that, like, something different. Yeah. I also like seeing Tuskers lose, so. <laughs> well, I'm going to put my money behind the Tuskers if I could, um, but let's go to the arena and let's find out uh, who's going to win between the Tuskers Court and try. And welcome to the arena, Tuskers versus Try, the Battle of the Tees. We're not talking about British uh, problems here. We're talking about a flagship bar guest. It uh, looks like Try have decided, you know what? We want to beat Tuskers this time. We are not having this. And they have brought in everything. And honestly, both teams have brought very similar comps. We've got Battleship Triple Battle Cruiser plus Support Wings. Both teams have brought in, well, forms of Logi. <laughs> like second Osprey today, which I quite like. But this is honestly going to be a beautiful match. What do you think about this one, Zoo? Uh, interesting to see the rapid heavy uh, flagship bar guest there, but we've seen uh, with Tuskers here, Scorpion Navy issued cruise fit and warped in at zero. Unsure what happened there, but we're going to see maybe it's going to uh, be a bit of a bait. Uh, you know, ridiculous uh, tank bonus obviously on S and I, but you can see both teams obviously going for that triple battle cruiser setup, like you said, and diversifying to avoid that duplication point penalty that they need to take if they spam the same ship over and over again. So just diversifying their comms slightly, just so they can take you know more optimized choices here. Right now, but uh, I'm very interested to see if the flagship's actually going to be able to give them the edge here. Interesting thing as well is that the Scorp Navy is cruise and warped at zero. The Bargus is fl a flagship and has rapid heavies and spawned right at the back of its team. I mean, if I'm flying a billion or more worth of ship or multiple billions, I'd probably warp at the back as well. But interesting to see the rapid heavies being further back than the cruisers are. But then cruise does get full arena control as the match will be underway in 10 seconds. Yeah, I gotta be real. I want to see if they're actually gonna go into the Scorpion Navy issue right at the frontier. But uh, once again, the Osprey, like you said, gonna be interesting if that lives to win. If the Bar Guys might just go for that headshot of those Rapids right now. Uh, the, but the Battle Cruisers are all AC fit as well. As we see the match go underway, and we see Triumvir diving right in. Looks like they're just ignoring that SNI going right from the back line right now. Let's see if they're going to go for that Osprey or sink their teeth into something else. Going for a Caracal Navy at the moment. Looks like a uh, Skyfleet's tackled that. Actually, both Caracal Navies tackled. Sci-Fleet of Lutar is now being absolutely pounded upon. They're trying to return the favor back to Caracal Navy, so they're going for these uh, reasonably lighter tank, but better good DPS ships, both the Sci-Fleet and the Caracal Navy. And yeah, one goes down immediately. The Caracal Navy is still alive. That's that's a very, no, very painful start, but the Caracal Navy is about to follow. Second Sci-Fi is now being primary. A bit of damage going to a Hurricane as well. Uh, we do see this the Osprey being tackled brutal. there right now by a Jackdaw, so let's see if they're going to follow up for that right now, or if they're just going to commit to this uh, Karakoro, that seems. Uh, both teams going full in on the damage drones right now. We're just seeing a bunch of light Navy uh, damage drones right now, just to support that DPS right now. Cruisers are still being the prime application for both teams. The Scythe Fleet issue going down there, and the Karakoro Navy issue as well on the Tusker side, yeah. so let's see if with this Osprey Damn, tackle, they follow the in. trade! Again, the exact same trade. Navy crews are being destroyed. They are honestly, in my opinion, the best target. They are lightest tank with the best DPS to kill. So now that both are done, what are they going for? Osprey and Navy Try taking right is way up back. Going in for that Osprey, it seems. They smell blood. They're going for it. They're not going to make the mistake a lot of teams make where you just let the T1 logic live. Again... Saying that, though, the scalpel <laughs> gets absolutely deleted on the Triumvirk side. I swear, they're like, I swear there's like one guy calling bo like both teams at the same time. He's saying kill Logi, and both teams have done the same thing. Logi has now died again. So again, we have an exact trade. Two, Logi, two, two, two Navy cruisers and their Logi both deleted at the same time. This is a race with both teams playing from the exact same playbook. I love this. Uh, it is just an absolute bloodbath. This Hurricane of Andrea going down, getting absolutely shredded now. No support, doesn't have the tank or the HP of a Hurricane Fleet or a Slepner right now. Deleted. Uh, right now, it's looking quite strong for Tuskers. Tuskers just slightly ahead in points here right now, but not to be denied is this Bargain might be off on rapid reload. Once it comes off, we might see a lot more things suddenly getting deleted on the Tusker side. But for now, Triumvirate support is getting shredded as the Swivel goes down as well. And don't forget as well, the Bargus in the back is a, a flagship Bargus, so he should put out a lot of DPS when he's finished reloading. Osprey Navy is now being pounded. It looks like the support wing has now been deleted. So now we have Bargus, Slipnir Fleet, uh, Hurricane versus the world. And this is just, this is chaos. I love it. Hurricane Fleet is now being primed, and he will not last long. They are not the tankiest of ships, especially when they're shield tanked. Absolutely, just a bloodbath. We love to see it. We love to see explosions. We love to see all the mayhem right now. But I have a funny feeling we might be seeing a flagship going down soon. Uh, but they're going to be in a bad situation if they leave in the Bargast the last to kill. They're not going to be able to quite loot it, are they? The Bargast is tackled, so they will be able to kill him. I suspect they'll probably go for him next because there's no reason not to. 
Then again, they could just kill the Slepnir, but they are also quite tanky. Actually, the Slepnir is a mile away, so yeah, they're going to go for the Bargus, I suspect. And you can see, actually, Cyclone's already there. Uh, that's true. So, they're yeah. just going to get rid of that Bargus, leave the Slepnir alive, loot him, do a bit of victory laps. But, you know, not to be underestimated, it's still the DPS coming their way with Logic of Grid, so we're probably going to see a bit more casualties on the Tusker side, but looking quite strong. The Bargus getting shredded will be taking advantage of those flagship bonuses it has for modules right now, uh, but it might still be able to secure a bit more kill mails at least. Yeah, that Bargus, that is unfortunate. That'll be our first flagship down. The Drake Navy does go down. I believe that was the Slepnir dueling it on its own. So honorable 1v1 in the arena. Do I do like those. But yeah, this Barg will go down. And that's, I don't know how much that's going to be. That's going to be a lot of Isk lost. And straight uh, into knows? Tusker's pocket. Well, we'll see right now. A lot of teams sometimes just skimp lightly. You might use more of a flagship to dodge bans if need be. Um, I don't think the flagship has so much power as it used to in the old days um, with you know limitations they always do for rules, which modules are allowed. I don't think this year they're allowing the Bissels, though, so that's interesting. Sorry, um, I just noticed the Cyclone, I think it was. It just ejected some cat boosters in a cargo container so he could pick up the loot from the box. <laughs> <laughs> Well played, well played. Good tactical awareness, though. Making sure you got the space to get the goods. Um, but the Cyclone might actually go down, unfortunately. I mean, he has massive boosts when he wraps from XLASP, as you can see there. He does still oh. outlast the Barghest. He's, I bet you he's going for that loot. I'm just going to keep an eye on him. I don't care about the Slepner anymore. Let's see. Uh, yep. Stepner yeah, is trying to get in there. there. He might be looking to kill this uh, Cyclone, so that'll be funny. If he kills the Cyclone, they're going to see two kill mails here. This being Tranquility, gen kill mails are generated, and we might see a double loss of whatever that Barkas had fitted. It could be quite hilarious, but... Uh, oh, wait, I just noticed if... something horrible. What? The Cyclone is Jason Osrin. <laughs> Where's the Jasonites <laughs> in chat, boys? Come on. Which is going to love seeing that. I've been hearing your stuff for weeks. Come on, let's hear it. But absolutely good wrap up here by Tuskers. Unfortunately, the Bargast uh, didn't do quite that well here. Um, what do you think gave Tuskers the advantage here? You know, te teams had quite a similar setup, I'd say, you know? In my opinion, bulk. They had bulky DPS ships that could take the punishment. And what was uh, Triumvir brought some very heavy DPS ships, but they're not known as the most tankiest of options. So, and also the Bargast, honestly, might have been more cursed than Blessing, but. We will see nonetheless. And this was honestly a wonderful match from both from both parties at the start. Again, thank you for the awesome flying from both teams. As uh, it looks like, I think, actually, yeah, <laughs> he slept and was trying to kill the Cyclone. <laughs> oh, this will be hilarious if we can see another loss. I would love to see the lost males for this match right now. So take a look ejected, at those kill boards after the ejected, match. Ejected, Jason. Ejected. Ejected. Oh, oh no, there my... we go. He's good. So, uh, He's good. Suskers does take the wing over Triumvirate, killing a flagship in the process. Absolutely the spectacular show here an absolute bloodbath and with that we'll send it back to the studio guys stop being casual they're really bad we should not lose anybody to this okay, warp off warp off take the fleet warp everybody warp off this is really really bad execution i'm very disappointed Crush our enemies. Your dams are completely damped out. Crush. I'm damped out. I'm damped out. Get on my chambers, boys. Eat your reps. Yeah. Everything damped. I've not been able to lock a single thing in the game. I'm jammed. The Tuskers Co, they're taking that victory over Tri as we knew would happen, uh, thanks to the, uh, the the brief script leak. Um, Black Bart Pirate, um, that looked like an expensive loss for Tri. Their first match of the tournament, our, our third match of the day, and I am told that, that was a flagship bar, guys. We are hoping to try and get the kill mail for you. Um, what is a flagship, and why is that kind of a big deal? So, a flagship is a ship that lets you ignore a significant portion of the fitting restrictions that we have. So uh, generally almost every ship in the AT can only fit up to tech two modules, except for the flagship, which has a specific list of them. Um, they can pretty much fit anything officer besides like, you know, the, the big tank mods, because, you know, something like a uh, A-type invulnerable or an estimals would be 
just absolutely overpowered. But uh, other than that, you can fit whatever you want. And a lot of teams will do things, and obviously we'll see what it is eventually, uh, probably in the next couple minutes as Z-Kill updates. But uh, you often will see these like 50, 60, 70 billion isk officer flagships, especially with Vargas, because people really like to put uh, rapid heavy officer launchers on them and rapid or, and uh, officer ballistic controls. So uh, it has a potential of being a complete game changer. Um, if your ship is doing like 20 or 30% more damage or tanks harder or goes faster or scrams longer, it's just absolutely incredible. And Tri just lost their ship on the first match that they played, the third match of the day, uh, and they can't bring it again. Like once it's gone, it's like, okay, you're done with flagship. Even if you could replace it, you can't. You're not allowed to fly it for the rest of the tournament. So not a good start for them. And I actually think we probably just got the kill mail. Oh, did we? Oh, yeah. mm. excellent. Let me pull it up. Uh, so 27 billion isk, I am being told, uh, for this flagship, um, which seems rather on the, on the cheap side. Let's have a look here. So uh, Cormax modified large plasma smart bombs. Uh, we got officer rapid heavy missile launchers. Yeah, it's pretty reasonable, actually. Um, that's a big loss for them. Like one of the important things about having that flagship available is it makes you, it gives you the ability to dodge bans, and that's super important. And the fact that you've even got it means that people have to have a slightly different banning strategy against your your team because they know if you have a flagship bar guest, if they ban your uh, the bar guest, you could still bring your flagship, and that means that comp is still an option. You have to plan around that. Try lost their bar guest, so they can't do that anymore. They're going to be uh, everyone knows they can't bring that bar guest because it's dead. Uh, and that is very difficult to bring. Now, Mystical, quickly on flagships again. Um, last year, we had Abyssal modules on flagships. Uh, and this year, we've not. We've gone back to regular uh, officer mods, just regular officer mods, uh, faction mods, and things like that. Um, what, what's the kind of the key difference there? I think it's uh, a question of availability, I think is a really key one when we're talking about officer modules. It's not like there's a, a massive market for officer modules in non-AT times. Um, and the availability of certain modules is going to be very, very controlled when an AT is announced. There's certain modules that suddenly go up like 10, 15 bill because people know that it is essential to make their flagship strong. So with Abyssal modules, anyone had the ability to take a standard faction scram and roll it until it was the best scram that they could possibly get. And that puts everyone kind of on par a little bit, which is a nice thing to have for the teams that are perhaps newer to the tournament but it does mean that there's a little bit less investment going into these flagships than perhaps we'd like to see because expensive explosions are always the best type of explosions. Um, so yeah, I think that's a key change that we're going to be seeing here. And also fitting restrictions as well on certain modules. So a heavy officer scram, I think, takes 4,000 power grid to fit, whereas an abyssal scram takes one power grid, mm. which means that it's very easy to fit a flagship with abyssals, much harder to do so with officer modules. Exactly. And also, um, abyssal mods don't show up properly on Zedkill because it's impossible to see what the original module is. It's just an abyssal warp scrambler. You don't know if it's like a 40 billion isk uh, officer module that has been rolled to something just giga good or if it's just some cheap tech one thing that's been rolled. Like, you cannot tell. Um, whereas with officer mods, we can see what you've lost. And we can see very clearly that it's quite expensive. Uh, so un unlucky for try there. Uh, it's definitely going to make an impact on uh, their planning for matches uh, going forward. Uh, Tuskers, though, executed super well. Uh, I've also been told uh, to say to Sully, uh, Nash says hello, and he's still waiting for an autograph. Um, now, what w what did Tuskers do in that match that executed so well for them there? Well, they uh, they brought a kiting setup, which uh, we were kind of joking about it in between. We're like, oh, shocking. Tuskers brought a kiting setup because Tuskers are extremely well known for in the AT bringing... Basically what they brought, obviously the points got changed a little bit, so the exact setups are a little bit different, but uh, Tuskers is extremely well known for being able to fly these sort of long-range missile kiting-based setups, and they've been doing it for years. They're traditionally extremely good at executing it, and um, they did it, and they actually beat a Minmatar rush with it, or at a, an equivalent thing, which was really cool because you have to be so careful. Like In a lot of stuff, it's like, okay, well, I'm kiting versus an armor setup, it's easy. You go faster than them. What they were going up against is at about the same speed. So it's just like really incredible piloting and really good target calling. And I think that that's, you know, we're seeing Tuskers is still a team to be reckoned with. Um, or, you know, the script said that they were <laughs> supposed to be, depending on which which one you want to talk about on that side. But yeah, they just did a great job. Like perfect target calling, 
never got caught really just well played yeah tusker is usually uh, a team that we consider to be more of an execution team uh, they will take something and they will fly it super, super well. Other teams, uh, the old Pandemic Legion, um, tended to be more of a, a meta team. They were very good at theorycraft and coming up with things. Maybe they would fall down on a, on a mirror matchup against a team with better execution. Uh, other teams uh, like Exodus, we usually put into that bracket as well. Um, Mystical Might, what's the kind of like the main differences between uh, these execution teams and meta teams? Well, before I answer that, I was going to say, with Mira at the helm of Tuskers, I think they moved slightly towards being more of a meta team in the sense that he came up with some weird, wacky ideas that people weren't really used to in some of the matches that we saw previously in like Alliance Opens, things like that. Um, but an execution team is a team that's going to be focused on predominantly executing whatever setups they're flying really, really well. What that means is that they need to be pl uh, flying to the best of their ability because the, c the setups that they're actually flying are going to be fairly difficult to execute properly, and one mistake can mean the difference between winning or losing that match, right? Being out of position or not effectively managing your capacitor because flying around constantly at high speeds using your like warp drive is cap intensive. All of these things need to be taken into consideration, whereas a meta team is looking to completely confuse and then also counteract whatever the enemy team is bringing, right? So meta historically may have also included a bit of spying and knowing what the other team is actually bringing ahead of time. Um, so you can bring the perfect setup to counter. Nowadays, it's more about just knowing, okay, people aren't really going to expect this type of setup from us. Um, they're not going to really expect um, us to have a lot of tracking disruptors, for example, on our armor tank phantasms that we saw in the previous AT, right? Like that's not really a, m a defined meta that we'd expect, but it's something that in the right circumstance can perform really well. So that's the difference between these two teams. One really creative can fall flat. The other ones, sometimes not that creative, but really skilled can also fall flat. And it's slightly easier, I think, to uh, screw up flying well. Very uh, glass half empty take there from Mystical Might. Uh, you mentioned uh, track disruptors. Bart, the rules have changed on, uh, on scripted E-War. What is the big change and how do you think that's gonna impact this tournament? Well, I think so far we haven't really seen it yet, but we are also on match three out of 70-something. So uh, the big change is that you can now put scripts into your EWAR modules, specifically tracking disruptors, guidance disruptors, and sensor dampeners. Uh, that has not been allowed for several tournaments now. Um, I believe specifically the change was back like Bay back in like AT11 or 12 when there's these uh, drone rush sensor damp setups where you would just have a lock range of five kilometers and you couldn't do anything. Um, so now that they're back, uh, I think that we're going to see a lot of a lot of that moving forward. I'm actually surprised we haven't, um, but it's the, the specific scripts basically double the effectiveness at one thing as opposed to it being, you know, okay, well, we can cut your range in half and cut your tracking in half. Now we can cut your range in half times two, which is not one. <laughs> The math works out, trust me, uh, or do the other way around. So uh, it does make them much more powerful, and then especially like the bonus ships like uh, Celestis, for instance, or Lachesis, much, much more powerful. So uh, I think that it'll be, we should be seeing it, I hope. Um, if not, maybe everyone's just going to Minmatar rush each other, but I don't think that's what's actually going to happen. Well, we've got plenty of time to find out. As you say, this is just match four coming up. Uh, so plenty of matches where people can bring both Damps and Mimitar Rush and just run into each other's faces. Um, speaking of Mimitar, this tournament here is sponsored by the Mimitar Republic. Uh, so the prize ships this year are essentially rebuilds of the old Freki and the Mimir from Alliance Tournament 8. Uh, some stats were released yesterday. The models have been uh, yet to be shown, uh, but uh, I am assured they are pretty hashtag poggers so i'm looking forward to that uh let's take a look at our next team coming up here polaris mercenary alliance versus uh the boundary experts and see what these teams are choosing to ban so polaris mercenary banning out the bargast the curse and the scimitar whereas boundary experts banning out that armageddon navy issue seeing that ban once again the balgorn and the curse so they really don't like newts they're like hey newts you know go go leave go somewhere else uh the trickle bands here are sentinel and talia uh, Mystical Might, what are you seeing here uh, from these uh, these team bands? I mean, it's interesting to see that... So we see a curse ban coming out from both teams, right? So that would suggest that both teams don't want to see newts because the curse is an extremely strong uh, recon ship, able to project newts out, and it gets a strength bonus as well. 
um, to those medium and small newts, making it a, a super strong ship in an alliance tournament setting. But the difference between these two teams here is that Polaris Mercenary Alliance also opted to ban the Sentinel, which suggests that they're not really worried about the newts so much as they perhaps are worried about the tracking disruptors and guidance disruptors that Bart was just talking about. Um, so I'm not sure if they're going to be going for a sort of projection setup. I'm not really sure what they're aiming for with these current bans. It might be that they actually want to use Lashax, um, of which you know uh, tracking disruptors are extremely effective at countering um, Lashak projection and damage because you can break their spool, which we'll probably have to explain later, <laughs> uh, by applying their tracking disruptors. Well, let's let's find out because uh, we're ready to go to the arena and see if we are going to see the shacks between uh, Polaris Mercenary Corporation and uh, Burnley Experts. So let's go. Welcome back to the arena, mates, and we have another flagship on the field, flown by Every Lewis, and it looks like it is potentially another pseudo tinker versus triple battleship, but guess what? They're the laser boys. It's a Abaddon's plus rede Redeemer. So this is going to be, again, a lot of DPS and also a lot of tank on both of these comps, potentially. What do you think about this one, Zoo? Uh, well, we have the countdown happening. Interesting to see another Tinker set up here as well, and a flagship, just in fourth match, and we're just seeing spectacular shows here. But um, this Abaddon comp is probably going to love those juicy targets just sitting absolutely stationary and just pummeling into them. So I'm going to see what they're going through. Probably an Oracle's also just going to love this. Lasers are absolutely well, going to be loving Trinitas. Oracle's going to hate the fact that it can't run away from the cruise. <laughs> True, but we see the match underway here. I'm going to see target prioritization here. Are they going to go for Nighthawk, maybe strip a battleship or get rid of this Frig Lodgy as well? Turrets might have a harder time applying to this Frig Lodgy, but obviously you do want to get rid of them. Don't want to give them just free reps, but yeah, we see the Nighthawk being primary. And yeah, look at the Oracle immediately. As said, they're going to have a lot of trouble under the, under the cruise. Oracles have great DPS. They're very good, just like the NATO. But unfortunately, when you can't escape the DPS, you will die quick. And he's only got an Inquisitor and Navitas for reps. So T1 Lodgy Frigs. So... This guy will not last long, unfortunately, but they're going for the Nighthawk, trying to break the uh, links off of this pseudo tinker ASAP. Very interesting that we're seeing Quick in the article trying to pull range. I'm not sure what he's thinking. Like, I think he'd rather approach and do as much damage because those cruisers are going to hit him anywhere in the arena. So yeah. he's just kind of wasted a lot of <laughs> DPS time there as he dies. I think potentially he could have maybe gotten far away off, but it, it was not worth <laughs> it. Was still, he should have just gone in for it, I think. But second article now being hit hard. Nighthawk is being hit, but he's tanking rather well at the moment. Just keep Oracles it an eye on see what this redeem is for. Unfortunately, like you say, we're just going to see those oracles being stripped right now. Um, hopefully, they're going to do enough. The burst going down, like get rid of those free reps. Good show. Hopefully, they can follow through into the Bantam and start working on something bigger because with the loss of the second oracle, that's a big portion of the head DPS gone. Obviously, they still have three battleships and they still have their free logic. It's a fantastic position, but Look they're still going to have some man. tough cookies to crack. <laughs> he keeps getting close. To get oh, he's about to, about to finally get broken through. And then he bursts right back up. Oh, hold on. See? Yo Yaz is bouncing up and down like a yo yo, which is exactly like his name. Yo Yaz is barely holding up, but there he goes. There goes the links in a few more minutes. But honestly, the only thing I'm finding crazy about this, this is obviously a flag bug, but he's not running away. He is sitting next to his uh, Tinker brethren and just going to sit there, which is not the type of bug I'm used to seeing. Interesting as well that it's the flagship choice. So um, I don't know. I love seeing some laser boys pummeling into uh, Kaldari ships. I'm a bit of a fanboy of Amar, but the Baden getting to half armor. Baden obviously does have the resist bonus. Does a full free lodge up, but Inquisitor being the T1 variant there, uh, as well as being focused right now, half armor probably getting a little spread of the DPS drones. Teams looking to favor the DPS drones right now just to give that split potential. So even when you have these big heavy systems, as a skybreaker goes down, you can still do some applications to these frigates. When we've seen that being quite effective here. Yeah, I mean, I'm willing to bet that Abaddon definitely has reactive armor hardness, but then, of course, he's not fighting some C-tier team. They know that these guys probably have these and are firing the rainbow of missiles at them because, again, missiles can fire anything. So that reactive armor hardness will not pro provide the lengthening benefit that it normally does as he goes into Hull and is just not able to tank these triple crews. I must say, you know, obviously seeing DPS bots on the field is fantastic, but normally you actually see these armor comps going for rep bots, and the baton goes down, and I'm feeling if they just went rep bots there, they might have actually just had the edge they need to just survive that war of attrition of this SNI, because the SNI is still in structure. If they can still push it through and have this equal trade on the battleships, they're still in a very strong position, although they lost all their logic in these battleships. As the Scorpion does go down, the Bargas and the Goblin will still be self-repping, so it is just seeing if these raw, uh, this raw damage from the battleships has enough to break this tank, and if they have enough HP to do them being a slugfest. Yeah, there's also a support wing battle going on at the moment. It looks like the Jaguar and uh, I believe the Harpy of Chad Hammercock and Spin Blot are trying to kill off the last Logi frigate. 
and they're being currently attacked by, I think it's the Skybreaker, so there's a little bit of a logic fight, uh, sorry, a support wing fight going on there. But I think the Jaguar Harpy should come out on top, so it's going to be a question of this battleship brawl, but that Golem is honestly dropping a lot harder than I expected him to. Uh, we'll have to see. Yeah, he's dropping pretty good. If, he can, if they can do that, that, oh, that's pretty strong, going to armor now, getting absolutely shredded. Maybe he burnt out some slots. We'll never know. The well, it could also be that the Redeemer's been sitting here nuding him. True, that's true. Having the that's bonus painful. for that. Navitas does go down. All reps are off field now. It's just battleships slugging into each other. They don't have the advantage that we saw the battlecruiser rush have before, where they can try and bounce these battleships off each other. More relying just on raw firepower and hit points there. But putting that golem into structure, good show. Oh no, this is not looking good for this flagship uh, Bargus now. He's now standing alone against a double battleship comp, and they've got the nukes to turn him off. So this this may not look good for this potentially incredibly shiny Bargus, who's now also, of course, right in front of them. He didn't even attempt to move. Well, this, if I was this is Bargus, I would be looking to run, but he probably... Oh, MJD coming from the Bargus. MJD. MJD spooling up. So he probably has a local MJD fit for this situation. That is He's interesting. No boundary. local problem. No, wait, no, no he's, he's still in the arena. He's still safe. Comfortable in that <laughs> arena. I was at the wrong wrong uh, side of the arena, unfortunately. So, yeah, he is still alive. He's got cruise. He should still be able to hit the Abaddon. I believe he's a pulse fit, too. So he's actually out of their range, I'm pretty sure. Very cheeky. Don't fit a local prop, but fit the MJD. Doesn't get the Marauder bonus for the cooldown for MJDs, unfortunately. So going to be a while before he can do that again. Looks like he's slow boating towards another MJD there right now at the bottom, the, the beacon. Um, but he might be able to pick up this bat and be in a really strong position then. He can indeed. There is no logic to wrap this boy back up anymore. So yeah, he can actually take this Abaddon down. And then it'll be him and a Harpy versus the world. And there's only going to be an Org Navy and a Redeemer for the damage. This That jump might have actually just entirely again flipped this match again. Bounty X is sitting in a very pain, powerful position now. Flag, Bug versus a Redeemer. Uh, this Harpy, unfortunately, trying to approach right at the Redeemer, and the Redeemer is just pummeling into it, so the Redeemer will be shredding this last support ship, leaving the bar against the last man standing. But, you know, I think by the time the Redeemer maybe gets there, especially considering they probably don't have any scrams left, maybe this bar guest can just, you know, do it again. But uh, I actually don't think there is even enough time left in the match for that MJD to come off cooldown. Yeah, potentially. He's going to try and go for the... Uh remote one but unfortunately he's not going to get there in time so now he's going to have to kill as fast as he can that's i think he might have bought time but i think it's still going to end the same way he's behind on points he's got no friends and the opposing team has already on him oh man absolute good show though love to see it um how much time do we have left in the match here just under uh four minutes it's gonna seem um Whew, got to be tight, but I'm going to say that's going to be one for the history books right there. Awesome play. You wouldn't expect that coming from a Tinker comp. So kudos to Avery for his little maneuver there. Uh, securing some more kills. Uh, not going down like a chump at least, but um, might still be death in the water here with this Redeemer getting on top of him now. Yep, he's going to try for the uh, trade with the Redeemer. Try and get him before he dies. It's going to be an interesting race. He's going up against an a, a armor ship with missiles. And I think the Redeemer does have a reactive, so... Unfortunately, he will slowly get better and better resist against this uh, Bargas, so who will then have to reload, waste time. So this this is going to be close, honestly. I, I think the bug will go down very uh, easily, but there's honestly, there was a moment in time I thought this could have been a lot closer. <laughs> Yeah, we're seeing the Skybreaker now of uh, Felicia keeping a scram on Avery. They're not going to let that happen again. That Bargast is staying exactly where he is. There's not going to be any awesome plays, even if he manages to get on top of the beacon. So he pulled his one trick there, uh, did his damage, but he will be going down as he's heading to structure now. Hopefully we're going to be seeing another really juicy kill medal here, uh, which the studio will be able to analyze for us. But um, goodbye, second flagship. Yep, and we can also get to hear the cries of many channel points being lost, but congrats to uh, Polaris there for the amazing win, and with that, we'll go back to the studio and see what they think. Connected. Channel switched. Well, it would have been a f
an easy fight, right? But guess what, dude? I'm not if seeing and people can't get their f it together! Maybe it was just a joke. Well, there you have it. Um, <laughs> Ballard's Mercy Corporation taking that victory. Uh, and fourth match of the day, second with the flagship. Two flagships dead, both bar guests. Uh, Avery Lewis there trying to survive at the end by himself. Uh, the rest of his team not not strong enough, not like Chad Hammercock in that Jaguar. Um, he just could not survive uh, long enough to keep his, his flagship alive. But looking at that bar guest, uh, not the most expensive thing. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised at that uh, from the Boundary Experts team there. Uh, only Kaldarian Navy Cruise Missile Launchers, Tech 2, uh, Shield Hardeners. It's really not that expensive whatsoever. Uh, but there you are, it's dead, who cares? Now, I am joined on the desk by two illustrious guests. Uh, we have Mr. Jin Tan. Uh, you're looking absolutely fabulous today, Jin Tan. Uh, and of course, CCP Swift. Uh, CC Swift, how are you today? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, a little, I like the Boundary Experts team, uh, you know, but I think they just wanted to go to the lower bracket to get more skins. So that's probably what they were thinking there. Also, the Twitch channel points, they probably bet against themselves. Got a lot of Twitch channel points. Easy. Yeah, those Twitch channel points could be incredibly valuable uh, to get, of course, the Galnet skins. Uh, they're pretty cool. They, they're pretty swag yeah. skins. But also, there will be some cool prizes that you can get during the break for this uh, for this stream. So stay tuned for them a little bit later. Jin Tan, um, what did we see in that match there other than Avery Lewis feeding, uh, feeding a flagship bar guest? Yeah, what we saw was actually a really amazing play from PMA. They brought a laser rush comp, you know, fielding five ships which can use mega pulses and just dump heavy DPS even to long range, really abusing the power of the Scorch L Crystal, probably the best ammunition in the game, and using that to just present an incredible amount of DPS. You saw how girthy that attack bar was, even girthier than the, the uh, attack bar of four Dimoses, just enough to blow its way through anything, even after two of those, uh, you know, more weak threats in the Oracles got taken down early in the match. Yeah, uh, I mean, Scorch L, obviously a fantastic piece of ammunition, uh, goes into um, many guns, specifically laser guns. Uh, but CCP Swift, is it better than uh, Hail? You know, because they always say load Hail, never fail. Is that true? Uh, I think I've seen people fail with Hail. Oh. Uh, it's weird, but I, I think that's happened. Barrage, though, also really good ammunition. Um but yeah. Do you know what the best ammunitions are? Who I mean, whoever named the ammunition for the uh, the Edencom yeah. uh, uh, ships was just having a great time. Electro punch. Yeah, electro yep. punch. They sound like energy drinks. They're fantastic. Yeah. I love them. Um, so, PMA Jintan, you did a couple of interviews with the different teams. Uh, tell us a little bit about the PMA team. Unfortunately, PMA did not respond to my request for an interview. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Uh, it'd have been very nice if they had. They were <laughs> clearly <laughs> busy training because exactly. they just took down. I, I think they were. Probably uh, favored to not win that match. Yes. Uh, which is uh, the very nice way of saying they were, you know, the underdog. But, uh, yeah, they were clearly busy training. Uh, like Rocky, they probably, you know, ran up and down some stairs, punched <laughs> some meat somewhere, and uh, brought a Redeemer, Oracle, and uh, a couple of Battens. There you go. So CCB Swift says uh, that uh, they've been out punching meat. Is that the that correct term? That's what you're supposed to do, right? <laughs> right. And this coming from your time in Pandemic Legion Alliance Tournament team? Uh, yeah, we yeah. punched a lot of meat. I didn't want to say that out loud, but I was thinking it in my head. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that team is, is completely different. It's kind of neat. There's a lot of uh, tweet teams in this tournament that kind of uh, branched off from the, the PL Super teams from uh, back when they had a very, very attractive captain. <laughs> uh, Co-captain, uh, guy who they put in a ship who had no prop mod, uh, that guy was, you know, incredible. I forget his name, but y you guys probably remember. Uh, I don't, unfortunately. The, the, uh, the times of Pandemic Legion uh, ha have long passed. We will see Pandemic Legion, actually, in this tournament for the first time in a couple of years. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing if they can uh, bring it back, take a couple of Ws, or if they will continue their recent trend of uh, not being so good. Uh, let's take a look at our next match, though, because Paper Numbers is a team that I do know, Jintan, that you know plenty about. Uh, you've been excited to see them. They are banning out the Celestis, the Curse, and the Jackdaw, whereas Odin's Call, who they will be facing in the next match, banning out the Aeneros, the Guardian, and the Loki. 
interesting that it's a ban, banning both of the Tech 2 Armour Logistics Cruisers here from Odin's Call. Uh, Odin's Call, another team that did very well in Alliance Tournament last year. They came through the feeders, they, they performed excellently um, and secured themselves a place in Alliance Tournament 18. Jintan, what do you make of these bans here? Uh, it looks to me like Odin's Call are really, really focusing in on... Um Park Bank's kind of ship pool. He's historically been a very, very competent uh, logistics pilot, probably easily one of the top three in the game. And here, Odin's Call are taking him out of his comfort picks, the Aneuros and the Guardian. That's going to force him onto something a little different, either an Augura, an Executor, if they want to run an armor comp, or, you know, maybe force them into a shield comp. Paper numbers have historically really favored running armor comps over shield as well. So, you know, Odin's Call are really just trying to take out what Park Bank does best and force them onto something else. Meanwhile, paper numbers, they're banning just control, control, control. The Celestis, an amazing damp ship. The Curse, an amazing tracking uh, disruption and newting ship. And then the Jackdaw is actually surprisingly in this AT an incredible damping ship as well, with its sharpshooter bonus giving it a resistance to um, E War effects, allowing it to win out a damp war against things like Kerry's and even hostile Celestises. So paper numbers just really trying to take um, you know a high execution options off the table for Odin's there. Maybe they'll be bringing something like a, a Lashak or a Balgorn or something that's you know got that real heavy focus onto one ship that they don't want it to be um, neutered. Awesome. And then um, this Loki, of course, being a, a very popular ship. We're seeing uh, quite a few teams already today bringing the Loki. Obviously, it's a Mimitar-sponsored uh, tournament this year. Uh, so all the Mimitar ships are downpointed to make them slightly cheaper to bring. Uh, Loki being the Mimitar Tech 3 cruiser. It has those long-range bonus webs. It's really good uh, in both rush comps and in uh, more long-range comps for just screening, keeping people away. CSP Swift. What is screening? Tell us about that. All right. So uh, screening is when you kind of control uh, ships that are rushing towards you. So if there are six ships rushing towards you and you kind of web or scram two of them, then those guys are stuck in place and the other four battleships get to you. And they might not have enough or the other four ships get to you. So they might not have enough critical mass if you screen those other two off. Uh, so that's a, a tactic you guys should be looking for quite a bit. Uh, you'll often see a ship like a Skybreaker or a Jaguar or generally a smaller ship do the screening. But you mentioned um, the webs from the Loki. The, those things can also com come out and reach and stop a ship in its tracks. Uh, so a very, very important thing to counter against specifically rush comps. Yeah, a lot of time we see teams trying to split up uh, enemy teams as well. So if you have uh, one ship that has been controlled down into one area and then uh, you let someone else come through, now you have two sh sets of ships in opposite parts of the arena. The logistics ship maybe has to make a decision, hey, do I stick with this guy uh, or do I go over and try and save this guy? At this point, the guy who's just been controlled down has essentially been removed from the match. Like If you're out of range, tackled. Like if You, you might be this like 25-point Lashak and you've been tackled by a Jaguar, and you can't hit it, and all the rest of your friends are like 100 kilometers away, and there's nothing you can do. You've been removed from that match without even being killed. And that's that's super important. Jintan, as a, 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 you've captained, you've flown in a lot of teams, how, imp how much effort do you put into splitting up teams like that? Um, you'll normally try and do it um, uh, as much as you possibly can, but the, you know something to keep in mind here, especially when we're talking about tackling, is the sheer difficulty in organising it. You land on grid and you have maybe two minutes to figure out what your opponent's comp's trying to do, what their biggest threats are to your comp, uh, and, and then figure out what you can do with the amount of tackle you have. You know, figure out, it, do, I, do we have the tackle advantage? Do we have enough people to lock down all their tackle and then maybe send one other guy in to tackle this key component? It, that's, it, it's so hard that you can't really, st from the start of a match, split people up. You have to go into it, see the positions develop, and then one of your tackle pilots will likely call, I can lock down this guy here out of range, and then you'll sweep in with the rest of your fleet and just take advantage of it. Yep. Yeah, and, and just to add on that, uh, as as Jin was saying, like those are very complicated decisions to make, and you also have uh, your E-War squad uh, assigning damps at the same time, saying, put three damps on this guy, if you lose the damp war, do this. Uh, so it's very, very hectic out there. That's why there's generally one... Uh, or two kind of backup captains that are uh, working the E-War squad and working the tackle squad, uh, just kind of to make sure that they work uh, in tandem and, and achieve the goal of getting the the fat dub, as the kids say. <laughs> That's what the kids say, right? Yeah, I, I, so. I wouldn't know anymore, I'm afraid. Um, so we actually are pretty much ready to go to this match, and I'm being told um, that we have another flagship on ground, another flagship bar guest, Odin's Call, bringing theirs, having just watched two other flagship bar guests get 
uh, turbo dunked upon uh, by the teams that brought them. Uh, flagships currently 0% survival rate in the Lions Tournament 18. And we are in match five. Match five with two flagships down, a third one being fielded. Is this one going to survive? Are Odin's Call going to turn, turn this tide of uh, flagship just destruction? Uh, well, let's go to the arena and find out uh, with paper numbers versus Odin's Call. And welcome back to the arena with me and Zoo and damn you Ithaca for ruining my fun because that's right, Yokan on Odin's side have brought a flag Vargas and we have honestly what it looks to be a kite versus kite match. We have a triple battle cruiser with Park Bank that's saying, I don't care how many you ban, I've always got more Logi cruisers versus a, um, well, Gila Vargas kite comp. So this is <laughs> honestly a very interesting match. I'm going to be curious to see who gets the upper upper hand on this one. Yeah, so the Bargast on the um, Odin side having the Rapid Heavies. Um, the Battlecruiser Hulls on the Paper Number side rocking Heavy Missile, so going for range. I think this is also going to be the first game where we're seeing a full commitment to dams, as in the Morlis and the Carriers featuring on both sides. Uh, we might be seeing some utility mids also come into uh, application here to put some more dams. Dams not being restricted to bonus hulls only, dams being allowed on anything, and dams are allowed to be scripted. Fun. Exactly that. It's, honestly, it's going to be a very interesting match to see who manages the position correctly in this one. Both teams have gone for full kite. There is honestly a lot of damage on both teams, even though the bars doesn't seem like much. There is actually quite a bit from the gealers, from the of the caracals. They put out 500 plus a piece, so this is like yeah, it's going to be wild. The match is about to start uh, momentarily. What do you think is going to happen, Ibuzu? I'm really hoping we're going to see an Osprey die. Obviously, these dams are going to come into effect. We're going to see what can happen here. The EOS being bonus for info links, even though it looks out of place, it still is a fantastic shield ship right now. So don't be confused for that um, right now. So the info links are going to be awesome. We're going to see the match underway soon, but I'm really hoping we're going to see some logic trades here. Otherwise, we're just going to be seeing it come down to pilot skill and the kiting, I think. In fact, it's pilot skill and target uh, selection is going to be very interesting. You see damage being spread out. I think that's actually from a uh, Stormbringer. Stormbringer hitting everything. Yep. I mean, look at the, I can just see the damping going. I think there's actually damps on the Drake navies. Oh no, those are tracking disruptors, I believe. No, wait, no. So we see most of Odin's team going damps. towards the MJD beacon there, um, going left uh, opposite. So both teams keeping range here. Although the EOS and the bar gas uh, keeping out there. We've seen sentry drones come out from the EOS. So it looks like EOS just setting them up for a screening position. Unfortunately, that means on his next pulse of links, the entire Odin's team is going to miss all of those links now. At least he'll be applying to his flagship. But that uh, bar gas, the Yokan, is uh, sending himself forward into the fray. Yeah, there's an absolute wave of uh, damps being put out on the EOS and double uh, two gealers. There was actually a massive wave of tracking disruptors as well, I think. But they've all now been scattered a bit off. I think some damps have definitely ruined that. Look at the authors of Captain Shinken already down there. I look up for a second and he's almost gone. Looks Burn! like uh, they were just waiting for Yokan to give the green light for him being in range. Obviously, him being missile disrupted. And once he gave the green light, things just started getting deleted. But we've seen Colonel and the Gila going down as well on the Odin side, both team training on the cruiser side. A little support uh, damage coming still there from the Stormbringer. So that's obviously annoying the Scimitar right now. But luckily, it has multiple reps to split up, uh, not being limited like a Triglavian frigate. But we see the Caracal as well going down, another cruiser being deleted. I'm actually surprised I went for the uh, the authors first because these characters are generally incredibly uh, uh, squishy and easy to kill. See, a second Gila now being pummeled. The character gets deleted in the second. The second character is now being primary. Gila gets deleted. This is, again, they're picking off the uh, the mid-sized DPS ships here and just removing them. See, look at that. Car character's about to hit armor. He's just going to vanish. Well, a lot of support and getting help. shredded here. So we'll Thanks see. God. No team is making any plays for the cruiser logi at all. Interesting. Just getting rid of much DPS. We see the Molus on Martin on the Odin side getting some pressure. Uh, maybe just getting finally sick of that damps. But as I'm saying, that pay Park Bank and um, similar getting some light pressure now. They might be looking to finally secure a kill there. Obviously, the bar guest has to go through rapid reloads as we do finally see our first E warship actually getting removed off the field. Yep, so now this Scimitar Park Bank is on a timer. He has uh, only a, f a number of cycles to use in XLASB, and then he is out. So they now need Ooh. to make his uh, life count. You need to pick the ship and kill it. On Odin's side going down, that's going to be a huge positive for paper numbers, meaning that Scimitar can fly around now again. Obviously, the uh, Hyena long-range webs being a prime application tool for anything with missiles and even these drones from the Gillas. But then again, these Gila drones are in hot pursuit right now of this uh, Scimitar. Still going to be applying pressure. His XLB's charge is going to run out soon, and then he'll be going down with no friendly rep bots on him. Yeah, EOS drones at the moment, and uh, the Ultras is tanking very well. He's repping very early. He's actually been repping himself over full, so I wonder if that's either a uh, not an XLSB, or maybe he's wait potentially wasting cycles there. 
Uh, we might be seeing a bit of a dead spot here. I think some reloads might be happening once that Bargas comes off. Or uh, no, not some. Uh, you are still being applied to the Bargas, so some control. But he's right there in the thick of things, so he shouldn't be too much influenced by the disruption. Uh, Scimitar is probably going to start to get low in those charges, so they're probably going to try and just smash through him the moment they get a chance. But the Flycatcher of New cannot on Odin Skull be going down. That's some more support. Flycatcher being a lovely little thing to pick off light support as well, and just doing full application to that Scimitar. Is a surprisingly tanky little destroyer that is able to pick off its uh, fellow brothers. But uh, at the moment, it looks like Paper Numbers actually won the uh, E War War. Their carries are still on field, who can now pretty much pick a ship and turn it off. And at the moment, I think at the moment, he's just made the Bargas almost kind of useless. Oh, the scimitar goes down for paper numbers. That's a bad call considering Osprey is still alive on Odin's call with that flag. The stork does go down, so that's going to be the links, although they still have the EOS to supply some links there, so that's still good. Um, but it uh, looks like Odin's call is a really strong position. The Osprey finally getting some pressure onto it, but now this bar gas is just full to, like, doesn't need to coordinate any clips. The moment it's just off reload, it can shoot whatever it wants. Yep, and it's gone straight into brawl range of the Drake Navy, pretty much t making the carries now a non-factor, so... <laughs> We've been damped. Fine then, I'll just get right next to you. And he's killed the Drake Navy on his own. There is uh, there is not much DPS left on that field. And a Claymore, Drake Navy, and Osprey Navy is a, is a good amount, but against a flag bug, that might not be enough. Yeah, uh, going for the carries, I'd say that's a good call while you still have the flycatcher. Uh, make sure that bar gas that nothing can outkite him. Yeah, carries goes down. Very good call there. And the flycatcher goes down just in time because otherwise, if that flycatcher got down, went down, there might not have been enough on grid here to that get rid of that carries. And that carries could have just been an absolute nightmare for that bar gas. So, really good call there. Finish him off while you still had the things to finish him off on grid. And now this bar gas can just have the time of its life pummeling into some battle cruisers. Yep, and he hasn't got pretty much any Dipter drones on him, just a few Haunt ECs and a Fly of Echoes. So the Stormbringer isn't even trying to remove the drones. He's picking on a target and starting to shoot, I believe. So this is a very interesting match. I believe this Flag Bug is going to have the lead at the moment. He's going after a Drake Navy, ripping through that quickly, and they just can't really respond. Not much to do. So, uh, well done on them. And also, even if they switch to the EOS, uh, well, I mean, when Stormbringer goes down, they left off the EOS or Bargas, both rather tanky ships. Not much to do more in DPS. Stormbringer does go down, um, kind of tying it up for points here, quite close in paper numbers advantage right now. But with the Drake Navy going down soon, Odin's Call will rip ahead again in points with a quite a comfortable lead and quite a comfortable thing in application, hit points, utility, Bargas oh, having no. two utility highs. So, uh, good position here for Odin's Call. Bargus is stuck on reload just so that the uh, Drake Navy got low enough. So he's going to have to reload, then finish him off, and then go after potentially the Osprey Navy. As the EOS see... drones, I think, are picking on the Osprey Navy itself. So I'm wondering if it's Jake of uh, JT is going for it. No, no, he decided to not go for the MJD. Doesn't want to go out honorably by boundary. The EOS of Lithin on Odin's side getting picked off there. Um, I suppose they're doing what they can given what they got. Um, but with the Drake Navy issue down now, Yokan and the Bargast is having an awesome game, enjoying being the first uh, flagship to be fielded that actually lives. Indeed, they have to go for the EOS for sure. It's it's probably the best target there, but then they have to figure out how do we beat a flag bug, and I feel like they're running out of teeth and tools to make this work, and that bug is going to start controlling the entire match, as a flagship should do. As a flagship should do. So, points lead here for Odin's Call. we got about under four minutes left here of the match. EOS is likely to be going down. Um, not sure if that's going to put a point advantage, actually, for paper numbers, um, but this Bargas should be able to at least hopefully, like, corner an Osprey Navy and finish that off at the very least to just secure a point advantage. Still, Vigil will be going down. Um, not really necessary, but obviously any free kills, any free points, just to make sure you're securing that victory and that time cannot run out in disadvantage towards you. Interesting thought as well is that the uh, Claymore has been damping out the Bargus even now. And I don't think I've seen the Bargus shoot. He could be potentially reloading, or he could actually be properly damped out with the Claymore just running away. I believe he's just on reload getting ready for the next clip. Very funny looking at these velocities. Bargast almost going as fast as this Claymore. That's hilarious. That is the power of a Bargast just cornering that Claymore against the arena. He's, uh, Claymore's going to have eventually decide to turn around as this Eels goes down. Not put much more space left to run away from a Bargast charging at you. Yep, and now the bucket has reloaded and is immediately firing. And you can just see the damage these uh, officer rapid heavies can do. Just ripping this claymore open. Well, who knows? They could have cheaped out and gone for some faction. You never know what they cheap out on these officer ships. You always expect the bling, and then you get surprisingly disappointed when you see that kill mail. But um, then again, it's more about the ship itself and the bonuses it brings that normally in the modules these days. Yeah. Oh, the Claymore goes down. And honestly, there is nothing Paper Numbers can do. They gave it one hell of a fight. There was a few months ago I thought they could have had it. Park Bank's legendary Logi does usually quite well, but 
just can't beat the flag bug. I think, what do you think? If it was a standard bug, you think they would have won this or not? I don't think the flag actually brought that much, to be fair. Um, I think it was just a good trade of things, it seems. Um, not sure if paper numbers could have done a better application. Um, it seemed at one point, paper numbers, like you said, was it set up in a good position on EWAR side. They had no EWAR coming their way. They had full range advantage. And I think maybe they put a pressure on that Osprey a tiny bit late. Um, it's a bit hard to say. Obviously, positioning comes into uh, play. These Logi pilots being very good in their positioning coming this, uh, being in this uh, tier of tournament. Um, but I don't think a flag was the linchpin for victory here. I think I might disagree a little bit, but either way, that is, is well flown by both teams as well. Like both really gave it their absolute all in this, and that bug is now just f uh, finishing off the Osprey Navy. And you can just see the uh, damage per volley from these rapid heavies. The Osprey Navy was repping and just can't hold it. It's just too much. Some spicy stuff. One thing you always got to be careful of with an officer bar gas and, and running rapid heavies is you can go through heat super, super quickly. So well done <laughs> yeah, on not burning there. out your guns. You're kind of casting your entire team and just being a lump of wasted points. Uh, Agent doing a good job of actually keeping up. We're seeing some XLSB charges coming through there. So good job on just pumping up those numbers. Um, maybe you survived and reload. Who knows? I don't think so. There he goes. Bravo to um, Odin's call. Well flown. Well flown to paper numbers as well. And with that, we'll go back to studio and see what they think. Odin's call there with the dub, as the kids are saying, as CCP Swift informs me, uh, with Yokan in that flagship Vargas overcoming all of the curses. Uh, the first blue team to win, the first flagship to be fielded and survive, the first flagship to be fielded and actually win the match. Uh, so showing their uh, try and venture experts how to fly a flagship Vargas as he basically carried that match to victory by himself at the end there. Fantastic piloting. Well done, Odin's call, taking that very, very clutch win right there. Uh, paper numbers were super popular um, coming into this tournament. Uh, many people had them down as a dark horse. Uh, and this match, I remember being one of the hardest ones for us as casters to predict because both teams super strong. Uh, Odin's had a fantastic showing in the feeder tournaments. They did a really great showing last year in last tournament 17. Paper numbers, of course, as you mentioned before, Jen, another really strong team potentially going to do really well. And what a match, like what a fantastic match. Uh, CCP Swift, you want to talk a little bit about the carries uh, in that particular match. Yeah, so uh, the carries is a great platform, specifically when uh, you can script your damps. Uh, it's a very fast locker, so it can win damp wars. Uh, it can stay alive. It's incredibly fast. Uh, it's probably the best damping platform outside of the Raiju, which you can't bring, so uh, you know, s might as well bring it. Unfortunately, they were met with uh, Odin's Call bringing a bunch of drones. Uh, those are things you can't really damp, so the Gila's uh, and the Eos. Uh, really, really good uh, calling there by the uh, Odin's Call team. I don't know if they just stuck those in at the end or if they had this in their pocket, uh, knowing that coming up against a control team, those would be very powerful. Uh, but it worked incredibly well for them, uh, eking out that win. I think if they didn't have even one of those ships, I think paper uh, numbers would have won. Wow. Uh, you think it's that, that clutch, that ship right there? Yep. Excellent. Fantastic. You should you should bring carries. No, or don't bring <laughs> carries. I don't know. Uh, it depends if we like you or not. Yeah, if you're good, bring a carries. Uh, if we don't like you, don't bring a carries. I, I don't know how this works. <laughs> Who do you not like? I like everyone. Okay. I think every team should win. However, <laughs> only the best team can win.
Excellent. Very, That's very, deep. Non, very That's non-committal deep. and very deep. It's uh, five deep for yeah. me. Uh, Jin Tan, you wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between the Osprey uh, brought by Odin's Call and the Scimitar by Paper Numbers. Like, What's the key difference between those two ships? Yeah, so obviously the Osprey is a T1 logistics ship, and you know you don't see those used a huge amount on TQ outside of you know very very cheap roams. But in the uh, tournament format, the points that you save going to a T1 logistics cruiser over a T2 logistics cruiser can open up so much, and you saw that in the Odin's Call comp. Um, whereas uh, Paper Numbers had f- uh, three or four battle cruisers, um, Odin's Call were able to pair that battle cruiser core with a bar guest, and that did so much work for them there, right at the end of the match, especially. Yokan Sober being able to clutch it out for his team. You know, I think both myself and the casters almost thought Paper Numbers had, cl- had, had won it, you know, maybe a little bit of an upset potentially. Uh, but Yokan was able to just fly around with the uh, point, you know, in that the ship that bringing a T1 logistics enabled them to do. And you also saw Odin's be very aware of the situation and the fact that if they let their opponent's scimitar stay alive in the long run, it would outwrap their logistics and therefore uh, make it more difficult for them to achieve victory. So they opted into a logistics trade very, very early on in the match. And that's what led to all of those E warships dying and eventually them ha- having the DPS and tank advantage in the very, very end game of that match. Awesome. And uh, CCP Swift, when it comes to these logistics cruisers, um, t- uh, let's just talk about Tech 2. Mm-hmm. So um, the Scimitar is usually uh, the more popular of the shield ones. Um, why? Uh, so the Scimitar is incredibly mobile. It can run very fast. It has a uh, decent enough tank, but it's mostly its survivability. Because if your logistics ship gets caught, then most captains will just snap shoot and try and kill it straight off the bat. Uh, so the scimitar, unlike its uh, partner in the basilisk, basilisk is much slower, uh, much uh, easier to catch. Uh, you generally use it use it when you have like that that really strong battleship core, like the golem, navy scorpion type thing. Then uh, the basilisk works well for you. But in almost every other situation, the scimitar uh, is really the the choice for these teams. And conversely, Jin Tan, when we look at armor comps, uh, you have the Oneiros and the Guardian. And I think we see much more Guardians than we see uh, Basilisks, but the most popular one is still almost certainly the Oneiros. Um, why, why do people just tend to bring that Oneiros? So the Oneiros has a couple of key advantages over the Guardian, uh, namely that it can fit a dual prop and uh, enough cap to run and a sensor booster. And especially in a tournament format like this where damps are so powerful, uh, that's a very, very key aspect, which means that you can put out reps for a long time. And if you get caught, you have the potential to actually escape by just running your afterburner, getting some tackle in on your opponent's tackle ship, and then just coasting out of the range of their web and scram. That said, the Guardian does have a huge following, especially among um, amongst kind of like top tier teams, because the Guardian can put out more reps than the Oneiros. I know, for example, Reload, uh, the logistics pilot for Volta, heavily favors the Guardian over the Oneiros. Yeah, and speaking of, um, having a solid logistics pilot uh, is such, such an important thing. Uh, it is probably like one of the single hardest things to do in an alliance tournament is to fly a logistics ship well because you are by yourself, uh, unless you are have a buddy in, with the frigates, but if you're in a cruiser, you're definitely by yourself. Um, you are basically responsible for keeping your team alive while also be responsible for making sure they're not too far away from you, while also being responsible to not fly out of the arena while also not dying yourself. There's just so much going on. You have to be so situation- situationally aware of where everybody is, what's going on. I, I mean, CC Swift, have you ever done it? Have you ever tried it? I have. I've flown in logistics twice in the Alliance tournament, the ones in Alliance tournament eight. Um, I died, but my team won, so I did my job. Copium. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is incredibly hard because you've got every small ship running after you. You're the target of every E War. Uh, if you're out of position, the team blames you instead of themselves for being out of position. Like, you're the guy that screwed up, not everyone else. Uh, not fair. Uh, <laughs> logistics pilot's always right. They they at least should be. Yeah. If you have a logistics pilot in your team, make sure you say thank you to them because they're the one. They're the absolute heroes. Um, is it's it's one of those ships where you always see the same person in that ship. Like if that's your logistics pilot, that's all they fly. You won't see them in different ships. You usually in teams you try and organize people. So maybe you'll have people who are your mainline battleship pilots. Some people who specialize in the, the more like fast frigates and Evor, but. Still, to this day, I maintain that the most important person is pretty much the logistics pilot, if they're good. Then the target caller. That's also important. 
Yeah, yeah, less important, right? Because people will just go off because they've trained so much. They'll generally go off muscle memory. So even if the captain's calling a bad target, they'll be like, ah, I didn't hear what he said. I'm going to go do the smart thing anyways. But yeah, the logistics pilot, uh, probably one of the hardest uh, things to do. And uh, you're absolutely right. When, when you have like a, a really incredible logistics pilot, you will see that name year after year after year. And uh, he'll generally always resub a couple months before the Alliance tournament to kind of knock that rust off so he can, you know, you know be be uh be the stalwart of the team. Yeah, and then speaking briefly again of captains, uh, Jintan, you've flown in a whole bunch of matches and you've run some teams. You've done this for a while. Um, when you warp in on grid, like how important is just situational awareness, target calling, picking the strategy, and then executing it? It's key. Uh, understanding what your opponents are trying to do is the first stop, uh, first step in preventing them from being able to do it. And you know, e you know, Eve Eve tournament play tends to be very, very game plan orientated. You need to understand. Okay, do we need to take this to an end game? Do we need to do a logistics trade? Can we do a logistics trade? Um, what needs to be tackled down and stopped from coming into our core? Because you know, maybe they have a vindicator or a Balgorn or something that's going to cause them real cause you real issues if it gets to spool up. Um, it is an incredible, incredible process. And normally you'll have other people on the team helping you. So, for example, you have a couple of people who are like, your job is just to go and look at the ship models, identify what guns everyone's using, feed that information back to me so I can make a better decision. Uh, your logistics pilot will normally be calling out, you know, watch out for this tackle and that tackle. Um, and then, obviously, as um, I think Elise said earlier, you normally have one of your more veteran pilots help coordinate your E-War as well if you're running a uh, E-War control comp. There's a there's a ton of moving parts that go into it, and only having two to three minutes to do it is why you need to practice so much for the tournament. Awesome. And if I could hop in, I think the one thing that separates the good teams from the great teams is decisiveness. Uh, even if you make the wrong decision, but you like stick to it, sometimes it'll give you a, a win. When like if you're indecisive and you swap targets a lot, and you're like, oh, maybe this guy's better. Uh, you can. I've seen teams lose just doing that and swapping back and forth. Whereas a team that you know just makes the wrong call but sticks to it, uh, it generally gets the, gets the win. Well, let's find out if uh, one of these teams can get a win because Esports Potopia and Nanofiber Tokens are sitting in the arena waiting to go head-to-head -head and see who will be the victors. So let's go to the arena and find out. And welcome back to the arena. And I'm incredibly excited because my favorite ship is here. And it's honestly a new variation on, in my opinion, the Nighthawk Rush. Usually Nighthawks require a Loki. He, they brought a Vindicator. Even better webs. Meanwhile, on the other side, we are seeing the first time now uh, Armageddon navies. Both of them rapid heavy fit. So for, uh, with the uh, recent changes, it's going to be very interesting to see how these ships function in this uh, arena. Indeed. So um, well, Armageddon Navy issue getting a bonus towards energy turrets, rapids, or crews and torpedoes. So actually getting a bit of like a Minotaur bonus there, being able to use whatever sips of weapon systems at once while keeping a new bonus, while having a drone bonus. Absolutely spe spectacular ships. Both teams opting for the Frig Lodge here as we do see these things underway. I'm excited to see who's going to be ripping each other apart, but I'm excited to see how these Night Oaks and Vinny combo. Vindy and look at the control is. bar, mate. Look at the control bar for Nanofiber Tokens. It is girthy. It is massive. There's a lot of control from their side. They've got Sentinel, they've got an Arby, they've got probably an Ewar scattered throughout their entire fleet. And of course, we see what Vindicators always do. This is what they're known for. Just rushing in as fast as they can. As fast as he can, but being a bit slow with the kickoff there, finally getting up into speed. Uh, we see the Nighthawk there of Yogg leading the uh, charge. So the Nighthawk's leading the charge right there. Followed up with the Stabber. So hopefully that Vindicator is going to be able to apply, but they've locked down on Chadwick there in the Army getting Navy issue. He looks like he's probably going to be the first primary as they come zeroing in on him. Yep, I think they're going to go for the headshot here, remove the bigger ship first, and then go on, go from there. And the Vindicator on a Armageddon, Armageddon Navy should be a reasonably easy win for the Geddon. Sorry, for the uh, Vic Vindicator, sorry. Especially with Twin Hamhawk backup, providing a lot of DPS. We should see this Armageddon Navy suffer quite considerably. But then again, there is a lot of Ewar in his team that could maybe provide what he needs. Unfortunately, the Thali has been free lodgy here. They're going to have to be quite close to rep this Armageddon and quite closer even if they want to stay into prime optimal range. That means they can be quick follow-up targets for newts or webs here from that uh, Vindicator as we see Andy and the Thali actually getting a lot of pressure there. So like I said, coming into the danger zone to keep the Geddon alive and paying the price. Yep, and I noticed the, the Stabber of Rith Anakin is sitting at the back. I believe that's with his own Logi friends. Yeah, it is. He maybe should have uh, been in the fight, but I think he was protecting his Logi frigs, which are a bit far away. 
absolutely massive EC cloud we see there on the other Thalia of Can Paso. So they're uh, dedicating all that EC drones to him. That is an absolute massive cloud sitting on him. So I'm sure he's not being a happy chappy right now. I'm not sure I fully agree with that. If you've got that much ECM, I would honestly put it on the other Armageddon Navy and break up the Rapid Heavy clips. Make them fire off sync, which means that, honestly, if that happens, you have neutered Rapid Heavy. See another ship going down. This Armageddon Navy is slowly creeping down. I'm honestly surprised he survived as long as he had. He, this guy is getting pounded, but there is honestly just a lot going on. Unfortunate choice of the Nighthawks here, unless they actually uh, up, uh, opted out of that, they are going to be bonus purely towards Kinetic as the Stabber goes down there. And that Kinetic folding the same kind of damage as um, the Blasters of the Vindicator, leaning towards advantage for the Armageddon and the Armor's reactive armor hardener. There. So that's probably why we've seen this getting damage stalling out slightly and becoming a bit of a grind fest. It looks like they probably will be securing the kill here, but that's why we've seen a bit of momentum lost there. Obviously, if the Scythe Fleet's going down, they had a bit more damage choice in them to spread that damage around, but a lot more Kinetic in the top end heavy damage here and if they get the good navy they have to get another very hard call what do you go for next do you go for the double headshot and try and uh, win from top down or do you try and use the webs from your vindy to start just deleting small stuff with nighthawk support oh thought they're fighting goes down there get it. let's see if they can even so get it this guy is holding there's one Thalia goes down, other Thalia of Khan is still up. Um, at least both Frigologia is still alive on the oh, uh, Ace Bar side, but the Geddon would be going down now, getting to structure, still being a lot of hit points, being the faction battleship. Yeah, he was creeping down like 1% at a time on armor. I saw it come up a few times, but that's it. He's going to go down. So now, what's the next choice? They've got a Nighthawk being hit now. They've Lodgies, I believe, are now in the, in the fight. They are indeed, so they're going to try and save the Nighthawk. But what's your next target? What, what are they going to well, go I, for? I would be seeing what I can grab with Vinny to just could do some quick pops off there, give you support, some breathing nope, room. They're going for the uh, headshot. That, they're going for the get-ins, it seems. They, they're comfortable in their position. They're uh, probably also just being tackled there, uh, comfortable in what they have, what's in range. But that Nighthawk's going to be paying the price for this uh, slugfest right now. I am, I'm personally, I'm not a fan of that call, but I, I can kind of see why they might go for it, commit to the strategy. But... They, they're losing DPS rapidly. The Nighthawk is now gone. They're now down to Exec Navy and Nighthawk and Vindicator. I can't see them breaking through this Geddon Navy with their Lodgy still um, intact. Yeah, that's it's true. Here, uh, Nanofiber has the most ships on grid right now, but really, when you look at it, they don't have that much damage. Most of it coming from the Geddon. Obviously, some drone support from the Vexor Navy and the EOS. Excare Navy issue will be going down soon. Having a lot of structure, so he'll be tanking there a bit. Um, but we're seeing no, no stabilizing a bit of a comfortable position, taking advantage of what control they have of the Sentinel, the Arbitrator, and the Newts coming from the Geddon Navy issue. Yeah, it's, they're now in a very hard spot. The Vindy could maybe switch to the EOS, but the EOS is going to be just as tanky. I mean, the options are small ships around him, and like, what can he shoot? Like a Skybreaker? That's not worth it. He has to commit to it, and it's just not going to work, I don't think. Oof. Unfortunate part here is also going for the Vindicator and Nighthawk combo, splitting weapon systems like that. That means if uh, Nanofiber was either, let's say, went all in on their disruptions, the all tracking disruptors, sure, the Vindy paid the price. They went all in on Guidance, the Nighthawks paid the price. If they split up, I mean, they can still hit both things. So no matter what Nanofiber was going to put in those Igor slots on the Arbitrator and Sentinel, they were going to disrupt esports' uh, weapon systems here, splitting them up like I, that. I do get you for sure, but honestly, I, I, I love the idea of bringing the web support that's required for Nighthawks in a Vindicator, just bringing more DPS. I, of course, I, do, I just love Vindicators, so honestly, I am incredibly biased. But uh, I think, unfortunately, with Yogg-Saron about to go down soon as well, this Armageddon Navy is slowly creeping down, but it's not going to be fast enough. And you can see the uh, the uh, the Newts and the E-War slowly making this Vindicator more and more worthless. Nah, uh, it's unfortunate. A lot of these easy drones being dead in the water here as their pilots have been destroyed. No one to control them. Being abandoned to the cold hardness of space here. Getting just being ground down. So Nighthawk will be disappearing soon. So as much as you love the Vindy, it will be featuring the most in this match, being the last ship to be destroyed for esports. Yeah, and now you can watch all the ECM, all the E Ward, all the uh, Newts, all going onto this Vindicator, and just th this is the worst, uh, the worst life for a Vindicator to live in. It's great being the one battleship versus everything, but it's not great when it's all E War. <laughs> You're just well, living see. in a world. Maybe, maybe you can like, make a lucky grab, grab something, and give a few pops just to get those fuel, you know, kill nails to care, swag a bit on some people here. But he's definitely will be going down there. Not much escape. I don't think he can even pull off a heroic MJD here. He is scrammed in case for some reason he had one fit as well. Interesting. I think the Vexen Navy actually just bumped him away from the Armageddon Navy. So I believe he can't even kill the Armageddon Navy anymore. He's now left him. He could maybe try to switch to the Vex Navy, but he's also been tracking disruptors. So again, he can't kill anything. And unfortunately, this is how all good Vindicators die. They die to all the evil in the world. 
Boo, hiss. But honestly, well played to Nana Fiber Tokens. Well played indeed. Good use of the E-War here. Good use of just all your ships. And we're also just seeing why teams have been banning the Armageddon Navy issue. So we're really well played here by Nano Fiber Tokens as they take a quite comfortable lead here and victory over Esports Potopia. And we will be sending it back to the studio. Another great haul back from Amar. Damn, I'm thirsty. Ah, that hits the spot. Farmer's Bar could be anywhere. Nano Fiber tokens there taking the victory over Esports Potopia, who it seemed to be fielded a Shield Vindicator. Uh, strong, strong opening move for Alliance Tournament 18. Uh, Jin Tan, the Vindicator, not normally something we would see fit with Shield mods, uh, and we did see that Vindicator repping his Shield. Um, why? Um, I, I think a large part of that is probably coming down to the fact that you can put an in absolutely insane amount of damage mods in the many lows that the Vindicator has if you do that. I mean, you saw at the end of that game, the Vindicator actually still almost had the same potential attack bar as the entire uh, Nanofiber Tokens team. However, potential damage doesn't really matter when you don't have the capacity to cycle your guns, which is going to happen when you have to use your mid slots for shield tank as opposed to injectors and webs. That's kind of the other reason you don't normally see shield vindicators. Those webs on a vindicator, 90%, they can slow absolutely anything down. You saw it take that Thalia to almost zero MMS, uh, uh, only for the team to not capitalize on it and kill it, and instead swap onto Chadwick, the tankiest ship on the grid. There you are. Uh, and TCP Swift, we saw two Armageddon Navy issues. Uh, you must be pretty excited about, about that. They're, uh, they've just yeah. recently been buffed uh, in, the, in the Uprising expansion. Tell us about them. Indeed. Uh, so they're good now. Uh, they used to be bad. The balance team was like, hey, you know what would be amazing? Instead of these being bad, we make them good. And then they just did it. Uh, and that, that came out on Nova November 8th. Uh, so they're very similar. We talked about it before. They're very similar uh, to the standard get now. Uh, so they are just a little bit more hit points. Uh, a great nuding platform, a great control platform, and two of them staring you in the face. Uh, that's very, very spooky. And these teams didn't have a lot of time to prepare for these. So uh, nanofiber tokens, these guys, uh, very quickly when they saw the stats, threw this team together and, uh, you know, it got them a, a win and it looked very convincing. No unfortunate Giga Chad picked the Armageddon Navy as the flagship, of course, no. because the uh, flagship had to be submitted prior to the announcement of these changes. Uh, and anyone who had submitted a flagship Armageddon Navy issue prior to those changes would probably be considered utterly insane because, as, as CSP have mentioned, they were pretty turbo trash. Uh, now, I'm super excited for this next match coming up. Um, it's probably one of my favorite ones of today. It's going to be Darkseid versus Templus Calciv. Uh, both story teams with a lot of history, a lot of success, a lot of strife, and some some failure in the tournament. Templus Calciv last year, I think they got top eight uh, after winning Alliance Open. They uh, dunked Hydra Reloaded uh, in weekend one of Alliance Tournament 16, uh, much to everyone's surprise. Uh, and of course, Darkseid, very experienced team uh, with a lot of the uh, Russian community pilots flying in there. Let's take a look at some of the history of these teams. Let's pull up Darkseid right now and take a look at them. Uh, so Darkseid, another 69 pilot team. Nice. Um, with a whole bunch of veterans. Faffy Waffy, uh, they're, they're a longtime captain. Uh, I believe he's back uh, with them again. Um, and we will find out later if you can or cannot Faffy the Waffy. Um, it seems to be that they more often win, uh, which is pretty solid 
pretty solid record for an Alliance Tournament team. Uh, their last matches they have won against, Bright Side of Death, another one of those storied Russian teams. Uh, Verge collapsed back in Alliance Tournament 11, so we haven't seen Dark Side do well for a while, but the team has been rebuilt this year uh, after they lost a bunch of matches last year to Locals Primary, Volta, and the Tuskers. Uh, now let's take a look at Templus Calcif. So a much smaller team, only 28, and uh, of course you can in chat spam that carton to support the last Spartan. Uh, the captain uh, of the team, he's been uh, the captain pretty much from the start, he's been with them for a very long time. And as mentioned, they did really well in Alliance Open, winning it. Uh, they didn't actually lose a single match that whole tournament, and they didn't even bring their wild cards for that tournament. Uh, in Alliance Tournament 16, they, they surprised everybody, and in Alliance Tournament 17, People felt it was a little bit um, underwhelming. I think they expected them to do better. And if you come like top eight and people are like, oh, that's kind of not a good performance, then you know people are expecting good things from you. And I'm expecting good things with Temples Castle again this year. Jintan, what are your thoughts about this matchup? Yeah, I think this is a, this is one of those matchups you'd much prefer to see, you know, maybe this, the start of the second weekend rather than here. But it's going to set up some great storylines from later on. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, but e whichever team does go down here has an immaculate loser's run. You know, there's a fair few teams that are, are going to be trying to stop that. But both of these teams have a really, really long history of exceptionally good performance. Darkside especially, I always have found a fascinating team. They tend to come in with some really um, interesting theory crafting. Um, and uh, and alongside that have amazing execution. They're one of the Russian-speaking teams that have been with the game for an exceptional amount of time. They uh, competed under uh, many different names as well. They competed under Afterlife for a while, and they actually reformed basically just to compete in the tournament this year. Nice. Uh, Afterlife actually put me out of the tournament in Alliance Tournament 13 uh, with my team, the Bastards. They, they put us right out. Let's take a look at the bans for this upcoming match and see what these teams are choosing uh, not to face. So Darkside banning out the Deacon, the Gila, and the Loki, whereas Templar is choosing to ban out the Eos, the Barghest, and the Guardian. CSP Swift, what do you make about these bans here? Uh, I I think these teams are, are just starting to, uh, or rather, these caliber teams uh, can realize how annoying drones can be, specifically uh, if they predicate their comp on control with damps and stuff like that. So getting rid of the Gila and the uh, Eos, uh, really, really strong moves. Uh, the Deacon uh, generally makes the uh, the pairing of the Logi Frigates that much better, so Dark Side saying, eh. I don't want to give you an advantage for Logi Frigates. Uh, they know Templars can do uh, really, really well with that. They've got two incredibly great logistics pilots on their side, so forcing them into a shield comp as well. And Templars have a, the, a similar idea, saying, hey, we don't want a Guardian. Uh, we were just talking about it. And we also don't want this Barghest. This thing's too pesky. It offers too much, so get it out. Uh, it doesn't really give away too much. It just, give, it just reduces uh, a lot of the potential uh, archetypes that might uh, throw a cog or a spanner in their cogs. I, I, I don't know <laughs> how you guys talk like that. I'm, I'm trying to be more English because uh, we're over here in, in Nottingham, but whatever. <laughs> Spanners, cogs. Spanner in the works. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Hey, there you go. I thought I'd let you flounder for a while and see where you, see where I, you went. I appreciate up. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real good. <laughs> so the cool thing about the, the Deacon ban here is um, there's a rule this year in the Lions tournament, which is new for the Lions tournament, which is point inflation. So if you bring multiple copies of the same ship, then it, each of them costs more points. So if a ship is five points and you bring two of them, it's not 10, it is 12 points because each one increases by one point. So by banning the Deacon, you are forcing them to bring uh, maybe two Talias, for example, if they wanted to bring armor, uh, logistic frigates, uh, tech two at least, but then they add more points. So then you have to readjust the rest of your comp if you had it predicated for one Deacon, one Talia. So that one ban can take out a lot of ships, which uh, you pointed out there, CSP Swift. I don't actually know if these uh, teams have Barghest flagships, but that's a very popular flagship this year. I believe the most popular. Um, and we do see that Barghest ban, so we might see one on, uh, one on grid, but... I mean, I guess we could go to the arena and uh and find out um in a couple of minutes because the match is due in four minutes, three minutes. Oh my God, we're almost there. In a minute, it'll be two minutes. In a minute, it will be two minutes. That <laughs> is that is fantastic maths. Um, let's do predictions because we've not really done that very much. Um, and this is a really hard to predict match in my opinion. Seas be swift. Uh, so you mentioned Templus has an incredibly great record. Uh, when we were doing Alliance Hornet sixteen uh points. We were kind of looking at Templars and just nerfing all their comps. That's essentially what we did uh, because they were just so dominant there. 
Uh, so I think Templis will probably squeak this one out. Uh, but Darkseid, I mean, this could be a finals match, right? These teams are both incredibly, incredibly good. Uh, and Darkseid has incredible talent, not only with Faffy Waffy, uh, but they have Pandy and a lot of members from the uh, Vydra team, uh, which does incredibly well each year. So um, uh, anyone game, but I'm going to get slight edge to Templis. I'm a, I'm a card and spammer at heart. <laughs> and Jintan, if you could uh, if you could do it in 10 seconds or less, who would you go for? Uh, I would go for Darkseid in this match. I think they're going to bring something that uh, Templars don't expect and kind of get a little bit of an upset. Okay. Uh, well, I think I'm going to go for Templars. I think uh, Spartan has got this. I'm a cart and spammer as well. So let's go to the arena and find out between Templars, Calcif, and Darkseid. Hello everyone, this is Alexiv Card here with Moderator. We are commentating Darkseid versus Templus Calcif. Darkseid coming with a very tanky drone comp anchored around this Armageddon Navy issue. A real heck of a ship that Templus Calcif is going to have to find a way to deal with. Moderator, what tools do they have? Yeah, so we're seeing um, Double Nighthawk Drake Navy issue and Orthrus and Osprey Caracal Navy issue in another pair. Osprey Navy issue and Jacked On. We are seeing a lot of heavy assault missiles. Uh, Templus is going to want to close range very quickly, brawl, uh, pick off that Armageddon Navy issue as soon as possible, get rid of the Lynx in the form of the Myrmidon. And the Myrmidon might actually be their best bet here. It's of their heavy ships, the least tanky, and probably has a lot of impact with the Lynx boosting up the rest of their fleet. Pontifex is also an option, although given their missile choice, it might be tough to kill those smaller ships. Yeah, um, I mean, looking at the attack bar off of the very get-go here, we can see that Templis has a lot of uh, potential. One of the sort of downsides of um, armor drone boats is that you can't really use any sort of uh, rep bots to support your team, because if you do, that means you're not using those same you know, drone slots for damage, and that can be a bit of a problem. One of the saving graces, though, is that both teams are pretty far away from each other. I want to say about 50 to 60 kilometers at closest, both teams uh, coming in at opposite sides of the warp in here. And the links are popping. We're about to begin. It'll be interesting to see Templus Calcif's target choice here. And What did they decide to headshot first with that insane attack bar? Both of them are charging across the arena now, and we're starting to see some of the missiles begin to fly as they go for the Confessor of TikTok. Yeah, that um, you know kind of makes a bit of a sense. He's the initial ship in on the screen. We see that Safway is going to be the initial primary. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me that you'd want to get rid of those fairly weak, weak links. Uh, however, the Vengeance instantly dying before he can even pop an ADC. Uh, Safway continuing to take long-range sentry damage. We see uh, Kuritors and uh, other sentry drones from that ball of, uh, you know, Ishtars and Merbanons. But uh, sentries might not be the best choice going forward. We see that uh, now both teams have definitely closed the gap. We're in a full-on brawl, and Skykiller Russian will be the primary for Templus. Yeah, the sentries are an interesting choice at the start. I actually think they're working well here for them. They have managed to move the fight ahead of the sentry drones. The sentries are sitting there kind of in a sort of a second back line here, and they're ravaging the Templus Calcif team as their FC The Last Spartan drops. Now, they are going to trade this Armageddon Navy for it, and despite losing their Lodgy and one of their best pilots, that's a trade you've got to be happy with if you're Templus Calcif. That is a huge chunk of control and damage off the field. I mean, look at the attack bar right now between these two teams. It's not even close right now. I'm, I'm almost tempted to say that Templus Calcif almost won this at the draft stage, um, this is just a, a very good uh, comp for them to be coming up against in kind of a, uh, you know, that kind of Kaldari rush uh, Templus choosing to, you know, be role players, not just in game, but in the Alliance tournament as well. The Caracal Navy issue of Devon going down, but they'll trade out Pandy's a start for it. Which is a great trade. And very interestingly, if they had gone with the same setup, but more of a kite style setup, I think Darkseid would have favored would have gone much more favorably here. But against the, the high damage rush where they're coming in up close, they just weren't prepared for it, I think. I think they were yeah. expecting a kite team, and they ran into uh, a wall of hams that is just decimating them. It's truly really taken out their high end. You see Faffy Waffy's Myrmidon about to join his friends in the graveyard here as his armor is absolutely getting shredded. 
He's trying to rev back, but to no avail. Yeah, we can see that Darkseid has a pretty sustained, uh, ma large amount of um, active repping in their defense bar, but Templus Calcif, their attack is just, it's its massive. They just decided, yeah, um, we're going to put heavy assault missiles on everything. We're not going to kite. We're just going to brawl in your face. And they they had a very favorable matchup to do that. They just got on top of this Navy Geddon. They're getting on top of this Oneros now with Rick Oris. And once everything gets on top of him, he's going to go down pretty quickly here. Yeah, a big local defense bar for Darkseid. That's the, the purple bar there. I'd have to imagine that is on the Aeneros and the Stratioses. Uh, so we might see them take a little bit of time to actually get chewed through. But actually, as I say that, the Aeneros of Rico is absolutely getting shredded. I don't think there's any stopping this team or even slowing them down. They might not even lose this Orthrus. Uh, Stoish's Orthrus will go down in a second here. There's a cloud of drones on top of him. He's, you know, doing what he can to kite away, but it's going to be too little. Um, Sam Punisher will be the primary uh, being held down at close range by uh, Drake Navy issues and Nighthawks. And the Pontifex, the remaining link boat, is being held by actually nothing. The Skybreaker is now burning for him, trying to get some tackle, but uh, Pontifex is just being chased by a cloud of drones. Howitz's Stratios is doing the very best he can to try to kite away, but um, armored drone ships are not known for their speed compared to Kaldari um, heavy missile ships, and that Stratios is going to be tackled right now, actually. So not going to be able yep. to get away from anything. Uh, Pontifex is he's doing his best to try to string it out here, but he has a very, very low amount of structure and a very big cloud of drones. He will go down. Those drones will most likely relocate over to Howitz, and we'll start to see his armor drop very rapidly. Yeah, the Caracal Navy issue and the two Drake navies are now just closing on top of him, and uh, that Stratios is about to get his light switch turned off. Meanwhile, uh, Lily SG in the Vexer has done everything he can to try to burn away to one of the other beacons as the last remaining ship. Uh, he will have to be spooling that micro jump drive unit pretty soon. He's just will sitting he choose off the death beacon. or glory? That is the question. Um, well, either way, I think he's going to get killed. It's going to be whether or not he dies to the boundary or whether he dies to this rapidly approaching ball of heavy missile ships. Uh, I'm zoomed in on him. It looks like he is angling away from the arena. If he activates this micro jump beacon, he will launch himself toward the edge of glory. He's at zero velocity, though, so I don't think he's going to be breaking any records, but... Uh, he's got to start making that decision soon. He, they're gaining ground on him quite rapidly here. Now he's turning. Yeah, he may be choosing to go uh, you know, out on his shield. We've seen good fights in local. Both teams realize that the match has been um, over for some time now. And surprisingly, it's really only the Nighthawk of Killa 542 that's really approaching, uh, deciding that... Uh, now he's going to end it. We see a micro drone drive spool from Vexter trying to get to one of the other beacons um, laterally across from him. And he makes it. Lilo SG choosing life. Uh, he has a very long game to play, though. There's almost four, well, about three and a half minutes remaining in this match. That's a long time for this Vexter to try to stay alive. Yeah, I, I don't think he'll manage to do it for the next and a half minutes but i can't help but feel though you know some sort of mjd play or some sort of um range control had to be something that dark side had to choose as their strategy instead of just deciding to brawl against heavy assault missile boats you're never going to win that dps trade at zero against tam boats I think to one of your points earlier, though, they really didn't have much choice in the matter. Their mobility versus these uh, rapidly approaching Kaldari ships, quite limited. The Geddon, not a very mobile ship. Myrmidon, not that great. Ishtars, that has some speed, but if they plated it up and you know, maybe threw an afterburner on it, you're really not getting much out of it. This Vexer, its top speed seemed to have been about 1,600. That's just not going to cut it. Yeah, he probably had 1,600 plates, and he chose to burn for the Edge of Glory at 125 kilometers. That'll be it for us, sending it back to the desk.
Yeah, we actually lost a bet as CCP collectively, uh, so that's why that Alliance logo is in the game. Of course, you could change your alliance by leaving, but that would be kind of a jerk move. <laughs> that kind like, of, oh, you don't like it? Ah, just leave. This logo sucks. I'm going to go join. Welcome to Eve Pandora. 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 Templus Kalsev taking the win there in what looked like a loss at first. Um, I think a lot of people, us included, were like, oh no, it's all gone horribly wrong for Templus Kalsev here. That opening move from Darkseid seemed to be super strong. Uh, they stacked up with Guidance Disruptors. It's, they knew what Templus was going to bring. Um, and then it just started to slowly go the wrong way. Uh, Templus elected to stop dying and start killing. And then after that, it was kind of a uh, game over. Uh, for the dark side team. Seems to be swift. Like, where did that work? I mean, obviously, I know why they made the change. They wanted to win rather than lose, which is, to be honest, the, uh, is yeah. the, the strategy to go for. It is. But it what is. made the change? Uh, so, uh, Templates realized that the position they were in, uh, when there's a lot of control and a lot of newts on the field, you want to kind of get those newts off the field very early. So, you saw them, uh, even though they lost their Osprey pretty quick, they said, you know what, we have to all in, get this Navy getting off the field. It's going to screw us over if we let it sit there for too long. So they all in it, killed it, uh, and then, you know, killed off uh, some of the uh, tackle that was keeping them down. And after that, they were able to kite around uh, the match and, you know, just apply damage willy-nilly. It was uh, really, really well thought out by uh, Templis. Some nice recovery there. Uh, they might argue that they never had to recover, but, you know, th they still recovered uh, and they still did really well. I tell you who didn't recover, uh, the last Spartan. He died. Um, he was put in his carton, as uh, I believe you said during the uh, during the match itself. Uh, Jin Tan said that. Oh, Jin Tan said that. I don't want to steal a really good joke. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad. Um, Jin Tan, I'd like to talk to you about the Stratios choice there. So Darkseid banned out the Gila, which is a pretty strong drone boat. Then they themselves brought drones. Um, and the Stratios is usually not as good as a, as a Gila, some might say. Um, What's what's the logic here? Well, uh, the healer is uh, as one of those special case ships, which is significantly more points than the rest of the pirate uh, cruisers, just due to its raw power level. I think it's priced very comparatively to a hack. Um, and as such, you wouldn't have actually been able to fit a healer in that composition regardless. Um, the Stratios has a couple of uh, bonuses which are really effective in this sort of comp, especially one that's so control orientated. Obviously, they were trying to utilize those missile guidance disruptors and their newts to just slow down, disrupt the ability of their opponents to apply damage to them. And then when you're already doing that to some degree through your E-War, those resistance bonuses, when paired with the T2 logistics, can make those Stratoses live for a very long time. And they can effectively work as basically heavy tackle. You can throw your Stratos at something, it can scram web, dump newts onto something and make it easier to pick apart with the what you saw was actually a relatively low damage composition there from dark side their attack bar was almost half the size of templus yeah but the size isn't important it's what you do with that damage bar that makes the makes the winner not um now we have uh, a brief interlude so we can actually go to a quick video from ccp roar to tell us a little bit about some of the new features in the uprising expansion Coming in Uprising, we have a number of updates to Faction Warfare, including new complexes for people to take part in, new systems that impact the war zone, and new ways to play around those systems as well, by adding additional objectives beyond just your regular complexes. We're seeing a shakeup to the complexes that we're adding to Faction Warfare, uh, with new restrictions, a large new number of complexes, and a whole lot more variety for you to play with. The Faction Warfare system that you've become accustomed to is still there. It's forming the foundation of the Uprising expansion, but we're adding new layers on top of it to round out the gameplay. In addition to the complexes that you're used to in Faction Warfare, while there are more of them, there are also additional objectives that you'll see in space. 
such as supply depots there that are uh, owned by the owners of the system or supply caches by the attackers, uh, rendezvous points where you can assault enemy fleets, and more. All of these things will factor into what is called the advantage system. The advantage system simulates exactly which faction that is fighting over a system has an advantage. How well are they doing in the war effort? Is their propaganda up to par in terms of turning the citizens of that system over to their side? Or are their fleets well supplied? Or are they being attacked uh, mid-transport? All of these things are factored into the advantage score. The better your faction does, the higher their score, the more victory points you'll earn when completing complexes, which means the faster you can capture systems. With Uprising, we're creating a healthy foundation for the faction warfare ecosystem, which will continue to build on going into the future. In the future, there will be more objectives, as well as additional ways for people who are not actively in a militia today to join without having to leave their corporation or alliance. The Faction Warfare system has long been beloved by many players, and it's a very important part of the EVE Online ecosystem. And it's about time that we return to it, give it a new facelift, and begin to expand on the foundation that is already there. Yeah, Uprising. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to go on and look at the, like, the new hangars are incredible. I spent some time just zooming around from ship to ship. They're absolutely wonderful. Uh, I played a bit on Singularity during the war games for Factional Warfare uh, before it came out. It was It's just such a cool revamp concept. I'm, I'm super happy about it. CCP Swift, um, what's your favorite parts of Uprising? Um, so the... Oh man, I have to pick a favorite? <laughs> I don't want to pick a favorite. But the thing I like a lot, again, is uh, Factional Warfare. Um, when it first came out, it, I had a ton of fun with the feature. Uh, and now that it's been kind of rebuilt with a whole bunch of new systems, uh, it is incredibly fun. Uh, even if you're not in Factional Warfare, you can get a lot of great fights out of it. Uh, the propaganda structures that CCP Aurora was uh, showing... Uh, that works with the advantage system. They're an incredible way to get a fight. You just plop one down, and everyone in the system sees this like giant target that they have to fight. It's very reminiscent of like uh, the sovereignty blockade units, if you guys remember that in the old soft system. Um, those you have to wait three hours. This one is ten minutes, so it's way fast uh, and a lot less EHP, of course. Uh, but it's a fantastic way to get a fight. Uh, the frontline systems are amazing as well. You don't have to like wander around the map trying to find people. You know exactly where they'll be because that's where the best rewards are. Um, and, and it's it's so much fun. It's also really good to see worms stuck outside of complexes, <laughs> unable to get in. They're like, oh, I want to fight with my overpowered ship. And then just like a Republic Fleet Firetail would just go, sucker, and just keep <laughs> going. It's great. I love it. I um I had a go on on uh, singularity and some of the new structures. I didn't read because reading is difficult, and I took them and I dropped one down to see what would happen. And all these NPCs came in. I was like, oh, cool! And they just murdered me. Like just wasn't even close. I was like, okay, noted. Need to get better ships or read the patch notes. Uh, something I did not do. Now. We have another match coming up in just about five minutes. It's going to be Rusty Hyenas Clan versus Alexis Matari. Another one I'm super excited about. Today's been so good with matches. Alexis Matari, uh, our Mimitar role-playing alliance. Um, the only one that made it into the uh, actual alliance tournament this year. Um, we can look at their bands and see what they have chosen uh, not to face. So Rusty Hyenas, Rusty Hyenas Clan's banning out the Eos, the Pontifex, and the Magus. So they're saying, we really don't like Lynx, armor Lynx. Uh, just don't bring any of them, please. That would be fantastic. Alexis Matari, um, bit of a bit of an issue with newts here, uh, banning out the Armageddon Navy issue, the Armageddon and the Curse. Uh, Jin Tan, what are your thoughts on this set of bands here? Uh, I don't know. This is a very unorthodox set of bands from both teams. Uh, Rusty, Hy as you said, Rusty Hyenas there, just taking out as many skirm uh, viable skirmish link fielders as possible, uh, and Alexis Matari there, just deleting newts. It, it, I, I have to assume that Electus are going to fly something that's really, really dependent on capacitor and that doesn't have a way of dealing with an Armageddon. Um, maybe something like a kite comp. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how many hack kite comps we're really going to see because of the changes to hacks that were also recently implemented with the Uprising patch, which has drastically nerfed their lock range. Something that makes uh, flying around with, you know, two, three Cerber Cerberuses and just trying to pee on people from range pretty much impossible. Um, but an another interesting note here actually is the lack of a healer ban. So uh, Electus Matari could opt to be doing that, and that's something that also struggles against the curse, the Armageddon, something with those long-range newts. Yep. With this, uh, sorry, I'm going to jump in, if that's okay. You, you may. I, I grant you permission. Thank you, host. Um, 
to me, this screams from Alexis Matari, I want to take a Leshak, which might be our first Leshak of the day. Uh, but uh, yeah, that that like it hates a curse. It hates newts. Get rid of a curse. Get rid of a whole bunch of newts. Leshak. I'm not sure if the Leshak is going to be very good in the tournament, but um, that's that's just what it screams to me. Maybe that's what they're trying to bait. Like they're saying, "Yo, we want to bring a, a Leshak," and the other guys are going to be like, "Oh, they want to bring a Leshak," but they then they don't. See, I'm choosing to believe that they're leading into the Mimitar roleplay here, banning out Amar, and they're going to bring a full Mimitar rush and just lean into it. That's what that's what I choose to believe. But we can probably go to the arena uh, now and find out. Um, can we go to the arena and find out? That's a question for no, the. No, we ages. cannot. We cannot go to the arena and find <laughs> out. <laughs> so <laughs> let's uh, let's find out uh, what our guests think instead of going to the arena and finding out ourselves. Uh, CSP Swift. Who's who's going to take this victory? Electus Mentari did really really well um, in the trials. Uh, they looked very convincing. That's how they got in here. And you know, uh, teams that fly a lot under pressure, I think they do much better uh, in the Alliance tournament than teams that just buy their way in. Awesome. Now teams are on grid, and we can go to the arena and find out. So Gentan, in uh, in as many words as there is uh, in the team name, how who do you think is going to win here? Electus Mentari. Electus Mentari. I think I'm going to go for that as well. So let's go to the arena and find out. Hello, I am Moderator, joined by my colleague Alexei of Card for this match between Rusty Hyenas Clan and Electus Matari. Rusty Hyenas choosing to go with Nightmare, Double Vulture, Ferox, Scalpel, Kirin, Double Jackdaw, Flycatcher, and a Skybreaker. Meanwhile, Electus Matari betraying their Mimitar RP roots as they're bringing two Nighthawks in addition to their Typhoon Fleet issue as the top end. We've got a Loki for Control, the brand new revamped Munin. And some interesting lower end ships, including Tech One logistics frigates. This is a very aggressive comp. Yeah, of note, it would appear that those vultures have fit railguns. That's not particularly uncommon to see, you know, wanting to use the uh, optimal range bonus that those vultures get and try to mitigate using range. Um, interesting to see a nightmare brought here. Um, but, you know, it makes sense as that's their flagship. I believe they're one of the few teams that did choose to bring a Nightmare as their flag. Um, Nightmare will be, you know, ha have pretty good op options going against uh, Nighthawks as EM Therm and will be pretty hard to hold down, actually. But interesting to see how this new revamp Munin factors into the match. Yeah, the Nightmare is going to be very slippery. The Loki on the Electus Vitari team is going to be the MVP here if he can land some double webs on that flagship and slow it down. But the Nightmare scares well with, scales well with Isk. And here we'll go. The Bantam is dropping very rapidly. This Tech 1 logistic frigate, not long for this world. They'll trade a flycatcher for it. Up in the air if that's actually an Electus Vitari's favor here. Yeah, I'll say that one of the things that we've seen never scale well in any tournament has been this Tech 1 Logistics. Um, the Jackdaw is going to go down, Spipel getting some reps, but Spipel is about to pop any second now. We see drones going after him into low hull, somehow holding on, but now popping as Aaron uh, 007 is now one of the primaries. Yeah, they'll trade the Jackdaw for it. That was a good job by the... Uh by the simple pilot to just extend his lifespan a little bit. It got them a little bit of a damage edge on this Jackdaw. And now the Jackdaw is down while the burst of Kira is barely taking any shield damage yet. Uh, that'll keep their logistics frigate alive for a little bit longer. But now they've gone on to the, the linchpin of this Electus Notari setup versus the uh, Rusty Hyena setup, that Loki dropping into two third shield and ooh, one third shield. Yeah, I really like the Loki as a pick. Um, this team with the Vultures are definitely using their ability to kite and mitigate with railguns. They're going to kill the Loki here, but the Vulture of um, Reset has, or Nisat Riser has been pushed by uh, this Typhoon of Debbie Spar. It looks like the Nightmare actually is being held down. Yeah, it's being held down by this Fleet Typhoon right now on at zero so not where you want to be if you're a nightmare but typhoon fleet issues are not known for their shield tank at all no but they are known for their damage application particularly with the new uprising patch that nightmare is not where he wants to be and he doesn't have a lot of tools to get out of there the 
Electus Matari team is swarming on top of him. He's got multiple ships kind of corralling him around, and they're deciding to go all in on this Tackled Nightmare, which will wind up being a great call if they can kill it. It's currently a two-thirds shield and dropping fairly slowly. The Nightmare with Isk has a tremendous tank, even though it doesn't seem like it would have any bonuses for it. Uh, the slot layout, the fitting, it can fit a pretty substantial tank, and it's being tested right now as it dips to half shields, but it could take a Nighthawk with it. Yeah, the Kirin and the Scalp and the Scalpel are doing a really good job of keeping after him while the Nightmare continues to primary Arsa Elkin's Nighthawk. Once that Nighthawk drops in the next, I want to say, you know, 10 to 15 seconds, maybe sooner, uh, the Nightmare m will be possibly stabilizing, but it's going to be difficult with Alatine and Davis continuing to apply damage to his local tank. He's got barely any shields left. He is dipping now. Even if he holds where he's currently at, he'll start to bleed some armor, but it looks like they're still able to get through his rep cycle, so it might take considerably longer, but that nightmare is going to die. Its armor tank not nearly as substantial as its shield tank. That said, he he's overheating or he's doing something because his reps are seemingly getting him a lot more now. Could be someone's on reload. He is hanging in there. Meanwhile, Devis and the Typhoon fleet issue starting to drop a little low, getting into 25% shields. Yeah, I'm not so sure that this Nightmare is going to die. He's managed to get away from any sort of tackle. Yeah, he's still painted, but he's pulling range from these Nighthawks. Um, the Typhoon fleet issue is out of range, and if the Typhoon fleet issue goes down... Um, he should be able to easily solo tank against the Nighthawk and Immunin. Um, the Nighthawk, or Nightmare rather, had been pushed to the edge of the arena, had to make a hard turn, but now he's been able to slip webs, and I mean, that's just the power of that afterburn or bonus ship. Yep, that's the slipperiness. You cannot scram it to disable its micro warp drive because it doesn't have one. It just has an afterburner that makes it go pretty much as fast, if not faster. And he's and now, just taking down the Typhoon Fleet issue. That's a devastating loss for Electus Matari, as Rusty Hyenas has taken themselves out of a very scary position, stabilized this match, and now taken a considerable advantage. Yeah, I mean, this was the perfect setup to be able to bring your Nightmare into, right? Um, none of those ships really had grapplers that were able to hold it down. Uh, Typhoon Fleet issue doesn't have a lot of tank. He was just able to mitigate and do what he could to you know, survive with that, um, you know, faction tank that he's allowed to have from the local uh, boosters and just chew through a Nighthawk, then chew through while, you know, continuing to bleed through armor, and it paid off for them. Paid off big time. And the, the Lodgy from Rusty Hyena is still alive. The Scalpel and Kieran coming in clutch there, helping that Nightmare tank through its darkest hour. The Electus Matari Bifrost goes down, then to be followed by Altian's Nighthawk, dripping into about a third shield, dying slowly, but that is definitely going to accelerate now that the uh, that's basically the only viable target they've got on the field here. This Munin, the new Munin, it seems to be kiting around, not doing a ton. What do we think of the new Munin layout, moderator? Um... It kind of remains to be seen. One of the difficulties that a lot of these teams, you know, will be facing is that because Uprising, the new patch, just dropped in the last half week or so, teams haven't really had a lot of time to fully ask as much as they might like to with the new setup. Like, yeah, you can see the stats, but you haven't really been able to scrim with it until very, very recently. And it's going to be a bit of a shakeup. I mean, I know a lot of teams were expecting to be able to fly a Cerberus that would be able to punch out um, much further under the old setup. And now it's not really the same. And we'll be seeing how that affects teams and compositions as things continue. As uh, Smitty Ultra's Munin is being pushed by this cloud of Republic drones and now goes down. What a thrilling match. Congratulations, Rusty Hyenas Clan. Rusty Hyenas Clan, well flown. Throwing this one back to the desk.
guys, stop being casual. They're really bad. We should not lose anybody to this. Okay, warp off. Warp off. Take the fleet warp. Everybody warp off. This is really, really bad execution. I'm very disappointed. Enemies, your dams are completely damped out. Crush, I'm damped out. I'm damped out. Get on that chamber, boys. Get your reps. Yeah, everything damped. I've not been able to look at some of the things again. I'm jammed. Rusty Hyena's clan there with the W. Um, oh, hello? Rusty <laughs> Hyena's clan there with the W um, over at Electus Metari. Unfortunate for them. Uh, they didn't get that flagship kill. Uh, it looked for a while that that nightmare, which was a flagship nightmare, was going to go down, but he managed to hold on to his underpants and stayed alive. Um, pretty good for them, of course. That means they've still got their flagship going forward, which, unlike Try and some of the other teams that just fed theirs, uh, they still have the option to bring that flagship once again. The Nightmare, a pretty popular flagship, not the most popular, but it scales super well. Uh, I'm joined by the Basilisk. Um, he joins me on the desk with Mystical Might once again. Basilisk, uh, what's your thoughts on Nightmare flagships? I kind of like it, to be honest. Um, I think it benefits quite a lot from all the all the bonuses you can get from having the flagship restrictions. You can get really powerful guns, you can get powerful shield tanks, all the damage mods. So it's, I think a damage-focused flagship is a really strong option in the current meta with obviously the bans on Golem and Lashak and all this sort of stuff from being flagships. Um, I, I think I still overall prefer the Bargus just because of the versatility of it. You can field it in Armor Kingslayer, you can field it in Shield Rush, you can field it in Shield Kite. Um, but the Nightmare also has some of that same sort of versatility available to it. I think we saw a bunch of Armor Nightmare comps come out last year. We did, and we saw a few Armor Nightmares die last year as well. Uh, Mystical Might, speaking of Nightmare comps, um, we just saw Ratahina's field the Nightmare comp, and you had some thoughts on uh, the... Uh, origins of said comp. Well, I was informed by Bazza here that this <laughs> looked very much like a comp that Localist Primary were perhaps running last year. Um, <coughs> and just thinking back to Rusty Hyenas and the Feeders, because um, they played through the Feeders to get their place here in the Alliance tournament, they were also fielding a lot of comps that we've seen from other, you know, well, well to do, I guess, well performing teams um, like Hydra, um, thinking more about like the Tinker setup that they brought, which they won with. So it seems like they are premier comp thieves, <laughs> um, but they do fly them well, which is always good to see. It's always interesting because it does expand their options, you know, what they could potentially bring to a match. It's hard to pin them down because they're not sticking with one particular archetype. Yeah, being able to just pick up a comp that maybe you haven't created, um, that you've just seen, and be like, actually, that's really good, and then fly it to great effect is actually quite difficult. Uh, I know I've I've been in that situation many years ago in Alliance Tournament, I think, 13. Uh, myself and Nash Cadaver were the, uh, the co-captains of the Bastards team, and we had our comps, and we were very, very happy with them. And then the day before, day one of the Alliance Tournament, we practiced against Shadow Cartel, and they just dumpstered us with this bomber tinker, which we hadn't even thought of. Uh, so we immediately stole it and uh, flew it the next day, and then won with it. So we were very happy with that. Uh, comp thievery, good job. Yeah. Um, if it wins. If it wins, who cares? <laughs> exactly. So steal all the comps, steal this comp. Um, so let's look at our next matches because I think this, some of these are going to be incredibly excited, uh, exciting, especially for me, because uh, We Farm Volta is going up against Rote Capel. Um, Yes, this is uh, this is where I start to get nervous because we had a mystical might earlier on, just staring down at the laptop. It's probably going to be me this time. So we form Volta banning out the Balgorn, the uh, Abaddon, and the Scorpion, whereas Rote Capel banning out the Scimitar, the Blackbird, and the Loki. Both of these teams very very experienced. They've played in uh, you know thirty five and thirty seven matches respectively, both winning almost twenty and uh, with significantly large uh, rosters. Uh, Volta thirty five. Man, uh, people have ever flown for the Volta team, and 90 for Rote Capel, so a bit more turnover there. Um, Mr. Kamai, what do you make of these bands here from, from both teams? I mean, it's interesting to see that both teams look to be trying to get rid of some of the stronger ECM setups that perhaps could be brought. Uh, I think the Blackbird is a staple for Volta. I think Volta's brought the Blackbird actually quite a few times in some of the previous tournaments. Um, with mixed effect, I think, uh, it, it's managed to secure them second place last year. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a bad move. 
The Scorpion, I'm not sure that I've really seen Rokapel bring that out too much. Perhaps they have, and I just can't remember a time that they, they've done so. Um, but yeah, it seems like both teams want to be able to lock the targets they want to shoot, which is obviously a good key thing that you need to do if you want to win. Yep. Um, but it also looks like Rokapel wants to perhaps hinder the ability to bring some of the shield kite setups that you might expect as well, especially banning the low key, which we see often paired with Nighthawks um, to great effect when it comes to rush. So. Yep. And Baz, the Scorpion, there's a bad and done coming from, from Volta. It's not a, not a super common ban. Uh, why might you ban that ship? Uh, I think we saw it used quite a lot last year in those sort of 48-gun salute comps with the three abalance, three oracles. So I don't think we're going to see that same sort of comp come out as much this year with the point duplicate rules. But it's still a very, very strong just gunship. You know, it's tanky. It does lots of damage. And if you want to apply DPS at range, the abalance is a pretty good choice for an armor comp. Just to touch on the ECM bans that you guys mentioned, I'm actually a little bit surprised to see both these teams banning ECM, because I think with scripted E-War in play, ECM becomes a lot weaker, because if you run ECM into damps, and you try and jam something, the damps just go onto the ECM guy, and the ECM is then effectively sort of neutered, and the the, jam the ECM can go back onto the damps, but then the damps just shut him down anyway. So the, the ECM against damps is basically always a losing war, I think. So it's a sort of... Although we haven't actually seen that much sort of damp supremacy so far, so... Yeah, I mean, that's been somewhat surprising, I guess, because when the rules came out for uh, Alliance Tournament 18, everyone was like, oh, no, damps, oh, it's going to be damps all over again, oh, cry, cry, cry. Uh, and then we didn't see that much scripted damping. Uh, mm -hmm. It's definitely being used. Uh, I mean, you'd be silly not to use it. Um, and we see things like the Armor Jackdaw, which can, of course, just fill its meds with with uh, with damps. Um, but it's not being as like oppressive as previous uh, tournaments when we've seen it. I was just going to say, I mean, the the rule and the, the I guess, the lifting of the uh, the ban on scripted D-War doesn't only impact dams, but it also impacts guidance disruptors and tracking disruptors, which we're seeing a lot more of now because you can be sure of their effect regardless of the range. So with dams, it's a little bit easier to counter, where if you have a sensor booster because you're expecting to go up against an ECM comp because that's what you need if you're trying to counter EC ECM, you use um, ECCM. The extra C yeah. is really important. The extra C is really important. Um, but that can be switched to give you extra targeting range or locking speed, which helps you to kind of deal with some of the effects that damps may be bringing, whereas it's less likely that you'll have remote tracking computers on some of your friendly ships, right? So I, I guess it's a little bit harder to counter the guidance disruptors and the tracking disruptors, which is why people are leaning into it a bit more. Awesome. Let's see if we can take a look at some of the, the team histories uh, here. So let's see if we can pull up the, the Volta team. Uh, and have a look uh, at some of their last matches. So, Volta team size, about 35. And Annie Gardet, second time we've seen him today in one of these graphs. Uh, we saw him for the try team. Uh, he's played 51 matches with uh, Theron's Varalax, 46, and uh, Alliance Executor Starfleet Commander uh, at 44. They've been relatively successful, winning more matches than they've lost, which is always good. Uh, and last year, they won uh, twice against Hydra Reloaded, Darkseid, Castabouts, and Immediate Destruction uh, the years before. The Hydra Reloaded matches, of course, were uh, in the, uh, I think, the third and fourth place, and then the final, uh, they played twice, mm -hmm. um, uh, securing Volta second place. As you can see there, lost matches against. That would be the other ones, which we don't talk about. <laughs> uh, but that got um, uh, Volta a second place. And crucially down there, we also lost one uh, against Rote Capel, who they're going up against next. Spooky. Spooky, spooky stuff. Very spooky. Uh, let's switch over to Rote Capel and have a look at uh, their history here. So 90 pilots, uh, they certainly like people all the way through. And uh, look at that, last wa matches one against We Form Volta. So can they can they make it a twofer? Can they beat Volta once again uh, and take themselves into a st good start from day one here in the Lions Tournament 18? Uh, the last matches they've lost against, they're pretty reasonable teams here. Like Vider Relolded in the Lions Tournament 17, you know, not no slouch team. Uh, Psychotic Tendencies uh, did really well last year, somewhat unexpectedly. Um, and then Forsaken Empire, uh, another fairly strong team. Although Turbo Feeder Glory, they tended to turbo feed, so yeah. um, uh, <laughs> losing a match against Turbo Feeder Glory kind of shows the, the dichotomy of Rote Capel here. Um, I, again, very, very historic team, uh, been around for many, many years. And I think a lot of people have referred to them in the past as, you know, the uh, aggressively mid-tier gatekeeper of the of the upper echelons of Alliance Tournament. If you are a good team and you can get through Rote Capel, then uh, usually you'll probably do relatively well because they are not an easy team to beat. Um, Mystical Might, do you have any, any thoughts on this upcoming matchup? 
I mean, I think it'll be interesting either way. I'm hoping that it is going to be an exciting match um, in the best way possible, where it perhaps comes down to two ships remaining, one on either side, you know, real 50-50 just to, to spice up life a little bit. Get the heart racing. I mean, for me, I would not like that. However, I am here for you, dear viewers, oh, I and I, I want <laughs> a, a competitive yeah, match. Of course, uh, you do. all of all about you guys. Uh, you know, I'm going to put my ego to the side. Unlike Mystical Might, who uh, was calling for uh, Truth on a Light to take the full victories, I want something nice and close. I see. Um, but we can go to the arena and find out right now. Excellent. Uh, so let's go to We Form Volta versus Rock Capel. Hello and welcome back. We're here with Weform Volta versus Rogue Capel. Weform Volta coming in with a strong missile comp. We've got two Nighthawks, Drake Navy, Osprey, two Osprey Navy issues, two Caracal Navy issues. That is an insane amount of missile damage with some of those ships receiving buffs in the latest patch. Moderator, what do we have on the Rogue Capel side? Rogue Capel has chosen to go Dominic's Navy issue, get a Navy issue, Hyperion, Megas Pontifex, Double Thalia for tank, uh, a pan, a pair of hyenas for uh, webbing and a crucifier, and they are certainly going to need those hyenas, as that is a team of entirely heavy assault missiles that is going to want to close range, get on top of those battleships, and just absolutely melt them. Um, so it'll be critical to see Verdict and Vorian do the very best they can try they can to try to screen and mitigate uh, oncoming damage. Very interested to see how the Dominic's Navy issue performs here. One of the few times we see it in the tournament received a pretty sizable buff to its local tank in the next patch. It's basically a better Hyperion. Yeah, the Dominic's Navy issue had kind of languished as a ship that just was frankly almost worse than its uh, Tech 1 counterpart, the Dominic's. And now with the kind of the changes that we've seen with Uprising, it's been given just like the Armageddon Navy issue, kind of a new um, lease on life, getting, you know, put more in tune with its um, other counterparts and being brought back into kind of the meta and relevance. So uh, it would be interesting to see how Letty Labia, the team captain um, of the roadside, you know, chooses to fly that. Also, recently revamped in the patch, the Caracal Navy issue received a little bit of an extra damage buff, and we do see them sporting hams in this match. They are going to be throwing out a sizable portion of DPS with great application to smaller targets, which I think is not going to be good news for those Thalias. Yeah, um, it, it'll be difficult. Thalias still do pretty well against heavy assault missiles unless they're being webbed down. Um, Thalias tend to be 10 MN fit, so... Um, they have pretty small signatures, but we see already uh, the Flycatcher, the Osprey Navy issues, trying to close range the Drake Navy issue of Control Freak leading in front, and they're primarying the Hyenas to the surprise of literally no one. Um, already the Hyperions trying to you know close ranks, um, deal with some of these incoming drones, and right now we're not really seeing Reform Volta really try to push or get on top of anything. They're just trying to uh, position themselves and go for targets of opportunity. The Hyenas, to their credit, are doing a good job of webbing down these Nighthawks, trying to split up, um, you know, Volta and preventing them from really blobbing together and getting on top of them at zero. Some interesting piloting from the Volta team. The cruisers, the, the Caracals and the Osprey Navies, they're flying in for a little bit, and then they're turning and kind of cycling around to the back line. I think they're trying to throw off the webbing and tackle game of Roque Capel, trying to uh, sort of obfuscate how close they really are, which targets they need to be webbing, potentially yeah, throw but... in some confusion on the FCing side. Meanwhile, they're putting a lot of fire into Alice Hecate's Hyperion. It is tanking because that is what Hyperions do, but it is losing that game. The real question will be, can they trade it for either Supreme Leader or Control Freak? Yeah, so the phase of kind of, you know, the, dan the dance mm -hmm. of trying to get into position is very well and truly over. Uh, Alice Hakate is definitely the primary. Control Freak is also being primaried. Uh, the Hyena of Vorian is down. Uh, Volta is now getting on top of the entire team at zero. And meanwhile, a uh, Rylode at 
Planet Six in that Osprey is completely home free. Um, interesting to see Black uh, Panther um, going down here. Uh, Alice Akate will be losing links, but I don't think he's going to survive long enough for that to be an issue. However, they do drop a Navy Drake for that. Well, when that Navy Drake dropping was significant, you immediately saw much more effective reps from the Hyperion. It's also worth noting that Theranath, uh, which is one of the Nighthawks, is now broken free of what was tackling it. It is now zooming in to replace that damage, and we saw the Hyperion drop almost immediately. Yeah, Cyclohexanol is going to be the next primary. The Pontifex, he is getting, just got absolutely slaughtered by a cloud of drones and heavy assault missiles. Um, that'll be all the links out for Roque Capel, and now they're going to lose Verdict in the Hyena. Uh, the Crucifier is probably going to be uh, chased by drones because he's continuing to provide guidance disruption onto those Nighthawks. Uh, Lady Labia will be the next primary, and... Um, I can't help but feel like Volta at this point is starting to run away with it. We can already see that Lady Labia is getting absolutely smashed, doing the best he can to try to rep, but that is a lot of incoming damage. Yeah, the, the only interesting factor, the possible wrinkle here in Waveform Volta is they do not have any logistics on their team, which means... It's only a matter of time before their team gets ground down, and the more ships they lose, the more chance that Lady Labia's Dominic's Navy issue is going to be able to tank it. It has a tremendous local rep bonus, and I guarantee you it's running double reppers. It could conceivably tank their team if they remove enough DPS from the field. That said, they're not doing a good job at removing that DPS very quickly as they just lost one of their logistics frigates and are about to lose the other one that they're going to trade it for a Caracal Navy issue. The the damage output just not quite there for the Rocapel team, although they have potentially what they need to do well here. They need to start applying this damage. They need to get themselves back in the game. Yeah, so Lady Labia, Apathetic Brent, the captain, um, and Rory Hashino are the two remaining members of this team we can see that they have a pretty sizable defense bar but i mean look at the defense bar that volta has it's basically max the screen out that's going to be these nighthawks of theranth and annie gardette and they're trading an osprey navy issue for all of lady labia's uh, armor and that's going to be brent going down leaving Burry as the only remaining ship and at this point i don't see a reasonable path for wrote back into the match, even with this Navy Osprey going down. It certainly is a very high road, a very steep hill for them to climb. They're holding on ever so slightly, Lady Levy, just barely hanging on in structure, just got another rep cycle in, another rep cycle. Oh, and it goes down. Oh, to the wire. You could see it pulling back huge chunks of armor with those bonus reps, but it's just not enough. Ruri's Armageddon Navy is not going to have the closing power they need to have any remaining chance in this match. I think the Nighthawks, the Osprey, the Flycatcher Skybreaker, they will overcome here. Correcting my earlier call, I thought that was an Osprey Navy issue. That is a traditional, regular logistic ship Osprey flown by Planet 6, which has sealed the deal here. He's managed to keep himself alive throughout the entire match, flying under the radar, did not even get tackled or pressure really in any way, and that is going to cost Roque Capel dearly here. Yeah, both teams saying good fights in local. The co-captain Cyclohexanol saying white flag reset. Uh, I definitely feel that if you're Roque Capel, um, you know. Um, one upside of this is that Rote didn't lose their flagship. I guess that's something of a silver lining. Um, they're going to have a tough road in the lower bracket, but this is probably um, what we had predicted in kind of the pre-show um, that Volta would win this and wrote just kind of a very unfortunate setup to be bringing against this Nighthawk Drake uh, Osprey Rush. It seems to be a pretty popular um, composition and we'll send it back to the desk to talk more about why that match went the way it did. Guys, stop being casual. They're really bad. We should not lose anybody to this. 
Warp off. Warp off. Take the fleet warp. Everybody warp off. This is really, really bad execution. I'm very disappointed. Crash our enemies. Your dams are completely damped out. Crash. I'm dumped out, I'm dumped out. Get on that campus, boys. Eat your reps. Yeah. Everything damped. I've not been able to lock a single thing in the game. I'm jammed. Good job, guys. Volta taking the W there over at Rook Repel um, in a, a, a good match, to be honest. Um, it looked like Volta at the start moving around, uh, cool cam collected. I'm sure they were all cam collected on, on comms, as everyone always is during Alliance Tournament matches. It's, uh, hey guys, um, if we can all just uh, shoot this guy here, nice and calm, no shouting, everyone is relaxed. Um, and then they just started to slowly get into position, apply that damage, and uh, the, the Rook Repel team Interesting set of comps there with the two Navy battleships. Mystical Mike, what do you think about the, those Navy battleships here? I mean, the Navy Geddon, I think we've mentioned a few times as being one of the strong ships with the recent changes because it gets that bonus to newts now. So it pumps out a lot of damage. It does a lot of damage to capacitor as well. Um, so it makes sense as a, a ship that teams are going to want to bring. And there was mention that you know if these changes came out before the roster lock for flagships, maybe some people would have submitted Armageddon Navy issues as their flagship because they were just that good. But one thing that we haven't really mentioned, and my mind immediately went, oh, a Navy Dominix, that's trash. But I do forget that they've recently added the large armor rep bonus to it, or just the armor rep bonus, um, typically used with large armor reps on a battleship, which means that it can actually tank a substantial amount by itself, as we saw it kind of survive for a while against the double Nighthawk uh, Navy Osprey. Um, long enough to trade a couple ships for it, which is always good but not enough for them to win the match. I don't know how I feel about the comp overall. I would like to see something else from the Rook team. But, I mean, if this is where their, their testing has taken them, then uh, hopefully they learn quickly. Yeah, the Hyperion Baza was also an interesting choice. Um, we don't normally see it in uh, Alliance tournaments. Like It's a great ship on, on TQ. Um, it's got that armor rep bonus. Um, it can just, you know, solo roam around and just like, you know, uh, punch nerds in the face, it's fantastic. But in a tournament format, what, what's your thoughts? As you say, on Tranquility, you know, if, if you get tackled down with something, you can fit an MJD and just jump off and, you know, anything else that gets in range to scram you, you can scram them and kill them. But on in Alliance setting, I'm in Alliance tournament setting, I'm not really a huge fan, to be honest. I feel like it's kind of, well, I mean, it's a blaster boat, so it's kind of like a Vindy, but just without a web. And it's I feel like it's way too limited in what it does. Um, that sort of ship, like... If you have a flag Vindy, I feel like they're best used in a comp that's sort of set up to facilitate the Vindy, where everyone is on the same page about saying, you know, we're going to serve up targets on a platter to this Vindy. He's going to get on top of what he wants to shoot and shoot it. And a Hyperion just, I feel like, doesn't have that sort of, as non-flagships go, it doesn't really have that sort of same hitting power of, of a Vindy can do. It doesn't have those webs, obviously. And it's obviously it's capacitor reliant. It's got an active tank bonus, which makes it extra capacitor reliant. So overall, I'm just not really convinced on it in general awesome now out there in twitch land you've all been betting your twitch channel points on these matches uh, and i'm here to remind you to keep hold of as many of them as you can build them up uh, for during the break there's going to be a whole bunch of cool stuff you can do with the channel points so there will be a at quiz in uh, in twitch which you interact with by simply clicking on the actual stream itself it's uh, you don't have to type the answers in twitch chat um and you have to link your character in um in Twitch, so that you can actually win. But uh, the top three will receive 500 plex each uh, for that one. And also, there will be some special rewards that you can redeem with those channel points. So it's going to be two EVE store vouchers worth uh, 50 euros slash $50 um, for the regional EVE store, which you can get for 50,000 channel points. And then there's going to be a finely crafted EVE Online analog watch from Icelandic watchmakers Arctic for 100,000 channel points. So I hope you've been betting uh, and winning to get uh, those pretty cool prizes. But before we get to those next matches, uh, let's check in with CCP Karker and hear about some of the quality of life things that she's been working on.
The Little Things is an initiative where we collect uh, ideas from players on how to improve their everyday e life. Um, we do this on the forums, uh, we go through Twitter, uh, Reddit and also in-game. Some of the little things coming in Uprising are We hope those little things will have a big impact on your life in New Eden. There we are, CCP Karka there with a whole bunch of uh, quality of life improvements for EVE Online in the Uprising expansion. Some of them are incredible, like being able to repair all of your modules at one in, in one click. That's awesome. It's fantastic. Like, uh, 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 so many good little changes on like trashing all your ships. Um, I I incredible, like not trashing, repackaging. That's yeah, the same thing. Same thing. Okay, yeah, it's the same thing. Trashing the rigs. You're surrendering because you're like, well, I'm not going to live here anymore. So you're clearly surrendering. That's what you're doing. I see. You <laughs> falter, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to stand for this. <laughs> um, all right, let's look at our next matchup. It's going to be between Pandemic Horde and Arcos Core. So let's see what the bans are for this uh, upcoming conflict between these two great teams. Pandemic Horde banning the Slipnir, the Curse, and the Armageddon Navy issue. Again, super popular ban, uh, thanks to the, the buffs that CCP Swift talked about earlier on. Uh, Arcos Core banning out the Tempest Fleet issue, the Balgorn, and the Oneros. So, Basilisk, what are you seeing here? Well, there's a lot of armor bans and a lot of armor battleship bans. The Balgorn, the Tempest Fleet, the Armageddon Navy. Um, of course, the new pressure as well from the Curse and the Armageddon Navy combined. So, I think this this set of bands with so many heavy armor ships gotten rid of, I feel like leans much more towards a, a shield focused match for both sides coming up here. Um, it would have to be something a little bit wonky, perhaps, for an armor comp to work, like maybe we saw last time from Rope Capel. But I would probably advise against that strategy. Um, of course, we've seen all throughout the day so far lots of tried and tested, um, you know, Nighthawk. Caracal Navy, Osprey Navy kind of shield light missile comps. So I wouldn't be surprised to see one or indeed two of those turn up and just have a bunch of missiles spew at each other and see what happens. Awesome. And Mystical Might, anything to, to add to that one here? No, I mean, it's a uh, pretty standard, I think, ban list from Arcos here. The Aneros is kind of a, an odd one because the Guardian's always an option. You have the Zarm, you have the Logistics Frigates. Um, so I don't know if they've done some testing. Um, with their practice partners and found that they have a difficult time with the Aeneas, perhaps because they are bringing some Kadari kiting cruisers that may be damage locked in some form uh, to Kinetic, which is a bad damage type to use against an Aeneas mm -hmm. due to its native resists. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Tempest Fleet issue and the Balgorn ban, I think, is pretty standard based on some of the stuff we saw in feeders. A lot of people favoring the three battleship core, um, oftentimes using the Tempest Fleet issue, one, I think, because they wanted to get some rust points, but two, because it's actually a strong ship. Um, it does a decent amount of damage, and it has those utility highs to put to use to really help neutralize, I guess, the threat um, that they may be going up against. And in this matchup, who do you think is going to have the advantage here, uh, Basilisk? So uh, Pandemic Horde, not really that successful in the Lions Tournament. I think they've played two matches and lost both of them. Um, Arcos Core have no history in the Lions Tournament, but they seem to be quite a, a cohesive unit flying together on uh, Tranquility, sort of US time zone small gang uh, roaming, I believe. Um, so who would you give this one to? So I actually had a sneak peek at some of the interviews that Jin has done. I actually listened to Arcos Core interview, um, and they described themselves as a sort of small gang um, 
quite competent lo um, sorry, roaming group that were sort of battling against the block, fighting the good fight. Um, and it sounded like they were doing a good job of it. So I against Pandemic Horde, it's, Horde, it's sort of their prime target, really, isn't it? They're sort of outwailing in the United <laughs> Solomon. Good for them. <laughs> Mr. Govite, your thoughts as well? I mean, I mentioned it in the uh, tier list stream that we did. I think Pandemic Horde is now the scary version of the PanFam group. Uh, historically, it's been Pandemic Legion. You know, if you hear pa PL, you expect a lot of experience and skill um, and skill points behind that group. I think now it's more Pandemic Horde. I think PL basically died and then maybe came back a little bit um, off the coattails of NC, Horde, and the AT. Um, but I think, you know, they have a lot of pilots to choose from. There's a lot of potential there. It just depends on whether those pilots that are active in their standing fleets and actually engaging day-to-day -day in their small gang as well actually decide to take part in the Alliance tournament. I think that's going to be the make or break, but I'd, I'd favor Pandemic Quarter. Awesome. So I'm just looking back at some of the matches we've seen today. This is going to be our last match before the break. Um, and it's been fairly even in terms of uh, red and blue. The first four matches uh, all went to the red team. And then it was uh, four in a row for the blue team. And now we've had two in a row from the red team. So it seems to just be swinging back and forward. Um, but we're actually, we're, I'm just told we're ready to go to this one and see who's going to win between Pandemic Horde and Arcos Core uh, in this match. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this next match of the Alliance Tournament between Arcos Core and Pandemic Horde. Pandemic Horde bringing um, that very heavy pointed battleship core going with a Paladin, Vindicator, and Abaddon supported by double link ships, um, some Frig, Lodgy, Ahina, Vengeance, and Crucifier on the low end. Meanwhile, Arcos Core with a rather unconventional setup. Uh, Golem, Claymore, Hurricane, Cyclone, double fleet size, Stabber fleet issues, a Skybreaker, and a fleet vigil. Uh, these Tranquility rivals are squaring off for what's sure to be a very interesting matchup, but I'm not quite clear what Arcos Core game plan here is. It's kind of like a combination Mimitar Rush Torpedo setup with the Golem. Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense in its own way because those Claymores are fit for um, heavy assault missiles, a Golem choosing to go for what appears to be torpedoes as well. They're going to want to close range. And I mean, if you're going up against a Vindicator and a Baden, you're going to have a good chance to be able to do that. Uh, the Paladin might be able to pull range and mitigate, but a Vindicator is definitely going to have to be in the torpedo heavy assault missile range same with the abaddon unless it's going to run away and you scorch and already we see that the pandemic uh scythe and stabber fleet issues are getting across the field trying to pin down their targets and we see counter screens on top of them the vengeance from pandemic court has already infiltrated the back line here not quite clear what he's going for or maybe he that wasn't intentional i think he's trying to pin down the golem and keep it in place yeah, he has. And meanwhile, one of the Stabber fleet issues of Taz uh, gets deep into the back line, but kind of feeds himself um, before the rest of the uh, Arcos core team and core can really catch up and support. But I mean, critically, if this golem continues to be held in the back by this hero vengeance of Din Dindil, um, that's going to be a lot of the damage from Arcos core not being able to really apply to anything because that golem is still going to be outside of Torp range. Meanwhile, Pradix in his side fleet issue drops. Yep, and ships dropping quickly is going to be a theme for this Arcos core team, as all the ships they've picked, with the possible exceptions of the Cyclone, Claymore, and Golem, are very thin tanks. They lose another Scythe fleet issue. Trading for effectively nothing here. They've applied some shield damage to a few ships, but they're really having trouble pressing the advantage here if they had one at all. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to be able to push past those Thalia reps, and... Part of the problem is that your main linchpin ship the, in the Golem is still being held in the back line by a Vengeance, and the Golem just doesn't apply damage to that. They've lost a Hurricane in the meantime. Uh, honest to God, the way we're headed, I would not be entirely surprised if we saw a near 100 to nil sweep from Pandemic Horde. They're just running away with it at this point. Yeah, Arco score lacking the damage here to really meaningfully push the advantage the golem is not even opening oh wait no he's just started opening fire he's trying to shoot the frigate that's tackling him with those missiles that is going to be a very very tough call uh 
not really applying much damage of anything to the vengeance here. He is cackling comfortably. He is also under reps on top of that. There's really not much threat here. The vengeance is shooting the drones, possibly the only thing that could really hurt him. Meanwhile, we're about to see the vigil fleet issue drop quite quickly on the Arcos core team. He's run out of shield. Yeah, and I mean, that's kind of the, the story of this match. Can we get some duck spam in chat? Honestly, we need more Horde uh, Hawks the way that this match is going. Uh, very decisively in their favor. Uh, the Skybreaker uh, trying to do what he can to, you know, get some tackle. But, I mean, really, Zebra Lily in this golem since the very get-go has been, you know, okay, now he's been able to pull some range and maybe... Uh, getting on top of that Vindicator now, but I mean, he's already down into half shields and Atticus Copernicus at this point and Chosen are going to be under no real threat. Those um, Thalias, the Deacon, are going to be able to keep him up, especially under Lynx. Um, yeah, it, very underwhelming from Arcus Core. I thought that um, what they would try to do is ball together and, you know, get on top of the main core of uh, Pandemic Horde, but they strung themselves off, got picked off one by one, and you know, that's going to essentially result in a 100 to nil feed. You absolutely can't do that in your position. Yeah, a challenging game plan for them to execute, even under the best of circumstances. And I think Pandemic Horde knew exactly what they needed to do to counter it. They pulled the bulk of their fleet back, which drew Arcos Core in. And then they sent their toughest tackler, that Vengeance of Dindil, sent him right back around to pin the Golem exactly where it was at, then applied tackle to the ships that had rushed in. They were cut off from their main DPS source and just shredded one by one. Yeah, and I mean, that's a perfect example of a four-point ship in the Vengeance completely and utterly just shutting down a 24-point golem. And I mean, that's what you, you know, you have to see it from your tackle pilots if you want to be able to win matches. That's going to be how you do that. You see your opponents be out of position, you seize upon that, you take the initiative, and then you control the match from there on out. I mean, well-played um, to Pandemic Court. I have to give them credit for this one. And they're just closing the match out now. They've got Jika Josh's Claymore heavily tackled down. He is painted, nuded, disrupted, scrammed, grappled, and was briefly webbed. Uh, likely will be again. There it goes. <laughs> uh, he is absolutely shut down. And to your point earlier, the Deacon Thalia reps going to hold their team strong. Really no kill pressure left on the Arco score team as they are about to drop. Jika Josh is doing his best to tank. The Claymore does have a very strong tank bonus, uh, but unfortunately it's not going to be enough here. It might even punch through his reps before his ancillary runs out of charges as now they're into his armor and it's being melted like butter. Yeah. I mean, um, We'll play to Pandemic Horde, um, Arcos Core. Um, I'm not entirely sold on their team composition. I feel like they could have brought something um, a little bit better, maybe a little bit more thought out than what we've seen here. Um, one of the problems with these torpedo comps is that uh, they're very all or nothing, and in this case, it was definitely a nothing. Uh, more on that from the desk as we send it back to them. Stop being casual. They're really bad. We should not lose anybody to this. Okay, warp off. Warp off. Take the fleet warp. Everybody warp off. This is really, really bad execution. I'm very disappointed. Crash our enemies. Your dams are completely damped out. Crash! I'm damped out, I'm damped out. Get on that campus, boys! Get your reps. Yeah! Everything damped. I've not been able to lock a single thing in the game. I'm jammed.
Arcos core cored like an apple there by Pandemic Horde as they take that 100 to 0 victory um, and send us it straight, pretty much straight into a break. We're going to take a break now and uh, we'll be back for our next match, uh, Abandoned Apart versus Platinum Sensitivity at 18.40 Eve time, so in about half an hour. Uh, so we'll see you then. Don't go away. Make sure you do the Eve quiz and uh, try and win some cool prizes. But don't claim the watch. I want the watch. <laughs> Welcome back to Alliance Tournament 18. I'm Ithaca Hawk, joined once again on the desk by Mystical Might and Jin Tan uh, here for the rest of the day with you and a whole bunch of cool new matches coming up. Uh, the next one I'm looking forward to already is going to be a band apart versus Platinum Sensitivity. Uh, I know you're a, a big Plat Sense fan, Mystical Might. I am, I am, yes. I uh, support my, Mar my boy Mark Bridges fully. Yes, and I believe they're going to win very easily and he's not going to let me down right now. Uh, excellent. That's, that's confidence right there. More True. confidence than you showed in your own team. True. Yes. Because oh, I have faith. <laughs> you have yes. faith. All the Mark Bridges. And uh, and Jin Tan, welcome back. Uh, what what do you think about this matchup coming up? Uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting matchup. It's uh, versus two kind of fan favorite teams. Obviously, Platinum Sensitivity, the uh, Jap Japanese uh, representation in the tournament, going up against Abandoned Apart, who are uh, captained by Rix Javix. Uh, very, you know, very famous artist actually did some commissions that are up on my wall in my house. Uh, fantastic guy to work with, and if you are interested in buying his products, he has a officially a CCP licensed store, which you have probably seen a couple of adverts for. Yes, uh, running through Twitch. We've got some cool stuff on it, especially like the uh, New Eden Fantasy map, which uh, all profits go to charity. Let's take a quick look at uh, some of these team charts. Let's pull up a band apart and see uh, a bit of information about them. So a band apart here, 44 pilots have flown for a band apart uh, in their history. Rick's flown 16 times. Uh, Jose Sampano, the old captain, uh, went over to NC Dot, uh, flew 21 times. Uh, the last matches that they have uh, won against, uh, we form Volta. Um, I remember uh, losing to uh, a band apart in uh, one of them, I think it was a Lions tournament, 15, and it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was Strife, Strife personified. I believe you were there as well, Mystical Mind. I don't like to remember those days. Yes. <laughs> yes. The, 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 the days of ECM. Yeah. And then let's take a quick look at plant, Platinum Sensitivity. As you mentioned, the uh, the Japanese contingent, very small team by comparison. Only 13 pilots have flown for them. And when you consider it's 10 v 10, uh, not very much redundancy there. But they've done relatively well, winning four matches, uh, losing one, um, which is interesting, uh, considering you have to lose two to leave the tournament. But we'll, you know, we'll gloss over that. Um, and last matches, they won against Laserhawks, Volta, his uh, numbers are just coming in here, um, and Network and Exodus. Interesting. Who hasn't won against Volta? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, Rock Capel today. Oh, true, true. <laughs> uh, let's go over to the arena now and see who will win this time between a band apart and Platinum Sensitivity. Let's go. Hello, Hello and am... welcome to this exciting match. We have Band Apart versus Platinum Sensitivity. Band Apart rocking the Balgorn Vindicator Hyperion top end combo. I've, it's like a pick three of the best battleships in the tournament, supported by a double logistics free comp and some control and tackle. Yeah, um, we see that Platinum Sensitivity. Um only Japanese team in the event, um, captained by um, Hydra-affiliated Mark Bridges in Vindicator, got the Lashak supported by Onero Stormbringer, um, double uh, tech to Command Destroyer, and then we have Arbitrator for some Guidance Disruption, uh, Spipal, and Confessor, and a Vengeance. So somewhat similar archetypes, but differing a little bit in the low end, choosing for a little bit more uh, disruption and going for an Oniros instead of, you know, two Tech 2 Logi ships. Yeah, the Shack, a very strong pick from Platinum Seven Sensitivity, but it's up against the Balgorn, which is possibly one of the worst battleships to see across from you when you're sitting in a Lashak. We'll see how it winds out playing out as the links are popping and we're about to get underway here. Yeah, I, indicators, I can't. Both of these teams definitely want to be charging into each other. However, a band apart has started much closer. Yeah, and I mean, uh, critically, um, the vindicator um, of both of these teams is in fact a flagship. So it'll be interesting to see how that 
uh, dynamic plays into things. Uh, we see that Mark Bridges and uh, the Lashak of Heineckel are, you know, pulling range, they're kiting away, they're trying to ball up and create um, good positioning, not overextend themselves. Right now, the Hyperion of Smudge is pushing in, the Tyrannus of Perta Perta is pushing below, trying to get on top of possibly the O'Neill's, but he's going to get out of range of his Frigate Logi, and we see him getting primaried right now, actually. Yeah, that Tyrannus, a very bold play, diving very deep into the back line, while most of the battleships are starting to bunch up now around each other. Kiting in a battleship is always a dicey proposition as Perta Perta's Tyrannus goes down. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, we know that these uh, Hyperions and the Lashak, the Vindicator, they're all starting to fight each other at zero. We see Mark Bridges and Heinkel. They're trying to primary uh, this Hyperion of Smudge off of the very uh, jump, not wanting to go up against the Officer Balgorn, potentially of Rick's Javix. Um, interestingly enough, though, um, we see that Platinum Sensitivity is using their Arbitrator to tracking disrupt the Balgorn, tracking disrupt the Vindicator. And there's a little bit of kind of um, wiggle room where if you, you know, can kind of really shut down that Vindicator with Guidance, you can kind of out-kite with your, um, you know, Vindicator creating range disruption. Um, Smudge, though, for his part, is holding right now. We see a cloud of Repbots on top of him. Now, unfortunately, the Aneros for Platinum Sensitivity has been tackled down. He's got a Vexor Navy issue on top of him, just joined by a Stabber Fleet issue as you were uh, breaking down that Vindicator dynamic. That is that's a dicey proposition. Now, the Stabber Fleet issue is taking an insane amount of fire. They're doing what they can to free up the Aneros, but that is clearly an alarm bell for the Platinum Sensitivity team. They don't want their Aneros pinned down. They don't want the Balgorn Vindicator Hyperion combo to get on top of it because they will absolutely apply damage. And even the Balgorn, even if it doesn't shoot the Aneros, its newts will be able to totally neutralize it, which will spell doom for that Lashak for sure. Yeah, right now the Oneros is totally fine. He has a cloud of medium armor bots on top of him, and it's really only um, the Stabber Fleet issue and the Vexor Navy. We've seen that the Deacon and the Thalia have gone in far back to try to support um, the Stabber Fleet issue. And now we see a bit of a snap call. Um, we see the Deacon being primaried instead, now that he's really far deep in. We see the Confessor and the Spike will get on top of him. And this is going to be where the match turns in favor of Platinum Sensitivity. Once they've killed this Deacon, they're going to go after the Thalia, while they're also primarying Smudge's Hyperion. Well, the Balgorin seems to be struggling to apply newts throughout the team. I'm not seeing guns firing on it. It doesn't appear to have... Oh, wait, no, I, I, I stand corrected. That is a laser Balgorn. That could be where we are seeing some unexpected behavior here. The Balgorn is not laying down neutralizing pressure across the entire Platinum Sensitivity team. It is focusing directly on their primary, that Vindicator, which is good it will turn off the vindicator's guns but not good and that it's not disabling the logistics so they're not killing it fast enough they wind up losing their hyperion the stabber fleet issue will follow quickly as well as their thalia which has no logistics partner to support it platinum sensitivity is running away with this match here yeah so what the belgorn of watson was able to do was he was able to get on top of um this vindicator which is a a little bit weird, you really don't want to be on a Vindicator at zero because now you're getting shot with uh, Void. Um, but eventually the Lashak just spooled all the way up and was able to break through the Hyperion's active reps and they're losing the Thalia now. The Deacon's been dead for some time. And like you said, it really feels like Platinum Sensitivity um, was able to use their you know disruption on the Vindicator and the Balgorn with tracking to really hurt the output of the band apart. And then once that, you know, Deacon and Thalia overextended to try to save their Stabber Fleet issue, um, both got picked off and really aren't going to be in a good situation, you know, Lodgy versus no Lodgy. Yep, the Aeneros has totally broken free. It's completely fine at this point. They're attempting to throw some heavy drones onto it now. It's going to be too little too late. With the rep bots it has, it's not really under any threat and it has pulled safely far away from the Balgorn Newt, so even if they switched over to that now, 
they're really going to have a hard time getting enough neutralizing pressure on it to take it out of the fight. Meanwhile, they continue to bleed ships. Watson Crick's Balgorn is perilously low on armor, but it appears Novak's Vexor Navy will likely die first as he's getting absolutely shredded right now, despite having some pretty powerful local reps. They may go yeah. down at the same time. The damage output from the Platinum Sensitivity team is staggering. Yeah, I mean, a band apart with trying to run, um, you know, an armor control setup, you know, augmenting the um, flagship Vindicator that they brought, but it really just didn't work. And it turned out that, um, you know, despite having a much larger control bar, they didn't really have a lot of damage. We've seen throughout the entire time, um, even at the very beginning, Platinum Sensitivities had a much larger attack bar being applied. And, you know, eventually once that Lashak spool from Heineken got all the way up and was applying damage to the battleships uh, with, you know, perfect tracking, you're not really going to be in a good situation. I mean, yes, a band apart has the crucifier, but we haven't really seen Ninu be all that impactful compared to Nosku's arbitrator counterpart. Yeah, the, the Crucifier not adding much when you have all your battleships at zero like that. Uh, Lashak isn't going to have any trouble tracking a tackled battleship, even with tracking disruption, and range disruption would be pointless because they're on top of each other. So the the Crucifier is an odd choice for this match. Maybe they brought it sort of as a contingency plan if they were up against more of a kite-based team or a team with a lot of projection like Paladins. But for this particular matchup, just not adding a lot of value. Now, Platinum Sensitivity had an Arbitrator on their side, which brings about the same as far as Ewar, but at least that is kicking out some damage as well. Yeah, I mean, Arbitrators for six points, you get quite a bit out of it. Um, you know, you get those bonus newts, and you get, you know, four mid slots. It's not a lot, but it's enough where if, you know, you throw on a propulsion module, you throw on three guidance disruptors or three tracking disruptors, um, you can significantly impact the ability of teams to really be able to apply damage. But that's going to be all for us as Platinum Sensitivity shuts out a band apart 100 to nil. Connected. Channel switched. Well, it would have been a f***ing easy fight, right? But guess what, dude? I'm not seeing and people can't get their f***ing together! Platinum sensitivity there, taking that victory over a band apart. As a band apart also loses their flagship fit vindicator, Mark Bridge in uh, Mark Bridges in his flagship vindicator survived uh, to be fielded yet another time. Uh, Rick's flying a 3.9 billion esque vindicator there, uh, putting uh, the the high damage webbing platform to, to pretty reasonable uh, use. We thought briefly it was going to be a flagship vindicator trade, uh, but um, alas, it was not to be. Um, we saw the Platinum Sensitivity team there with a Lashak that looked like it was just left alone to spool and spool and spool, and that seemed to just do more and more damage over the course of that match. Uh, left almost completely unchecked, in fact. Uh, Gentana, I think you pointed out that the Crucifier on grid from Van Depart didn't seem to have any tracking disruptors to, to put on that Lashak. What's your thoughts there? Yeah, it seems as though their Crucifier was fit almost entirely with missile guidance disruptors, um, and... This is a kind of the guessing game you've got to do. It's something you especially see uh, across um, lots of teams. Rather than going for a mix of the two systems, you go all in on one thing. You expect to you know, run up against something like a Typhoon fleet issue that's going to 
be spewing rapid heavy missiles all over the arena or maybe a Cerberus or something like that where, you know, dealing with its range completely eliminates the uh, ability of the ship to function in its game plan. Where, uh, But, you know, that does leave you open to matches like this where you have spent three points on a ship that is completely useless. And uh, speaking of the opposite of useless, very useful ship, the Lashak left to spool. <coughs> Mystical Mike, why is that such a bad thing to just leave unattended? Yeah, so we mentioned spooling earlier. Uh, I knew that we'd come back to it. Um, so spooling refers to the type of weapon system that Alashak uses. So with the super tidal disintegrators, uh, as an example, I don't know if they're all super tidal, but with these in disintegrator weapons, um, the more that you cycle them, the more damage they do. So when we're saying that the Lashak was left unchecked, it means that the Balgorn wasn't effectively using its newts to try and interrupt the cycles on the Lashak. Once you stop the Lashak cycles, it resets the damage that it's doing, ensuring that, okay, it's starting from 700, 800 again, instead of the 1.6k that it may ramp up to, which, when you're in an active repping ship like a Hyperion, isn't an ideal amount of damage coming in over a long period of time. And we saw that eventually the Hyperion goes down because it just can't tank that amount of damage coming in from both the Lashak and the Vindicator when it manages to actually get its guns off. I mean, the Balgorn was pretty good at shutting that down, but I don't think that was really the problem ship that they had to deal with. Jintan, we also saw uh, Platinum Sensitivity bringing uh, what appeared to be an Armor Stormbringer. Uh, interesting decision, perhaps. They're usually fielded as shield ships. Uh, why might you bring an Armor one? Um, I, I'm not entirely sure, to be perfectly honest with you, Ithaca Hawk, but it seemed to have worked out really well for Platinum Sensitivity there. You saw them use a lot of tracking disruptors, taking what is already a weak point of the Blaster Rush comp in terms of its, its inability to project over range, and making that even worse. You saw how close those the ships from a band apart had to be to do anything, and that was event pretty much what cost them the match. You know, Things were orbiting them at 10k, and they couldn't do anything about it. Um, equally... Having so many mid slots allows you to uh, uh, increase your application quite a lot, so you can use that Stormbringer to really, really effectively clear drone clouds, especially rep drone clouds, which in a three battleship mirror like the one we just watched are so important. Um, if your opponents have two or three flights of heavy rep drones on a target, it can be almost impossible to break them. Uh, and we saw that with the Aneros later on in the game, where it was just coated with those rep bots, and that kept it alive for so much longer than it needed to be. Awesome. Now let's look ahead to our, our next matchup here. It's going to be Bright Side of Death versus Pandemic Legion. And we have some um, some history of these teams, but we'll get to that. We're going to look at the bans first. Uh, so Bright Side of Death banning uh, Sleipnir, uh, Gila, uh, Curse, uh, Pandemic Legion banning out the Balgorn, Curse, and Eos. And then we have some trickle-down bans thanks to the dual curse ban of Loki for Bright Side of Death and Nighthawk for Pandemic Legion. Uh, these are two very experienced teams. Pandemic Legion, of course, uh, have won more alliance tournaments, I think, than any other team. I think they've won five. Um, of course, today's Pandemic Legion is uh, not quite as um, uh, illustrious as the, the Pandemic Legion team of old, of course. Um, but still, you know, no slouch team. Uh, you know, underestimate them at your own peril. But you can see here, over 100 pilots have flown. Uh, was it over? Exactly 100 pilots have flown with Pandemic Legion. Uh, they've played 80 matches and won 58 of them. So a pretty historic team. Mystical Mike, what do these bands say, say to you? I mean, it's interesting to see the Slepnir, Nighthawk, and the Loki ban. Um, these are all commonly associated with the Shield Rush setups that we've been seeing today. We haven't actually seen many Slepnirs, I think, but we have seen the Nighthawk quite frequently, uh, usually paired with the Loki. So that makes sense, these bands. Uh, they probably don't want to be going up against a strong Shield Rush setup. They're probably pretty comfortable going up against a weaker version, but Shield Rush in its peak form, perhaps, not what they want to be going up against. And, of course, we see the... Curse and the Eos bands coming out alongside the Gila, which suggests again that they don't want that long range newt and more importantly the guidance disruptors and tracking disruptors, but also they don't want to be going up against their respective versions of uh, drone kite. Awesome. Let's, let's uh, see if we can take a look uh, in a bit more detail about the, some of the historical matches of Pandemic Legion uh, and bring that up. So um, you see here. This is Bright Side of Death we're looking at. 36, nope, this is Pandemic Legion we're looking at. 100 pilots, uh, Destoya, uh, Dan Cool, of course, very experienced people. Seamus Ortiz, Lucas Kwan flew a whole bunch of logistic cruisers, if I remember correctly. And then the last time they've won matches here, uh, in Alliance Tournament 16 versus Templis Kalsif, uh, Slice in Alliance Tournament 15. So it's been a while, really, since they've been um, a successful team. We go right back to Alliance Tournament 14 uh, when they beat the Tuskers, and that would have been one of the matches in the Grand Final where they actually lost to the Tuskers there. 
Uh, in terms of dropping matches, they dropped against Barcode, NC Dot, Hydra, uh, the initiative, and then of course the Tuskers again in Alliance Tournament 14, and that would have been the the last match of the the grand final there. Uh, let's switch over now to Bright Side of Death. Take a look at them. Here we are. So 36 uh, pilots for Bright Side of Death uh, over all their years of playing. And Faffy Waffy, we see him again. Of course, right now he's uh, with Dark Side, I believe. Um, and, you know, can you Faffy the Waffy? Who knows? Maybe. Um, they've been pretty okay successful. It's kind of 50 50 right down the middle. Uh, last couple of matches that they have beaten include uh, TNT, Castabout, Laserhawks, Salt Farmers, and the Weekend Warriors. They've also lost against some pretty reasonable teams, including Darkseid, Hydra, Templis, and Arrival. So these are no no slouch teams, of course. So, Jin Tan, what do you think about this matchup? This is a quite historical matchup here. Yeah, this is a, a matchup that's going to be very interesting. Obviously, Pandemic Legion is a completely different team. They're almost rebuilding from scratch. They've got a lot of institutional knowledge from you know, team, team members past, but they aren't running with any of their previous captains, with November taking the lead for them. And meanwhile, Bright Side of Death are coming into this with a wealth of experience in this meta specifically. Uh, they had to play, uh, sorry, they got through the, they got through the bracket in the trials tournament with uh, Odin's Call. Uh, so they had to play some um, very, very difficult, very high stakes games um, to get here, uh, winning, I believe, all five of their games to do so. Uh, so. You know, my money would be on Bright Side of Death, I've got to say. like I feel like they're coming into this match warmed up. They've won a lot of games already. And Pandemic Legion are probably going to be on it a little more shaky. Not going to have the same excellence of execution that we've seen from them in the past. Yeah, we uh, we said before that teams that came through the feeders um, have basically been like, battle-hardened already coming into this tournament. Like You have teams like PL, they've yet to play at all. They're literally just turning up uh, to see if they can ride in their reputation. We will find out very soon. Uh, whereas BSOD, as Jen mentioned, have had to go through an absolute gauntlet in the feeders. And they did, this, did so with great applaud, winning all of their matches, uh, most of them against pretty reasonable opponents, including... Odin's Call, uh, who everyone thought would be straight through into the, uh, the the main tournament. They ended up having to go through the redemption bracket uh, and make their way in to this particular tournament itself. Um, so you're going Jintan for uh, B-Sod, but what about you, Mr. Might? I think I'd also lean B-Sod, just because we've seen a bit more of their performance recently. So we have a better idea about what they're actually capable of compared to PL, where we identified that they haven't actually been flying too much since AT's way back. You know, um, I don't know. I I think I lean B sod here just because B sod. Why not? Can't yeah. support PL. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I kind of want to see PL do well simply because they're such a historic team. Like it feels, it just feels like it'd be a cool thing for them to come back from uh, mediocrity. Basically, is what they've been in. Um, I mean. Definitely, they're a top thirty-two team this year. Um, last year, I think they made it to what top twenty-four. Um, uh, they weren't in last tournament, I believe. Year before then, must be thinking of eighty sixteen. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's been a while since we've seen PL be a successful team. Uh, I know some of the uh, the people involved are experienced, maybe not as leaders uh, in the team. Uh, we've got Radikos is in there as well. Um, he pre previously flown with Boundary Experts and a couple of other uh, teams in different tournaments. The teams are landing on grid at the minute, uh, so we're just waiting to get confirmation that everyone is settled and ready before we can actually go to the arena. And they are settled and ready, so let's go and see who's going to win between Bright Side of Death and Pandemic Legion. Hello, I am moderator, joined by my colleague, Alexeyev Card. We have an excellent match between Pandemic Legion and BSOD here. We are waiting for the last ship of uh, Pandemic Legion, that would be um, Destoya to actually get on grid, and he is appearing now. It would appear that um, he made a mistake in the warp, and so the GM has moved him to um, zero, and I'm not entirely sure if I would want to be at zero in an Armageddon Navy if I were him. Well, he could do worse. Um, Bright Side of Death coming in with a Lashak, Navy Dominix, Drakovic, Vedmak. Very Triglavian heavy here. They are one point short, but they're doing well with their low end. A pair of Tecti Logistics frigates and two extremely heavy tacklers. Yeah, um, interesting to see the dynamic where both teams are choosing to go, you know, Deacon Thalia 
to deal with the points. And Destoya wastes no time immediately running back towards his team, uh, not wanting to get held down by this Mahler, this Lashak, this Dominic's Navy issue that all three of them are pushing together. Meanwhile, we see Turon go in for a screen attempt, as well as the executor of Chris Pronger. Well, the double Armageddon Navy is going to be very useful here. The additional neutralizer range could help keep the Lashak, Dominic, Strakovic at bay. Uh, the Dominic Navy is pushing a bit far ahead of his team. He's not the primary target, but they may do well to tackle him down, and now it appears he is webbed down. Very yeah, good I'm... screening on behalf of Bright Side of Death. Yeah, I'm impressed to see the amount of damage that's been put onto this Lashak of Amos. I mean, he only does have Tech 2, um, you know, logistics for supporting him, but even then you would think that he would have a little bit more in the active rep tank. Meanwhile, um, Besod is trying to push damage onto the Pontifex of Turon Gorp, who is being held down by the Heretic of Shayat. Uh, 3,000. Meanwhile, they're also putting damage onto the executor Navy issue of uh, Chris, who is sitting on top of the shack at zero with a cloud of Reptron supporting. And this little shack is getting absolutely pounded. Now, PL will lose their Exeger Navy issue, which is a tremendous chunk of damage. This may see the Lashak begin to stabilize a little bit. He's starting to claw back his armor ever so slightly. But the Geddon navies, the longer they're here, the more their newts are going to take their toll on the right side of death team. The Lashak is pulling back a tremendous amount of his hit points, actually, but they're not yeah. making much progress anywhere else on the field here. Yeah, and the reason for that Lashak clawing back is the um, Typhoon Flit issue of November was on reload. He just now has managed to get um, his um, reload back off, and he has a smart bomb fit. What he's trying to do is getting on top of the Lashak and clear um, all of the rep drones that are on top of him. Um, it would appear that Radicos is on top um, with Conflight pushing damage, but he is running Newts, not a smart bomb. So November getting very close, and once he does these medium armor bots, uh, yeah, they're starting to get deleted. They're in hull. Meanwhile, the Thalia of Blast goes down, and November's Typhoon is into low armor as well. November's Typhoon currently smart bombing his own rep drones. He's not quite in range of the Lashak's drones. He's been hitting his own support this entire time. He looks like he may have realized it and then turned it off as he tries to crawl ever closer to the Lashak, but he may go down before he gets there. Yeah, I mean, he has heavy drones supporting him, and maybe felt like it would be worth trading a little bit of the damage um, of on heavies to kill the mediums that were on the... Um, Lashak, but he goes down first. And even if they lose the Lashak at this point, um, the bright side of death is still in a pretty good position. They are going to kill the Sentinel. They've killed all the Lodgy. Um, right now, Pandemic Legion doesn't have a whole lot left in the tank. Yes, they have two Geta Navy issues, which are fearful by themselves, but still, they'd have to fight a Dominic's Navy issue, a Drek and a Fedmac, which are pretty beefy ships, especially supported by logistics and links. Yeah, once the PL Logistics Wing went down, the rest of their team folded up rather quickly. Bright Side of Death doing an excellent job on target calls to take as many ships off the field as quickly as possible while still putting pressure on the top end. Killing that Typhoon was absolutely essential. Once that went down, the Lashak was able to stabilize, and Bright Side of Death is going to look to be able to secure this match here. Destoya's Geddon Navy is about to drop. They're hitting essentially every target on the Pandemic Legion team at the same time. And they are shredding here. He'll go down. The Mollus may join shortly, although it's beginning to recover some shields, likely kiting out these drones that are chasing it. Uh, looks like they're going to split fire between Radicos's Geddon and Arkeley's Jackdaw. Yeah, so we see that um, at least Randolph in chat complaining about, or maybe not complaining, but um, you know, missing his points in chat. I'm feeling very good about having bet on uh Besod in this match. We see the Mollus choose to go for the Edge of Glory um, using that micro jump drive beacon to get himself um, out of the arena at 200 kilometers. Um, I can't help but feel like the turning point was when what I assume had to have been a reactive armor hardener shifted to full EM Therm and the clip on that Typhoon fleet you know, ran out. We thought the Lashak was going to go down. He did, after all, um, go into hole, but eventually stabilized, and Pandemic Legion lost enough damage, and eventually the match. We 
see the jackdaw of Arcdale Dark, um, habitual euthanasia member being uh, apparently euthanized by this heretic trading between uh, two uh, light missile boats as they're uh, just uh, pew pewing each other. Um, and that would be the jackdaw going down um, along with Pandemic Legion to the loser's bracket. Um, sorry, Elise, but uh, Bright Side of Death cleanly winning this 100 to nil. Yeah, we actually lost a bet as CCP collectively, uh, so that's why that Alliance logo is in the game. Of course, you could change your Alliance by leaving, but that would be kind of a jerk move. <laughs> that kind like, of, oh, you don't like it? Uh, just leave. This, this logo sucks. I'm going to go join. Welcome to Eve Pandora. 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 Pandemic Legion there, unfortunately unable to pull out the W. They killed one ship for three points and lost all 100 of their own in return to BSOD, who take a very commanding win over Pandemic Legion. Uh, if I listen really carefully, just about here, CCP Swift somewhere in the building, uh, wailing uh, in in, uh, in grief. Um, but yeah, what went wrong there, Mystical Might, for Pandemic Legion? Apart from just some of their ships not moving for maybe nearly a minute, but what else went wrong? Well, we yeah, we had the little joke about how long would it take for Radicost to actually begin moving in the match. Um, and then I made the joke that Destroyer actually stopped moving and the, L the Shack began dying again. So perhaps, you know, the best thing that they could have done is just sit still. Um, but yeah, I mean, they traded the entirety of their team to get the Lashak into half structure. Um, I think they went on to reload uh, at a point where the Lashak was almost dying. I think it was dipping into structure at that time, and then they went on to reload. And that's really exemplifying the issue that you may run into when you're using rapid heavies, is that if you're just on the cusp of breaking something, but you don't quite have enough missiles left, then you're screwed. And I think that showed pretty pretty convincingly in the PL match here. Yeah. Jintan, do you think there's anything they could have done differently in that matchup that may have, maybe could have led them to taking the win? Or was it kind of almost a foregone conclusion at that point? Uh, there's definitely a couple of things. Uh, first of all, they could have had Destoyer warp in at his allotted range rather than being warp, uh, teleported to zero by the judges as a result of not warping fast enough uh, to the arena. Yes, just for uh, those of you who may be new to the tournament, um, when the teams are teleported into the system, they are uh, not able to move, not able to warp. They're in a very nice line all next to each other. Uh, and they are told when uh, uh, warping is unlocked to warp to the arena at a range of their choice between zero and 50 kilometers. Um, they have a, a small window to do this. If they fail to do this, either because they just don't warp or they warp to the wrong thing, like the sun, which does happen, um, or warp to a range outside of 50, then they are teleported by the GMs to zero, uh, which, I mean, depends on the ship. If you're in like an Armageddon Navy issue, it's not the worst thing, but maybe if you're a scimitar and like a kiting comp, going to zero, that could be pretty catastrophic for your team. So uh, right-click and warping can be difficult for, for some people. It can be, yeah, uh, especially for a, a team that you would think is quite storied in the Alliance tournament itself. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's one way of putting it. Uh, right, let's check in for a few minutes with CCP Loki on how um, story can impact gameplay in EVE Online. Narrative driven design is something that we started earlier this year. We Well, we have done it sometime in the past in, in some shapes or form, but we sort of wanted to escalate it. So like in the past, in the lead up to, for example, uh, Abyssal Dead Space, uh, we had a, a story going on and, and kind of mystery and, and things for players to discover, etc., etc. And we sort of wanted to apply that to basically as much as we can when we're, we're creating new features for EVE Online. 
This summer we have had things happening around Athanon where Kaltari and Galentier are like struggling it out. Uh, we have things happening in Turnur, Vart and Ekmar where the Amar started uh, having stellar transmuters and, and the Minmars are trying to stop them. We have tech races between the empires and we want these uh, player activities and events really sort of control how the features are rolled out and in what order and then that players actually do affect the uh, storyline and the history of, of, of New Eden. For example, with the, uh, with the gate construction in, in Athanon, both the Kaltari wanted a gate into Athanon and the Galente, and it was totally up to the players to determine when or if their empire managed to construct a gate into Athanon. And we are quite willing, if, if players do not manage to actually construct the gate, you know, meet the requirements for the empire to actually construct the game into, into Athanon, they will never get the gate into Athanon. So it's totally and completely in, in, in player hands. What we are really trying is to co-write the story of New Eden with players and player input and make player input meaningful to that story and them actually affect the politics of Ten New seconds. Eden and, and the world of New Eden. There you are, CTP Loki there with how uh, story and narrative Im impacts gameplay in EVE Online. I don't know if you guys had a chance to uh, get involved in some of those storyline uh, events. Uh, I was doing some like, ninja mining and an alpha all uh, for the Galmel, you know, come on the Federation, trying to build the gate. We failed. Um, and like, the Kaldari were just super organized, but it was super cool seeing all of the, the stuff interact with each other. Then, of course, the Star and Turner and all the players just getting, you know, blatted uh, by the Star exploding. That was awesome. I was hiding there in a... Uh, he cloaked uh, rookie ship basically to see what would happen, and sure enough, everything blew up. It was uh, very exciting. Mr. Komai, did you have a chance to, to get involved in any of this? I went to the one in Turner with a Pete, which is a long range Loki that you'd use for sniping, and a looting alt. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when the star began to erupt and my shields and my armor went down, I thought, hey, I'll just enter warp so that I can skip all this damage. And then it still s kept hitting me. I was like, <laughs> Ooh, I don't really want to die here. <laughs> uh, thankfully, it stopped in 25% structure, I think, uh, which is great. Um, great opportunity to finish off everyone else. That was also quite low. Um, but yeah, no, I've, I've not had much of a, a chance to interact with the mining events that have been going on and the, the gate building that's been happening um, around the various corners of EVE. Uh, just just the, the star stuff. What about yourself, Jintan? We were talking a little bit about some of the uh, like lore things during the break. Have you been involved with any of these? Uh, no, I haven't had the chance to. I've been kind of scrimming and trying to do as much research as I can about the Alliance tournament coming into this year. I mean, that's, a, that's perfectly fair. Like, it takes a lot of time and effort to, to be in some of these teams and practice. Like, Mystical Might, obviously, you've been in uh, Hyde Reloaded and Volta. You know just how much, how many hours uh, some of these teams can put into, not just in the actual practicing themselves, which, you know, some teams are doing two, three, four, sometimes even five times a week for a couple, like, maybe three, four hours, but also the theory crafting uh, and everything around it to support those practices. It can be a huge load on people. Speaking of teams that probably do practice a whole bunch uh, to get ready for the tournament, um, the, our next match is going to be Lockrange Enjoyers versus Exodus Dot. Uh, Jin Tan, what can you tell me about these teams? I mean, this is probably, along with the Dark Side Templars match that we watched earlier, uh, one of those matches everyone had underlined when the schedule dropped um, for today. You know, Lockrange Enjoyers, they are uh, a team that effectively local is primary from last year, a team that got fourth place um, it, and had an amazing run from the lower bracket. Going up against Exodus, a uh, silver place medalist multiple times, a uh, team that's hist almost always historically done really well, very adept at using kiting comps and um, other sorts of, you know, really, really high execution intensity uh, strategies. I'm really excited to see this matchup. You know, it's going to tell us quite a lot about where the meta is as well. Both of these teams have really good theory crafters, and we're going to get to see an absolute joy. Mr. Mike, what do you make of these bands here? So, Lockrange and Jar is banning out the Bargas, the Eos, and the Oneros, with Exodus banning the Balgorn, Loki, and Armageddon. I mean, again, I, I think these are probably the most common bands that we've seen this entire tournament so far for the first day. I don't think we've really seen much that deviates from these bands that we're seeing here. I think every team has banned this in some fashion or other. Um, nice. All, <laughs> all wave. Um, yeah, it's, again, just wanting to remove the ability to apply long-range nukes with the Armageddon. Um, I can't remember exactly what Exodus's flagship is. 
I would be willing to bet it's probably a bar guest. I would lean bar guest, but I can't quite remember because I know there was a good selection of Vindicators you, as well. Do you know who knows these things and is never wrong? Twitch chat. Tell us Twitch Twi- chat. Twitch chat. Can you let us know who, uh, uh, what ship they have chosen as their flagship? I think it's the bar guest. I want to lean bar guest. I want to yeah. So the bar guest band's fairly interesting if that is the case. Because... Twitch chat doesn't seem to know. Griffin. It's the flagship Griffin. Yes, okay. Y- Twitch y- chat. You sure it's not the Panther? <laughs> yeah, Vindicator for Lock Range enjoys. I know that one. Yeah. But Exodus, please, team. Oh, Geddon. Geddon. Oh, Geddon, that's right. Yeah. Ah, so banning the Geddon on Thanks. the Exodus side yes. would Thanks. allow them to bring their flagship Geddon without fear of being countered. Yeah, and it sounds like the flagship going to be fielded here. Thanks, Shanna Albell, uh, <laughs> for your, uh, your co-production on this tournament. Without you... We couldn't have done this part. Exactly. Um, so, flagship Geddon. Um, interesting choice. Um, why Jintan might my team take a flagship Geddon? Um, so, the flagship Geddon gains uh, a huge amount of power from the ability to fit faction newts. Um, I, don't, I don't remember if you can use dead space ones or not. I think it might just be faction. I'll have to check the rules in a little bit. But effectively, you can... Uh, project, you know, 50, 60, 70 kilometer newts out onto the field. And that means that no matter where your enemy T2 logistics warps in, you can turn it off. And that is incredibly powerful. It lets you just have a massive rep advantage. And key uh, key to that is the fact that it will turn off your opponent's prop mods as well, which means that you can quickly burn tackle over and you don't have to worry about anything other than your op- opponent's screening you off. And that lets you lock up all of your opponent's tackle very, very early on in the match. And then your DPS ships will have almost complete free mo- renewability around the field. Awesome. I'm just looking at the Twitch points here. It's fairly even. Extra 720,000 Twitch channel points to Lock Range Enjoyers, 880,000 uh, Twitch channel points. So not far off of uh, 50-50, to be honest. Uh, a little bit uh, more favouring Lock Range Enjoyers. But, I mean, let's find out who's going to get all those channel points and who's going to lose all of their channel points as we go to Lock Range Enjoyers versus Exodus. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the arena. I'm the Basilisk, joined by the wrinkly brain and buttery smooth voice of Fear Viner. Fear, how are you doing? How are you looking forward to this one? I'm doing very well, and today I see one of my favorite things ever, which is Shield Rush and uh, Double Nighthawk uh, Shield Rush, and that all Kaldari except for that Skybreaker coming in from the side of Exodus. Meanwhile, what do we see from Lockrange Enjoyers? Well, I feel like Lock Range enjoys a little bit of inside knowledge here. I think they've been doing some scrimming with Hydra, and we see them loving the power of this Navy Execral, as Hydra did in Divul, Truth on a Lie, or the Justice League, whatever you want to call them, uh, earlier in the day. So they clearly think these ships are powerful in their own right, and they've decided to bring three of these Navy Execrals, of course, rebalance somewhat in the Uprising patch. They now get a massive, I think it's a 25% per level bonus to gun damage, and they only lost one gun in the process. So I expect these Navy Execrals to absolutely spew out damage. Yeah, and it looks like a rush mirror matchup if I'm looking at the ship models correctly. So it's going to be a very brawly match and over pretty quickly. It looks like uh, dual 180s potentially on uh, that uh, slept near. So this does appear to be rush. Yeah, this is going to be a very high DPS comp here. I think this is going to be, well, both of these comps, I think this match is going to be determined rather quickly after the match starts because obviously one team is going to start taking down ships faster than the other and then it's going to snowball a little bit. So. Um, yeah, I think both these teams are going to, well, they would both ideally have liked to rush into each other, but maybe we'll sort of see one team decide actually that this matchup against another rush, the other rush might be rush here and decide actually they want to try and kite it out. But I'm not really sure which of actually, these teams that might be. Correction, I misread the modules. Those are 720s on the uh, on the Slepnirs. Uh So these are already slaps. Now I actually have to take a look at these exact navies and see what they I brought. Think, I think these are rail exact, so they may actually try and kite around here in this sort of rather unconventional shield kite comp this may turn out to be. Yeah, those are rails. So this is actually a kite comp. We said it was rush on the start. No, it's not. Kite versus rush. Uh, faster kiting setup with these Slipnares and these Exact Navies versus the much slower Nighthawks. But the Drake Navy and the Orthrus definitely on that faster side alongside the Caracal Navy issue. We'll see how that plays out as we begin the match. And we'll see how the teams want to start it. And the kite back immediately from the side of lock range enjoyers as the rush comes in from Exodus as expected. Yeah, and this lock range enjoyers comp, it's going to be very, very dependent on individual piloting to manage to kite out here because, I mean, they've got to deal 
their comp on the whole, their top end is fast. The Slepnis are faster than the Nighthawks, but they've still got to deal with these cruisers, the Osprey Navy, the Caracal, and they haven't actually got any control on their side in the form of like a Hyena or a Loki or some sort of long-range web that can go in and tackle things down and, and stop the rush coming into them. So it's going to be dependent on how well they can sort of assess their own position, assess the incoming push of these Nighthawks and Drake Navy and, and figure out where they want to be on the field. Confessor Zale going for the stream potentially on this Nighthawk uh, of Vitone from the Exodus side. Uh, that said, instead, they're going to try to get towards this back line, maybe uh, find the Lodgies. The Nighthawk has been completely untouched by tackle. No tackle mods. If you look at the screen right now, the control bars are tiny and there's no tackle being shown. Just a little bit of weapon disruption towards Exodus. Now the Navy exec of Lock Range Enjoyers of Striker has finally been webbed and scrammed. So Exodus should start shooting a primary target. But look at the damage. It's been split from Lock Range Enjoyers. They've been poking and prodding and might be going towards Captain Blastaho on this Caracal Navy issue. Yeah, he's burned in. There's, they split all the DPS drones onto Tin Baron and the Osprey here. Obviously, DPS drones, he can't really effectively rep himself in that Tech 1 Logi, but I thought the Caracal maybe of Captain Blastaho might go in for a tackle there. But um, of course, and I'm sorry, the, they're, on the, they're on the same team. Of course he won't. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, this Osprey now, I think they are starting to take chunks from these rails and, and the artilleries of the Slepnir and the, and the Exec Navies. Yeah, Natori uh, being the primary from the side of Lock Range Enjoyers. He's now volleyed through the armor into structure as well. But Tin Baron will be traded and he goes down first. So the Ospreys being traded off the start of the match. But now look at the health. Exodus has missing a lot more shields than Lock Range Enjoyers. Yeah, they've got a lot more base stats with those command ships. The Nighthawks obviously very, very beefy. And then the Navy Drake tanky as well. And that those Navy Execrals, of course, they are going to be shield fit, which is going to be quite limiting in terms of how much tank they can field. So it is going to be entirely dependent on how they can mitigate damage by staying away here. And I think this is a good call here from Lock Range Enjoyers. The way they're playing this out is just deal playing it slow, dealing with the fast ships. They're taking out the Osprey they to deal with reps. They take out the Navy Osprey. Now they're starting to work on this Navy Caracal and the Jackdaw. And once they get rid of those fast ships, they'll be able to then essentially kite around the Nighthawk in, perpetu in perpetuity. Yeah, really smart call from Lock Range Enjoyers, bringing the kite comp and not bringing any damps, right? They had some missile disruption, maybe thinking uh, that this Nighthawk rush might have come up from Exodus. And we see here just how well fast kite works against slower shield rush. This is why we talk about Slepnir rush in place of the Nighthawk rush, because in a mirror matchup, the Nighthawks beat the uh, Slepnirs due to resistance holes. But outside of that, the Nighthawk is a much slower ship. And we're seeing these Nighthawks not get on top of anything caracal navy of blasto going down and next will be deathwind as well just beautiful piloting from lock range enjoyers to win this match yeah blasto goes in to get tackle on grunt kato and i think he got a web on him for a couple seconds there but lock range enjoyed is immediately just turn around and blast him into outer space and say that navy caracal is gone and deathwind is going to be next here yeah this is, this is looking disastrous for exodus yeah, it's training the Slepnir for it, but it's a little bit too little too late. You got these rail exec navies that have been completely untouched. The other two Slepnirs far off the fight. The only thing nearby is this Hecate, but he's uh, in structure and he's been able to burn out as well. And this Orthrus of Morricus Drayson going down. They're going to save these Nighthawks for last and eat their uh, cake after they've dealt with the uh, main meal that is the low end of Exodus. Yeah, so as this match is going to sort of slowly draw out to a close, the points are still kind of close, but I, I think Lock Range Enjoys, as we've been saying, are just going to slowly whittle down these ships that are left without much sort of recourse. What do you think about the three Execral Navies? I mentioned it at the start. Do you think they've sort of flown under the radar a little bit? We've seen lots and lots of bands and picks come out of the Armageddon Navy. Everyone seems to have jumped on that as the, you know, it's been rebalanced. It's the new big thing. Do you think the Navy Execral could also sort of be potentially a really, really strong ship that a lot of teams might not have noticed? I think so as well. I think the cruiser rebalance changes. A lot of people were focused on the hacks and how, oh no, the Cerberus doesn't exist in our shield kite setups anymore. But we see they found a replacement in the Exec Navy. Not only does it cost fewer points, so you can field more of them with those point uh, with those point penalties coming through, but also you just have really strong damage on medium rail guns, which is not something a lot of people think about uh, outside of the older kind of Octodad setups where you had you know, medium rail guns on battle cruisers. Uh, this time around, medium rail guns on cruisers with Arties on the uh, battle cruisers has been how they won. And uh, we'll see if other teams decide to pick up on this. Uh, this Armageddon Navy still a very scary ship, but also rapid heavies we've seen only once today and it lost. 
Yeah, we do see now they do finish manage to take down one of those overpowered Navy Execrals. So maybe we'll be able to look at Zed Kill in a couple of minutes and have a look at that fit of Major Jenkins and see what exactly it is that making is making those ships so powerful. But I think you know Vitone's going down on the Nighthawk. Lock Range and Joy has played this perfectly according to their wind con here. They knew they could just kite around from the start, and you know it wasn't it wasn't an easy match for them because dealing with a rush, um, you know, when you haven't got that kind of long range control is can be very difficult. Um, but they they performed it perfectly. Yep, and the execution is very good from both of these teams normally. We talked uh, in the uh, desk beforehand how high the execution typically has been from Exodus Dot and how high it's been from Locals Primary, now Lock Range Enjoyers. That said, this is the English-speaking contingent of that alliance. It's split off into two parts, which is Lock Range Enjoyers, which you're watching right now, and Big Yikes, who is going to be up against your team in uh, Hidden Leaf Village, Ninja Assassin Squad Esports. Got the full name. Uh <laughs> later today yeah and i i'm a fiend for day three i love day three of the alliance tournament it's when you see you know like the, the wheat has been separated from the chaff you've got good teams all over the bracket you know every match is a banger but at this stage here in day one sometimes you have less experienced teams less skilled teams but this is quite possibly i'd say overall the highest sort of total skill of both teams of the matchups that we've had today both these teams as we say are very very competent unfortunately it is going to be exodus dropping down to the lower back bracket at their first entry into uh, this Alliance Tournament 18 and Lock Rangers enjoys is going to continue on. So with that, we're going to send it back to the desk. Uh, yeah, we actually lost a bet as CCP collectively. Uh, so that's why that Alliance logo is in the game. Of course, you could change your alliance by leaving, but that would be kind of a jerk move. <laughs> that kind like, of, oh, you don't like it? Nah, just leave. This, this Lego sucks. I'm going to go join. Welcome to Eve Pandora. Pandora. Lock Range enjoyers, they're enjoying their Lock Range indeed as they take that victory over Exodus uh, in what looked relatively comfortable. And we saw, Bart, some really interesting ships being fielded there by uh, Lock Range enjoyers. Uh, tell me about them. Uh, the big one that I think we saw, and uh, it's super relevant because of the new patch, is the Navy Execrer. And uh, I was I was watching the match and I saw that it's all three of theirs were like breaking about 4k meters a second in speed which is very, very fast for a cruiser. And when you look at the other things about them, um, so they just recently got buffed. They lost a turret, but they gained like so much damage. Uh, they do about 800 DPS as a short-range ship. They do, they're using rail guns. They're extremely quick. And I think that's what we saw of them just completely wipe the floor. Uh, there was a moment where Tin Baron gets tackled, and then the entire team of Lock Range Enjoyers swaps over and blows up the other Osprey at the same time. And that Osprey wasn't tackled. It was kiting as hard as it could, and it just didn't matter because Navy Execrer railgun tracking is, like, that good. And uh, we are joined here on the desk by the uh, wonderful, the beautiful, the bountiful CCPB. CCPB, how are you today? I'm feeling very good. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here. What do you think about these shield-kiting rail Executor navies? Is that something that you would maybe fly roaming around on TQ? Uh, I absolutely will be. Uh, I was looking at it the other day as a blaster platform, but after seeing this, I need to try it as a rail kiter. Looked brutal. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I I just didn't expect to see it. Uh, I just didn't even consider that really as an option. Uh, but then seeing them go as as Bart pointed out, 4k a second. Uh, the only thing about that is in the arena, 125 kilometers. If you go outside of that, you are exploded immediately. There is no grace period. You're out. You're gone. Uh, the faster your ships, the quicker that boundary approaches. Uh, some people, of course, are much more familiar with that boundary than others. Uh, we saw some questions, actually, about the boundary uh, during the quiz that CSP Convict ran um, at the at the intermission. And the current uh, record holder is Azura Nargent, uh, who managed, I think, 200 and 
32 kilometers or something like that, which when you consider the boundary is 125, is uh, some, some crazy space wizardry to get that far out. Other than that crazy executive Navy, Bart, what else did uh, uh, you think about that match there? Um, it was just it was a really really well set up. Uh, so it was a fly killer setup, uh, which is one of those terms that it's been being thrown around in every AT since like at least beginning since I started doing it. Um, but basically, this we saw Slepners, but they're running artillery in it, so it's different than any of the other Slepners. Like traditionally, I think at least for the last couple of years, you see Slepners, they're auto cannons and they rush you. Uh, these are artillery Slepners that they kite around and they try and do a large amount of damage. So. The entire Lock Range Enjoyer team was just a very high DPS, long range kiting setup without using missiles. And we usually see it with missiles. We saw it with uh, with uh, rail guns, artillery, et cetera. And it just did really good. They were able to pick any target that they wanted and just blast it. Yeah, great job there by the Lock Range Enjoyers, um, which, great team name, by the way. Um, Damascus Kadesh, the captain, uh, obviously, uh, he was also in the Amar Championship uh, with myself. He was one of the uh, fellow title holders. Um, uh, win winning some silver magnates back in 2014. Uh, since then, he's gone through a whole bunch of different tournaments, including the Event T ones, Alliance Open, Alliance tournaments, uh, and done pretty well. Uh, so excited to see how they do this year. Now, CCPB. Before you became CCPB, we uh, we all knew you from Twitch uh, as, uh, of course, Bjorn B. <laughs> uh, tell us about your 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 Eve streaming career. Um, well, I started about six seven years ago streaming Eve. Um, I kind of found myself streaming all kinds of other games before I went into EVE and then just found just a bunch of viewers enjoying the, fight, the fact that I was uh, switching to EVE full-time. Um, I've since then transitioned to being a CCP employee, very happy to be that, but I feel I'm a little bit out of my element when it comes to these uh, tournaments here. Uh, I can feel it. Uh, I did go to practice with a bunch of the Hydra guys and I felt there as well that I was in, you know, surrounded by really, really competent pilots and it's kind of bittersweet to be here. I was meant to be in the, uh, uh, what are they called again? Help me out here. I don't know where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, team? Like yeah, playing, yeah. playing on the grid? <laughs> yeah, okay. sorry, I just blanked out completely. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, absolutely fumbling here. <laughs> it's, it's, sorry. No, it's, it's super hard uh, flying in those yeah. matches. Like I've flown it as well. I've flown uh, in Lions tournaments, uh, the Amar Championship, yeah. and in uh, like events uh, on stage and things like that. Mm -hmm. And you can be like a super competent super experienced pilot like yourself on TQ roaming around I'm sure when you roam you're completely relaxed you're chill in and my you, element yeah absolutely. exactly and then um, you warp in to an alliance tournament match and no matter how experienced you are if you're new to alliance tournament stuff like you feel your heart rate rising you feel it like you get the shakes coming back and things yep. like that so I absolutely I absolutely get that uh, Bart you've flown in a bunch yourself I, I did. Um, it's been a couple of years. I uh, I figured out the ultimate secret to enjoying the Alliance tournament is to sort of divest yourself from really being a team member and a pilot so that you're like, like losing sucks so bad. Like everybody knows losing sucks, but like losing in the AT is like extra sucky. And as somebody that is kind of like done a couple fourth place wins, wins, uh, <laughs> Then, like, repeatedly, you know, the first time you get fourth and you're like, okay, that's cool. Second time you get fourth and you're like, we should have done better. And then the third time you're just like, okay, I'm done with this. I moved over to the commentating ana uh, analysis side and I have a lot more fun, mostly because my piloting isn't being scrutinized by everybody. So I don't have to focus as hard. I don't have to, like, uh, worry about being, like, a top tier pilot. Like, at this point, I'm just total garbage at the game. Like, there's certain <laughs> things I'm still good at, but this kind of stuff not anymore so i can kind of still look at it and understand it but yeah it is a totally different gameplay style than anything on tq yeah it definitely is and just the fact that it's it's you're equal basically on both sides so you have to excel in uh, in the theory crafting and the execution like on tq you can do other things like bring more people or um just like have better stuff but you're you're, you're limited to 100 points worth of ships, no more than 10 people. They have to be fit this way. You can't bring more than one logistics crew. They're just stuff like that that kind of like evens this playing field. And you have this this great storied history. You know, great teams over the years, like uh, like Bob back in the day. Um, uh, of course, uh, Camel Empire, Hydra Reloaded, Pandemic Legion, the most winningest team of all time. Five victories uh, in the 18 Alliance tournaments. Well, this one included. Um, just incredible amount of history and then being part of that and then it just feels like there's so much gone before you 
and every year people get better and better and better. Like if you took like a mid-range team, I think from this year, and you put them into like a Lions tournament twelve or or ten or something like that, I'm sure they would do like super super well. Like people have just continued to push the boundary and get better and better and better. Yeah, we're seeing that everywhere in the game. I feel um, if you would take any of the pilots today. The solo pilots, the FCs, doesn't matter where they play. If you take them and pit them against people from 10 years ago, it's not even not even close, you know. Uh, what I did find, though, really interesting getting to, uh, you know, do a bit of scrimming leading up to this, uh, is the fact that this, like you talked about, this equal back and forth, there is no more equal fight you can get technically, and it's just skill expression completely. Uh, I thought that was really interesting when, when getting to scrim with some, some high-level players. Awesome. Now let's look at our, our next match, which is only a couple of minutes away. It's going to be No Forks Given versus Castabouts. So let's take a look at the bans here uh, for, for these two teams. So No Forks Given banning out the Balgorn, the Armageddon Navy issue and the EOS, becoming bar relatively uh, standard bans there, and Castabouts as well, banning Bargess, Loki and Scimitar. Um, pretty, pretty standard. Is there anything here that's kind of crazy to you? You know, not really. Uh, this is It's kind of been what we've been seeing, um, at least for this first day. And, you know, as the day goes by, you know, tomorrow's going to be a different meta. Next weekend's probably going to be wild. But uh, we st we do see a lot of teams really afraid of, like, the Balgorn. And the Armageddon Navy issue, you know, post, uh, post changes is pretty much a Balgorn that shoots missiles instead of lasers. I mean, it doesn't have the webs, but it's still pretty strong. Um, and then, you know, on the castabout side, like, the Scimitar ban really hurts your ability to kite. And then the Loki ban also really hurts like some of the kiting stuff. So I, I'm not seeing anything particularly different and crazy here, but you're starting to see an, a ban meta evolve. And uh, I was talking to uh, CCP Swift over in the other room and was like, oh, like, you know, it's going to be really interesting seeing like even tomorrow just how the bands have started to form because I think we're going to see a pattern of like these Balgorns, these Gen Navies, these Eoses, and maybe a little bit of the Vargas too. Awesome. Let's see if we can just take a quick look at the uh, history of the Castabouts team here, because I just wanted to highlight them. Uh, they're a really cool team. Um, so they are made up of members who are in the Center for Advanced Studies, the default starter corp for uh, one of the Caldari bloodlines. And they never leave. They just stay in that starter corp. They have never left it, because once you leave it, you cannot rejoin it. And they compete in the Alliance Tournament as the Center for Advanced Studies. Um, it's a super cool thing. People normally see someone in a starter corp and think, hey, look at this noob, I'm going to gank him. And then they just get wrecked by the castabouts guys. So they've been playing for, for many years. Uh, 55 different people have flown for them in the Alliance tournament. Um, they've, they've lost a little bit more than they have won. Uh, they've always been a sort of like a mid-tier team. Uh, always like to see them. They've won uh, most recently against the band apart. Pen is out. Uh, Wormhole Poverty Law Foundation, 404 Alliance Not Found, and it's only Pixels. And the teams that they've lost against, pretty reasonable teams here. So Volta, Bright Side of Death, Hard Knock Citizens back in Lions Tournament 15 when they were quite good, actually. Bright Side of Death once again, and Dreamfleet. So a really cool, really interesting team and a very unique um, part of Alliance Tournament history, the, the cast about. So always happy to see them. Now, I believe the teams have landed on grid. Um, so we are ready to go to the arena and see who's going to win between No Forts Given and Castabouts. Hello everybody, welcome back to the arena. Castabouts and No Forks Given lining up in front of us here. No Forks Given actually bringing a ship that we haven't seen so far today. In fact, multiple ships we haven't seen today. They brought a Kronos, they brought in a Shimu, and they brought two Arbitrates. I don't think we've seen any of those so far in the day. And I think, uh, I, I, I'm a big Arbitrator fan, I'll be honest. I think they're pretty powerful. Fear, what about Castabouts? What do you think of their comp? I mean, they brought one of the bus ships, Dominic's Navy issue, alongside these dual Hurricane fleets and the Orthrus Sight fleet. I would have to imagine... Uh, that these are, in fact, autocannon uh, fit. Uh, wait, are these? Never mind. I said I imagine they're autocannon fit HFIs. They are not. They are 720 fit, uh, much like the Slepnirs from last time around, which is a little bit interesting considering you have a, a Dominic's Navy on your team. Yeah, and these Scythe Fleet issues, I think, are also rapid light fit. So I imagine these cruisers, the Authorist, the Scythe Fleet, and the Hurricane Fleet, as you're saying, are probably going to try and kite around. But then, that, as you say, that begs the question, why then choose the Dominic's Navy? It seems like a very... Well, it's an unusual choice for this comp. And the other thing that we haven't really touched on here is this co This is a comp without Logi from Castabouts, which I think has perhaps been one of their trademarks in previous years. They loved, if I remember correctly, they loved bringing sort of hull rush comps, comps without a huge amount of logistic staying power that just that just charge in and, and try and beat you in the first couple of minutes without getting attrition down. But this is a, this is a mixed bag they've got here with this Dominic's Navy. It's a little bit of sort of fish out of water situation here. 
Start of the match, both teams burning away from each other with the tackle of Castabouts moving in. Scythe Fleet issue going to be uh, the first primary uh, from the side of No Forks given, though, as uh, he dips into low shields. But as you mentioned, Castabouts, they're Logulus, so you can tank the Scythe Fleet issue however you want. Uh, still dipping into armor and uh, doesn't seem to be armor tanks, didn't seem to have a whole lot of shields left in him. We'll see if he has hull. Doesn't look like it either. Uh, actually, he has some plates. Nope, he's nope. Dead. <laughs> But of course, I guess the one upside you could say about this Castabots comp of not bringing uh, any Lodgy is you're not particularly hamstringed by abiding by the usual rules of, you know, this ship goes with that ship. They seem to have brought a real kitchen sink kind of fleet here, and I'm not, they don't seem to have made too much impact so far. They've broken the shields and the Ashimu, but of course, that's an entirely armor tanked comp from the No Forks given yep. side. And of course, with the, the sort of, well, fairly standard. Valia Deacon combo. They haven't really made much progress here, and they need to start making some progress ASAP. The longer this goes on, the more DPS they're going to lose, and the harder it's going to get. Yeah, but if you note on the fancy UI right now at the bottom of your screen, uh, tracking disruptions going three ways across the uh, two Hurricane fleets on the Navy Brudex, and also missile disruptions on this Orthros and Fleet site. So these arbitrators having value right now, making it harder for castabouts to actually hit any targets at the moment. So far, they've gotten zero points. They're about to lose another Scythe fleet issue, although he's able to break a little bit away from this high projection, low tackle uh, comp that Norfolk's given has bring. They're onto this Orthros, though, and he's got X. LASB charges, but that's not nearly enough to deal with a Paladin uh, and a Kronos blapping you. Yeah, and at this point, it's just really looking dire for Castabouts. If you've played two minutes of the match with these comps and you haven't really made much of an impact, it's just not going to get any better as this fleet site of David is going to go down very shortly, probably soon to be followed by the Orthrus of Kai. And I mean, yeah, these arbitrators, as you say, from the fancy UI, these tracking disruptors are worth wreaking absolute havoc on these Hurricane fleets. And I mean, we, we obviously don't have information as to how well they're hitting or not hitting, but they don't seem to be... Well, it, it must be working to some effect. Obviously, they're not killing anything. No, they're not killing anything at all, and the Scythe Fleet issue finally goes down, uh, burns a little bit back into the range of one of these Paladin guns, and he gets blapped. The Orthrus uh, able to wrap back up through those XLISB charges, but look, the Hurricane Fleet issue of Nazg is the target now for No Forks Given. They have lost zero ships thus far in this Hurricane Fleet issue. He's dipped in armor. Doesn't seem like he had a whole lot of tank, and uh, doesn't seem to have those hull uh, buffs either, so instantly blapping through him, and it looks like this one is all over for castabouts yeah it's i have to question really i mean ithaca said on the desk castabouts they turn up every year so credit to them for for consistently you know participating and as ithaca said it's a, a new player corp from uh center of advanced studies so they they're welcome to you know npc corp players um but i have to sort of question when there is you know like a sort of accepted standard of of logi it's good you should probably bring it and they seem to so consistently buck the trend and decide not to bring it. And I, I really wonder whether, you know, what evidence they have to suggest that this is a good decision. Yeah, not only that, I mean, you had this dual arbitrator and we haven't really talked a whole lot. I mean, we've mentioned it. We haven't really whole, talked a whole lot uh, outside of potentially that uh, paper numbers Odin's call match about the effectiveness of scripted tracking disruptors and scripted uh, and scripted uh, sensor dampeners, right? Uh, those are allowed in the tournament. They're not allowed to be tech two, but they are allowed at a meta level with the scripts, which makes them better than an unscripted tech two. And what we're seeing here is that if you don't bring a comp that has an answer to tracking disruptors and the other team brought tracking disruptors, you're going to have a really bad time, especially when you're trying to kite out. That's why we've seen a lot of rush setups and we've seen kite setups rely more heavily on having their own E-War to stop the potential uh, from uh, these uh, support cruisers uh, or these e-war cruisers. Yeah, and the other thing that, that, that that's relevant to that discussion is Castabout's comp also was lacking on links. They had those three battle cruisers, but none of them actually have links bonus, and most importantly, none of them have info links bonus. And if you look at the numbers, the most effective way to deal with tracking disruptors is to run that info link that resists against e-war disruption, because against damps, sensor boosters are actually pretty good, because not only do they counter damps, they counter ECM, and it's like a 120% bonus to scan res or targeting range or something um, with the sense boost, which is actually pretty good. Tracking computers, on the other hand, kind of suck. So if you want to deal with uh, tracking disruption, I would say the info link that resists against EWAR is pretty much necessary, and they really don't have a good boat to put it on there. So they're just feeling the full force of these tracking disruptions from those arbitrators, and it's really, really difficult for these... Well, it has been difficult for the Hurricanes and Brutics to actually 
do much of anything here. The other option, obviously, is remote tracking computers uh, being more powerful than local tracking computers. Uh, but you have to really, like, know that you're going to get use out of them or you have uh, typically it's a command desi uh, with the ability to have that extra mid slot because uh, i don't really want to be tackling anything and then get getting really close uh, that is the ability to potentially deal with that as well but as we saw no bonus link ships no command desis nothing that could have brought rtcs even uh for castabouts and as we see uh when you're up against a higher projection comp when you're in a kite comp that's forced to come close you're just going to end up eating the floor of course the other thing is as well if you bring let's say a command destroyer you can put three links on it and then put a fourth link offline and then you land on the grid and you say okay well we don't actually need this info link if you come up against a comp you know maybe that doesn't have much control and you say okay well we don't need the evil resist you offline that one and then you can online something else and get that sort of extra trade-off of having that extra link depending on what you're up against which is it could be pretty handy but castabouts here look like they're going to go down 100 to zero here no forks given i'm just going to slowly squeeze them out of this match um with the three minutes remaining, just to briefly touch on it, as we I mentioned it at the start, the Kronos. What do you make of the Kronos in the Alliance tournament? Uh, it's a ship that exists. I think one thing that we've been seeing uh, a lot of, even though they are not buffed for the AT, remember the Bastion module, which is the big thing that allowed Marauders to be as prevalent as they are on TQ recently. Uh, it does not exist, but we see some teams decide to bring uh, Marauders. And why they do that is because Marauders all have projection bonuses uh, and have eight guns worth of DPS, right? So uh, with that, and, and they typically have a very good slot layout as well. Uh, so with that, they're able to uh, then build a higher projection comp without getting some of the more damage lacking high production ships, such as the APOC and the APOC Navy, although the APOC Navy did get uh, a little bit of a buff uh, this patch. Um, and being able to project out a bit more, they're also very resistant to E-War. They have very long lock ranges, so things like sensor dampeners don't really affect them that much. Although, once again, they can be tracking disrupted, even though they all have these kind of projection bonuses. Yeah, I think in this comp that no folks given here, it's like the centerpiece of their comp is these two armor marauders, and they've decided rather than bringing two paladins, they've opted for a paladin and a Kronos. Whether that's the right call, I don't know. I'd have to do some theory crafting on the comp, but uh, it seems to have worked out for them pretty well. And yeah, as you say as well, both these Marauders obviously have a bunch of high slots for utility. They can whack Newts in there, which is obviously very effective against, you know, if you come up against a Hyperion or a Vindicator or whatever, something cap-reliant, you can shut them down pretty easily. Um, yeah. But this is going to be the end of the road here for, well, not the end of the road, they're going to drop down to the lower bracket, but in this match, uh, Castabouts, unfortunately, are going to be shut out. Yep. I mean, one of the uh, handful of new player-oriented alliances that are in the tournament, the other ones, of course, being Brave and Pandemic Horde. Uh, Brave having a much longer tournament history uh, as well, much like Caster Bouts. Um, but the thing about Cast uh, is on TQ is that they pull from NPC corps uh, a lot of the time. So uh, something that you might see, and in fact, we do see some members uh, have from this team uh, being technically mercenaries from those NPC corps as well, who haven't quite taken the step forward uh, into the rest of the game. So it's a great starting place for people on TQ. But when you have this kind of revolving door of people moving past uh, later, you not don't have a lot of institutional knowledge continuing through the team yeah i think that's a really good point but i think castabouts is providing something really really valuable which is it's sort of an entry point for players who maybe do want to try and get some alliance tournament experience but are, you know maybe not established in their own particular player court maybe if they think you know if they join you know if you join brave you're competing with i don't know 11 billion other players for a slot in a 10-man team whereas here you you may have a better shot at, at shot at actually getting some alliance tournament experience before you then move on um or indeed don't Yep. Moving down to the lower bracket, uh, they will be facing, if I remember correctly, they will be facing Exodus. Uh, so uh, not a matchup you want to really get into in the lower bracket, but one that they're going to have to take anyway. We're going to send it back to the desk uh, before we bring up your team versus Big Yikes. Guys, stop being casual. They're really bad. We should not lose anybody to this. Okay, warp off. Warp off. Take the fleet warp. Everybody warp off. This is really, really bad execution. I'm very disappointed. Because 
Crush our enemies. Your dams are completely damped out. Crush. I'm damped out. I'm damped out. Get on that chain, boys. Eat your reps. Yeah. Everything damped. I've not been able to look at some of the things in the game. I'm jammed. No forks given there with a commanding 100 to 0 victory over the castabouts um, in uh, just pretty much excellently flown by no forks given there uh, to secure themselves that victory. Now, Black Park Pirate, that looked like a, a bit of a f what we used to call a fly killer setup that castabouts brought there. What is a fly killer setup? And um, you, you said that maybe that wasn't the most optimal fly killer setup? No, uh, well, what we we actually just saw from Lock Range Enjoyers what is probably now a more modern one, and then it's cool because we got to see it work, and then we got to see it not work. And um, a Flykiller setup is like basically set up to be able to take out small ships very very quickly. Uh, you know, I think uh, if you've been watching AT ads since forever ago, then you'd have seen the like original boom headshot ad, um, which I believe was Hydra Reloaded. Uh, where they basically had a bunch of artillery ships just alphing things off the grid every single cycle. So it doesn't work quite as well anymore. There's been a lot of game changes regarding like signature tracking, etc. But what you saw instead is they're still using artillery ships, but now we're using a lot more like railgun ships. So uh, Executor Navies is kind of the big one that we just saw one match ago. Uh, this specific one, we saw them try to do it with Hurricane Fleet Issues, Scythe Fleet Issues with Rapid Lights, which is a little weird, and Orthrasis. So we got this like kind of a combination of a rapid light kite with artillery slepners and it or artillery hurricane fleet issues and it just didn't work like there wasn't enough application or damage um from any of it it's like you kind of almost had it on one end you almost had it on the other end and then at the end you just kind of got rolled and also they brought a navy dominix which uh <laughs> i asked you i was like has a single navy dominix won yet and it's an at tradition where navy dominixes never win ever because they look really good on paper but then they actually aren't and it seems like we may still be continuing that, even though they have been buffed significantly. I still believe in the potato. I think it's going to pull one in for sure. I think it's going. I think it must do this year. Like it's been buffed enough, and we're seeing a lot more of them. It used to be so rare you would see one uh, that you knew that whoever was bringing this probably just saw the numbers on paper and went, "Look how high the DPS on this ship is! Wow, how could we possibly lose?" And then they lost because the ship is pretty garbage. Uh, but now it's been buffed. It's actually like reasonable. So. It could win. It could happen. Someone do it, please. Uh, win. Prove us wrong. I love being proven wrong. But speaking of ships and new ships, uh, let's check in with CCP Aurora and find out a little bit about the new ships in the Uprising expansion. You've already seen eight new ships released last month, and with Uprising expansion, we're expanding the selection of Navy ships even further with a new set of Navy destroyers for each faction, as well as Navy dreadnoughts. We chose these ships because they'll fill some gaps in the existing Navy lineup, as well as creating new and diverse engagements in the faction warfare ecosystem. With the dreadnoughts, we wanted to give players something that was really aspirational, a large goal to work towards, something really special, and something that'll help to mix up the capital ecosystem elsewhere in the game. We want to find new and unique uses for these ships in the EVE Online ecosystem that isn't just going to step on the toes of other existing vessels. Each uh, faction had their own, like, kind of like mini guidelines uh, regarding that. The Phoenix is, uh, for example, a ship that uh, needed to be updated. The base Phoenix itself is getting all the uh, new textures and, and model pieces that the uh, Navy one has, minus some details that we just uniquely made for the for the Navy version. For every uh, animation or every state the ship can go in, we've added more animations incorporating uh, VFX. So like if something is moving, there's a really good chance that uh, some VFX are involved in the end and uh, are highlighting that. I can't wait to see these ships get into your hands, see what you do with them, and look at the deaths on Z-Kill. Thank you to CCP Aurora there. Uh, those are some incredible new ships. The new Navy Dreadnoughts are absolutely fantastic. I remember when I saw 
the, the video of that Moros Navy for the first time. Just such an angry boy going all red and smoky. Just, oh, they're so cool. I can't wait to see some people using them on TQ uh, and losing them. I imagine they're going to be quite expensive. Uh, there's going to be some, some pretty dank kill mails coming from that. Now, CCBB, uh, you were obviously well known for leading uh, like public fleets and roams and things like that on your stream. And I, I saw on Zedkill uh, that you took what looked to be a bunch of CCPers out uh, one day on a, on a roam into Pochvin. Uh, tell us about that. How was that? It was actually just an impromptu uh, thing that uh, I was asked to just do something fun with them. Um, I ended up going into Pochvin to, to just mine and wait for, for content to come to us. Um, I've been doing this a little bit every now and then, going into Pochvin in mining ships, just actually in vectors <laughs> mining. And uh, you just sit there, wait for content to come to you. It's a very different than hunting around like I, like I'm used to. How was it like doing that with uh, like a bunch of CCPers compared to say like on your stream with all the all the players and things like that? Uh, it's I mean I've flown with CCP a lot over the years as a player first, um, and taking there was a little different. It wasn't like uh, we were streaming this; we were just having fun in the office for an hour uh, for for a reason I'm not going to talk about. But <laughs> <laughs> it was a uh, it was a blast, and uh, I hope I can do more of that. I want to yeah. see more CCPers in space. Yeah, exactly. More CCP targets for us to shoot at, please. Um, now, let's quick take a quick look at our next match because we're going to that in just a few minutes. Uh, Hidden Leaf Village Ninja Assassin uh, Esports Squad Team, whatever they're called, uh, so many names uh, going up against Big Yikes. Uh, so, uh, Hidden Leaf Ninja Village banning out the Absolution Curse Armageddon Navy issue uh, and Big Yikes banning out the Vindicator Stormbringer Drekovac. Uh, I think this is the first time I have seen uh, a Stormbringer and a Drekovic ban. Blackbird Pirate, what do you make of that? Uh, I think you're right. I think also with the Absolution. So there's a lot of a lot of interesting bans here. Uh, maybe not necessarily good. You know, we'll see who wins, and then we'll decide. Oh yes, they are geniuses, or they are uh, not. But yeah, I don't understand a Stormbringer ban. Like I understand, you know, conceptually you can use a Stormbringer to take out rep drones or dps drones like it is kind of a counter drone ship um it's very very good at that but i don't know if it's good enough at that to be worth banning uh, i think we've seen it twice today and neither time i would say it was like particularly good like there it could have been good they could have used it in some way or another but it just didn't seem to have actually done anything uh direct ban same kind of situation like drekovex aren't a particularly strong alliance tournament ship um they have all of like the weaknesses of a Lashak and none of their strengths. Like they don't have a mass amount of tank. They don't have a bunch of high t slots to do interesting utility stuff with. Uh, well, they, they do, but they can't like do the same things uh, that a Drek or a Lashak can. So, I don't know. I mean, sometimes you see teams like do these bans because in their internal testing they've said, "Oh no, we get countered by this," and then in hindsight, it's like, "Well, your internal testing said that, but the other, you know, ninety-five percent of the player base." don't use those ships because they're bad and you're losing to them because you're worse. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. I'm, like I said, kind of confused by it. Yeah, I'm just very interested to find out what comp is counted by a Stormbringer enough that you'd want to ban it. Although sometimes uh, teams that have kind of generated their own meta that's a bit out of the out of the blue uh, can go up against a team that has a more un like established understanding of the meta and win because they bring something completely off the wall that the team, the experienced team that is you know doing everything correct, they're following the meta, they're doing things, bringing the right ships, they get beat by some kind of like almost cheese comp. It happens um, just because that team has developed their own meta and the other team doesn't really know how to deal with it. And it's one of the ways sometimes you can uh, almost separate like the really good teams. Like They'll land on grid and see something completely crazy um, and they'll still be able to, to react and, and win. Uh, so we're just waiting f to get confirmation that the teams have landed on grid. I've told... Uh, I'm told they are in system. And we have a flagship on grid uh, for one of the teams. I'm not sure who at this point. Um, Blackbird Pirates, who are you going to put your uh, your virtual e-money behind here? Oh, my, my virtual e-money. Um, I'm going to put it behind Big Yikes because I'm going to trust that they are actually like the wrinkliest of brains here. <laughs> and they're like, yes, we have figured out a setup that can only lose to a Stormbringer. I think I have to put my vote on uh, Baldrums. I just want to want to see there comes here there comes and uh, I I really hope that they win. Well, it's time to find out. So let's go to the arena for Hidden Leaf Village Ninja Assassin Esports Squad versus Big X. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the arena. And 
obviously as a member of Hidden Leaf Village, I'm hoping they win, but especially so because 15 bill or so of my virtual e-money is in that bar guest fit. So fingers crossed. <laughs> Meanwhile, big yikes, French contention of locals primary coming out and uh, trying to do what they can uh, up against Hinley Village Ninja Assassin Squad Esports. The team is silent and we see Hinley Village start to kite back at the moment. I would assume this is a rapid heavy bar guest. I hadn't gotten a chance to look at the other ship models, though, uh, as this Balgorn and Tempest Fleet issue seem to be the core for big yikes. Yeah, they started putting some damage on Asuka in the Hyena there and he takes a huge chunk through shield, so it's going to be up to the work of... Um, Neo in the Logi, he has flown Logi every single scrim, extremely competent Logi pilot, I can say that for him. Um, and he does indeed manage to catch Asuka just on time. Of course, shield Logi said the reps happen at the start of the cycle, so as long as he's got you locked, he should, hopefully, as long as he's awake, um, be, able to, be able to keep him safe. But there's not much damage being applied the other direction at the moment. Yep. And if we take a look at the attack bar, it's completely zero for Hidden Leaf Village. They're biding their time, looking for an opening now, moving towards this Astarte of Kit Kat, uh, the captain for Big Yikes. I mean, they've got dual Logi frags, and it looks like Hidden Leaf Village, I mean, we saw a lot of times in feeders, they went for this rush setup, now they're in a shield kite setup with this bar guest. Rabbit Heavy Cleep should be able to go through this Astarte. It just matters uh, what Big Yikes is able to get out of this trade. Yeah, both these teams, I think, are playing sort of quite controlled comps here where um, you're, not, you're not aiming to make a huge impact in the start of the match. You're okay to sort of probe it out and see how the match progresses, what happens, try and make progress. But this Balgon of Aria Yatalila does try and burn in there and try and web something down on this kite comp. But I think the Hyena of Azuka actually got webs on him in return. And the shield kite comp is actually now making their way back around the arena. And it's looking to be pretty difficult here for this uh, big yikes team to actually pin anything down. Threat of Vengeance and the Navy Drake, though, has now been webbed by that Balgorn, but just like that, he's out from underneath the webs. These hyena webs doing the work that needs to be done to get this Balgorn, which is the big tackle ship from Big Yikes, uh, away from his team. He is being primary, but as you mentioned, the reps coming in instantly from the Scimitar, it's very hard to hit a hyena with battleships. Unfortunately, it does look like Dreaded Vengeance in the Drake Navy issue has been caught here by these Balgorn webs. Um, and now you see the, the Balgorn closing in on him, the Org Navy's coming in, the Tempest fleet's on him as well, and Hidden Leaf Village have just abandoned him. He's he's lost to his fate. There's, obviously, you can't save him out of, out of this situation here. You can't bail him out. They're just going to have to accept that loss and hope to make trade in return, and there's not too much going on still so far for the Hidden Leaf side. Yeah, I mean, they've got some damage on this jacked up here. Uh, Shendori fine. <laughs> oh, just gets deleted uh, from the face of the earth, but still a jacked off for a Drake Navy. Not a trade you want to be making if you're Hidden Leaf Village. But at the same time, uh, right, you still have the kite set up. You still just have to keep on keeping on trying to kill what you can from this low end. They're onto the Confessor now of Jita, and uh, he should not be able to hold through these uh, Deacon Thalia reps. But as I'm saying that, he actually is uh, repping through it at the moment might see some reloads coming in from the Suddenly Village side. Yeah, it's not it's for sure not over because you've lost the Navy Drake, but obviously it's not a good looking points. But I think Hidden Leaf Village's attitude here is switched to try and take out these low end first and then hope to control the big end just through its speed. So they're trying to deal with the confessor, they're trying to deal with the Magus. They're still just sort of probing perhaps Beltram is on reload and they're just waiting to unleash another volley onto what they deem to be a vulnerable target here. Yeah, they want to get that Confessor. They want to get this tackle off the grid, uh, make way uh, for their team to just kite it out and uh, live to win. Uh, we saw this Astarte of Kit Kat being the primary off the start. He has not been touched at all uh, since that. The attack bar is anemic right now from both of these teams as they continue to poke and prod and try to find the opening that they need to win the match. Yeah, it's just a slow controlled match. I think they're switching onto the Magus now again. I've seen him just take another chunk. He's going into armor. They're just going to try and see if they can volley through him. Of course, they've got Rapid Lights, Osprey Navy, Osprey Navy, Orthrus, and the Bargus with Rapid Heavy. So they have got enough quick damage here to shoot out. And they do get rid of those Magus. And that could be critical now that they've got rid of those links. Obviously, everything else is going to tank significantly less. It may have had skirmish links, which was helping the Balgorn with, you know, web range, with, uh, you know, speed. Yeah, but look at this. Baltrum has been webbed by the Balgorn of Arya. This could be a mistake uh, being made potentially or just good piloting from hidden, or from a big yikes to get on top of this bar guest. And this is a shield bar guest. It's got a scimitar on him. He'll have some repping power, especially because it's a flagship. But at the same time, if they can get this Tempest Fleet issue, if they can get this Astarte and this Exec Navy on top of this bar guest, they have a lot of damage that should be able to actually get through uh, this potential officer rep or at the very at least a, a dead space rep uh, from Baltram. 
Yeah, I think it's going to be an X-type rep on the bar, I guess, but they are actually breaking through Kit Kat and they're starting now. They've realized they can't afford any more time just chewing through the support. You know, the bar guest is caught. They need to clear this damage as quickly as they can. Bar guest going into low shield here, 30% shield. Astarte in the Kit Kat is, sorry, Astarte, Kit Kat in the Astarte is going down into low armor. He's starting to bleed hull, but I don't know if they kill him. Is it going to be enough? There's yeah, still two battleships alive. These dual logic frags doing exactly what they need to do at the moment. Beltram, he's back up to 50% shields. I mean, he's got the natural shield regen around that 33% mark, but they're breaking through it. He's now down almost out of shields, and this Astarte My Kit Kat keeps on My holding. Money. Beltram, there's no way for him to survive. He's now in half armor, and he will die. This flagship getting caught by Arya in the Balgorn, and that should decide the match uh, for Big Yikes. Yeah, this is absolutely disastrous for my team and my wallet because... There's no damage left now on the Hidden Life team. They've they've got three rapid light boats, and that's basically it up against two battleships. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh -oh. Kat living to win. One rapid heavy clip. That's all you have to deal with this Astarte. They tried it at the start of the match. They didn't get him. And now trying again. They bought him into hull, but not enough in time. The flag Bargas goes down. I'm excited to take a look at that fit uh, later. But with that, as you mentioned, not a whole lot of damage left for Hinley Village. They have, uh, I mean, look at that attack bar. It is just massive for Big Yikes compared to Hinley Village. And uh, unfortunately for them, they're going to be knocked down to the lower bracket. Yeah, and this is a strong performance from, uh, from Big Yikes here. I think this is not a comp that we've seen too much of today so far, obviously with the Balgon being banned so frequently. Um, but it's proved to be very powerful here with the Astarte. I, I'm a big fan of the Astarte, to be honest. Uh, I like the ship a lot. I think it does it's good projection. It's obviously links that's pretty tanky but this is now just going to be a cleanup job here um and yeah i mean a strong shine from big yikes hidden leaf are going to go down to the lower bracket and face the loser of the next match which is going to be between fancy pants and brave collective yeah, and that one is a match I'm looking forward to as well, not just as a uh, co-captain of the Brave team, but also because uh, that is they were scrim partners up until the point uh, where uh, the brackets were drawn. Fancy Pants and Brave had scrims quite a bit, so they have inside knowledge of what the other team likes to bring, potentially, and that plays into uh, the metagaming that they're going to do against each other. I'm really excited for that matchup. Uh, still, uh, this was uh, a team that a lot of people didn't really know too much about out going into the tournament. They knew local is primary split into two different alliances, Big Yikes being the French contingent and Lock Range Enjoyers being the English speaking contingent. And uh, Yintan did some interviews uh, with the Big Yikes captain uh, before the tournament. And apparently there were some choice words uh, to be said there, maybe not an amicable breakup, but either way, uh, if both those teams win their next matches, they're going to be facing each other in the upper bracket. Yeah, and of course, when a team splits up like that, there's going to be institutional knowledge that's carried over from, from you know, both, both sides are going to gain it. Um, but it's always difficult to determine who was sort of the core of the team, who was actually behind generating these comps, generating this theory crafting. But, I mean, we still lock, saw Lock Range Enjoyers win fairly comfortably over Exodus earlier on in the day, and Big Yikes here uh, winning it themselves fairly comfortably. So, you know, it seems to be an even split in terms of theory crafting takeaway from the local's primary sort of breakup. I mean, and as we see, like, not a lot of ships are dying at the moment, but both teams can just kind of, or not both teams, uh, Big Yikes can just kind of hold back. They killed the Flag Bar Guest, and there just is no damage left from Hidden Leaf Village Ninja Assassin Squad Esports. The team is silent, uh, and they're just plinking away at each other. Maybe some uh, kills will happen, but we might uh, just head up into a points victory for uh, Big Yikes. Yeah, and I think this is actually going to be the first points victory of the day. Every other match so far has ended with one team scoring 100. But these, as I said at the start, these two teams both bring in fairly sort of slow controlled comps, trying to probe around and poke out. And it is going to end in a big yikes victory, but it's not going to go to 100. But of course, they got the loot from the Vargas, which is what they were really, really interested in here. Of course, the Scimitar, the Orthrus, all that stuff, you know, it's just tech too fit. Nobody cares. But the Vargas is the real, that's the real juice that they were looking to drop. And with that... Uh, we have one minute left in the match. Sorry, 40 seconds left in the match. And uh, they lose another ship. I believe that was the Osprey Navy issue uh, being taken down. Big Yikes didn't make it a completely clean victory. They did uh, lose a couple ships, the Magus, the Jackdaw. But other than that, have flown incredibly well. And uh, I'm excited to see how the desk determine or how the desk analyzes this match. Yeah, I think what we've seen here is uh, sort of a justification for why teams are banning the Balgorn so frequently, because this ship is damn powerful. It's very, very good. 
it is very, very good. You got the webs. You can't make it a flagship. Can't have the officer webs or the uh, uh, extra range newts from officer dead space newts on it. But still, uh, having that extra range webs on a battleship that is so tanky and relatively fast for an armor battleship can be so powerful. And you just need to get one target and blows the match right open. We're going to send it back to the desk. When we return, it'll be Fancy Pants Alliance versus Brave Collective. Connected. Channel switched. Well, it would have been an easy fight, right? But guess what, dude? I'm not a seeing and people can't get their f it together! Isk, uh, I'm sure the Basilisk will be uh, rather heartbroken about that. He's lost uh, a whole chunk of his investment there. And of course, losing your flagship Argus means that you cannot bring it again in the future. Uh, and that means the, the rest of the tournament is just harder. Like, you can no longer dodge bans. You can no longer threaten even to dodge bans. Uh, people know that these guys have already fed that ship. So rather unfortunate for them. Uh, it's, they're still in the tournament. This is a double elimination tournament, so uh, they can still fight through the loser's bracket and see if they can get back up to the grand final. But if they do so, it will be Sans Flag Barghest. Now, Black Bart Pirate, uh, what happened there? Because it looked to me that that Barghest was caught. Um, but Barghest are pretty fast and kitey. Like, what happened? It's, it's hard to say... Uh exactly what happened there because i don't want to be too toxic to somebody that just lost a 22 billion isk battleship as i'm sure they're very sad as is baza um but baltram did get tackled um he got grappled which that doesn't really do all that much but then the balgorn webs were able to kind of catch up to him and the thing is is like a bargast is a pretty fast ship compared to a balgorn uh, but, you know, thinking about it, like, it's really easy to say, well, how do you get caught when your ship is, like, significantly faster than the other one? Well, the arena is a sphere, so you do have to kind of, like, you can get cut off, and I think it's more more likely to say that, like, the Balgorn piloting, like, the Confessor piloting, the tackle on Big Yikes' side was actually very, very good, and as soon as that Vargas got caught, like, that was it. Um, I do think, uh, actually, actually, B had a comment about... Uh, target calling a little bit and like missiles and you know over what was it tunnel visioning yeah i think they focused the uh the confessor a little bit too long um we saw that in practice a couple of times where confessor just way tankier than what people expect it to be if you clip half your clip into it and you have to go and reload you're kind of done for i think they wasted about a minute at least shooting the confessor and uh, i think that was what lost the the match for them yeah, so you mentioned clipping there. Um, can we just can you just explain a little bit about like what that means in this context? In this context, it means using your rapid light, which is kind of a preloaded damage system where you shoot a lot of missiles and you have to go and reload for a long, long time. And in a ten minute match, that is an eternity when you're having to reload again. Yeah, in fact, if you watch the uh, uh, arena um, scene, you will see that there's bars above each team uh, for attack, defense, and control. And in fact, the attack bar, uh, we were watching it as the uh, Astarte was about to go into hull, and we were waiting to see if they were going to clip. And you can tell when rapid light and rapid heavy ships clip because you see the uh, a potential attack bar just jump down briefly as they go into reload. Then it comes back up um, once they've uh, once they've started reloading. But you can tell that that is a ship that has just clipped, and we were like, "Can they break this before they clip?" But five seconds later, we saw it happen. We're like, "Oh, that's it! Like they can't do this. They have to try and save the bar guess." But unfortunately, it was not to be. Um, so uh, rather unfortunate for them. Uh, as I said, they are uh, they're going to be seen again uh, later on this weekend. 
Uh, but for now, let's look forward to our, our next match, which is going to be Fancy Pants Alliance versus Brave Collective. So let's take a look at the bands uh, that we have here. So Fancy Pants Alliance, uh, banning the Eos, Bargast, and Gila, um, which is, again, somewhat of a standard set of bands at this point. Brave Collective banning the Curse, the Scimitar, and the Guardian. Uh, bar anything su like super interesting jump out here for you? Yeah, both the uh, both the Gila ban and the Guardian ban are really interesting. So on the Fancy Pants side, they've basically signaled to Brave that they really, 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 really don't want to see drones. Uh, we did see a drone set up by, I believe, Darkseid earlier that did not have Eos's in it. Um, and it did have Gila's, but they died very, very fast. Uh, if you get rid of both the Eos and the Gila, you're kind of only left with like Ishtar's, I guess, technically Navy Dominix's, uh, regular Dominix's, and like Stratios's. And a lot of those ships, um, and like Vector Navies, but a lot of those have actually been nerfed over the last couple of years to not have the ability to field as many drones as they used to have. So Fancy Pants is basically saying, please don't send drones against us. Uh, Brave banning the Guardian is a little strange. I think that um, traditionally we actually see much more Eos's than Guardians. And in general, most people consider the, uh, not, uh, yeah, Oneros's than Guardians. Uh, most people consider the Oneros to be a much superior armor logistic ship. So that one I kind of question. like, why did you ban a Guardian instead of an Oneros? I guess we will find out at some point in you know the next <laughs> five to ten minutes, but yeah, it's a little weird. Let's uh, let's take a quick look at the uh, brave team history in the alliance tournament uh, and say seven zero to um, Dunk Dinkle, of course, who has just stepped down as the leader of Brave Collective, handing it over to Jinx to care. Brave Collective, uh, they've flown with forty eight different pilots in the past. Um, Yuki uh, Yukiko, sorry, uh, was a, a rather famous per person. He flew uh, with the CSM, uh, captained with them, and of course we had Catalia Mist as well, aka, AKA CCP Aurora, uh, who's pl uh, flown as well. So they've done all right in, uh, in the past. They've won more matches than they've lost. Uh, Fear Vina, one of our casters in Brave, uh, assures me that Brave are going to do nothing but lose this tournament. Uh, so we are waiting to see. They've previously won against a bunch of good teams, to be honest. Uh, I mean, Weekend Warriors, a decent team. Band Apart, pretty good team. Uh, Test Alliance, please ignore it. At that time, Alliance 2015, we're a good team. And as we're Thermal Dynamics. But I believe we are ready to go to the arena. Teams are landing. Uh, so we're not ready to go to the arena just yet. So let's have a let's have a quick prediction. So Black Bar Pirate, uh, do you believe... Fear when he tells us that Brave are, in his own words, garbage, or do you think that we're going to see a good Brave team here? I don't believe a single thing that Fear says. <laughs> um, I honestly, Brave has consistently been at least some degree of competent in the Alliance tournament, regardless of how they are on TQ, which they're not bad right now, but like sometimes they are horrible. But Brave's generally pretty decent at the Alliance tournament. I'm over UCCPB. Uh, is it Fancy Pants? Are the Pants fancy enough in this case, or is it Brave Collective, do you think? Now, even though I like their loco, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Brave, I think, is going to take this. Um, they have definitely grown over the years. I've seen it myself in fighting them over multiple years. They've gotten a lot better. They're no longer Brave newbies, so I think they're just Brave now. There you go. So, Caster's Curse potentially in full effect here as we go to the arena to see if Fancy Pants Alliance can take it over Brave Collective. Welcome back to the arena, and we are seeing Brave Collective bring in a triple battleship comp here with uh, a bunch of battleships that we've seen a couple times in the day and a couple times banned. The Armageddon Navy has actually snuck through the ban phase here again, partnered with the Lashak and Tempest Fleet, so it's a fairly standard triple BS armor core here in Fear. What are you thinking about Fancy Pants? They brought Shield Rush. It's armor control versus Shield Rush, and this time around, it's worth mentioning Dujek and the Armageddon Navy. That is a gun Armageddon Navy. It's got lasers on it. doesn't have rapid heavy missile launchers. Grant you, you can fit both to the ship. We'll see how that one plays out in this particular tournament. Still has that powerful newts available to him. But Shield Rush, we've seen at this tournament, it's done particularly well against a lot of these comps. Look at the attack bar from Fancy Pants. It is absolutely massive compared to Braves. Yeah, that's a really good spot, actually, about the guns on the Getter Navy, because obviously everyone's focus has been, you know, the Armageddon Navy now. It can fit missiles. And I think, personally, that is potentially the stronger configuration in this sort of uh, setting where you're focused on taking down a particular ship and then moving on to the next target. And I think Rapid Heavy's burst of damage gives you that, that sort of power and, and that win condition, as it were. Um, but yeah, a, a gun Getter Navy, I don't think we've seen one of those before, but it will at least diversify the damage types. Of course, the Lashak is... Uh, I believe thermal explosive and the Geta Navy is going to be EM. So any reactives on the other side, but of course they've come against a shield comp, so that is effectively moot. 
Yep, Shield Rush from the side of Fancy Pants moving in forward. Cold Fuzz and the Muller going to be playing screen for the rest of Brave as the battleships try to kite away. They've got some damage onto Reroar Jenkins in this Scythe fleet issue, and he is diving uh, pretty low into shield already, but the Thalia of Aryan Felu uh, appears to have been caught potentially by Fancy Pants. Yeah, this is at the start just looking like a, a very similar to the match between Odin's and Laserhawks at the end of the the feeder tournament here and this Maller is doing the perfect job exactly as he should as it has happened in that match cold fuzz sort of staying back as his team burns away and just trying to tackle something down i think the slepnir of jeffrey might have got past him i think he went for him and he managed to get past him but he's instead managed to scram on, scram on zarthal instead so he is keeping this slepnir uh sort of in no man's land which is exactly what you want to do with this Maller because that means the slepnir then can't really project anything except the Maller. and in a rush comp like this you want all of your DPS applied to the same target at the same time and just with break things down very, very quickly. And if this Slepner is stuck in the middle of nowhere, he obviously can't really do that. Yeah, it's a higher burden of execution when you play the Kite versus the Rush Shadup. But if you have the ability to screen off the Rush, it can go well in your favor. Simsuit was being primaried by Brave for a little bit, but it looks like they've swapped onto Lish Sindolos in the Nighthawk. The captain for Fancy Pants Alliance is now the primary for Brave. As Alifel and Sipple goes low, then it looks like she's in defensive mode, so uh, she will be difficult to kill. And this Maller of Cold Fuzz has been holding this Slepnir of Zarthal off of the team and the attack bar even though uh they've got a really big one they can't use it all at the same time this nighthawk of lish now into very low shields yeah this is really not looking good for fancy pants because when you're in a situation like this like i said you need all of your rush to be in the same place on the same target and now that they ignored the maller at the start they said okay they sort of committed to the fight they said okay zarthal's a lost cause but if he's a lost cause he's basically as good as dead so at this point in the match although they're both alive fancy pants are effectively down a Slepnir until they can kill off this Mala, but the rest of the team already burned in onto Brave, so they would now have to turn around and go back to deal with the Mala, and then of course that would give Brave Collective more time to kite around, which is exactly what they want to do. So I feel like this is a critical error here from Fancy Pants in just accepting the loss of the Slepnir from, from being in a useful position. And the Scythe fleet issue gets deleted, or Sever fleet issue, excuse me, gets deleted uh, from Brave killing off the side of Fancy Pants. And now they're on the Scythe fleet issue. This is something that we saw a lot earlier on in the tournament from a lot of good teams. They take out the Navy cruisers first before the battle cruisers and the command ships. Brave decide they can kill a Nighthawk, and then they're right back onto these Navy battle cruisers. One remaining, and there are high DPS for points. The Scythe fleet issue going down very, very low. Remember, only T1 Frigate Lodge, this Bantam in the Burst, they can't keep them up against this Lashad. Back, and it looks like Brave should be able to win this match from here on out. Yeah, they are still going to have three command ships when this Mala does finally go down. I think they are going to finally break him, but I don't think it's going to be enough against the three battleships that are left, plus the, you know, the Tech 2 Logi frigates. But yeah, I think, as you say, killing off those faction cruisers is critical because they don't really have projection. They need to be on top of you, which makes them prime targets. They don't have Tech 2 resists. So the ratio of DPS that you can get from them in terms of how long it takes to kill them is very, very favorable to just look at them first and wipe them off the grid. And now Jeffrey in the in the other Slepnir is going to take chunks. And I think he's actually going to die before Zarthal even manages to get on the scene here. And this, Zarthal yeah. finally killed Cold Fuzz, but that Mauler did exactly what it needed to do, playing the Kite versus the Shield Rush setup. You screen one, they did not turn on him. As you mentioned, a big mistake. Jeffrey goes down. Zarthal's finally into the fight, but now where's the rest of his team? Yeah, it's a really good read on the situation from Brave here at the start of the match. Of course, in Alliance tournament settings, matches tend to snowball and the target calling and the objective calling of what you want to do, what your what your different ships need to do in that first minute, that first two minutes, is so, so critical. And for Brave to say, Cold Fuzz, you need to stop one of these Slepnirs. And he does his job perfectly. He just absolutely pins down Zarthal, stops him from committing, com helping doing anything in this match, really, until it's basically over. Fantastic job from Brave here. Really, really good. Yeah, and this is something I think a lot of people might not expect from the, the Brave team. Traditionally, a team that has built uh, itself up on these kind of lower execution, higher meta uh, style of comps, but uh, and a team that's been averse to kiting in the past. We saw this time they're able to do that. They've brought up uh, a lot of pilots that have been here since the AO. Uh, a lot of pilots that people might not recognize from Days of Glory past. We don't have John Lee Lang. We don't have uh, Yuki Kokami, but at the same time, good pilots on this team and uh now they're going to be facing big yikes in the next round that's going to be an exciting one to watch yeah of course i think the roster is bolstered here by the addition of some mercenaries as well of course k baluta very experienced pilot turned up last year don't think he did particularly well but you know he's got a to alliance tournament experience um 
and yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I, maybe you can offer some more input into who is sort of the theory crafting and target calling and, you know, like the, the uh, I'm leader not of the team. That. No one, no one <laughs> getting poached from Brave today. Uh, <laughs> Still, uh, I mean, bringing mercenaries online, I mean, we see some members, uh, technically mercenaries from uh, the uh, Alaphil, for example. She's from uh, Brave United, so technically a mercenary, even though she's part of the uh, greater Brave family. Um, and I'm really excited to see how the team does in the tournament. I know I was downplaying our potential for success in the pre-show. Uh, PsyOps worked. We're, 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 we're going to go to the moon, I swear. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, if if this match is anything to go by, I've got good expectations, honestly, because it's it's these sort of fundamentals that can help get a team through the early stages, even if you haven't quite got the right grasp of the meta or, you know, you haven't got the perfect comps. As we saw earlier in the day, I mean, in the very first match, we saw Truth, whatever they're called, Justice League, bring what basically to me at the outset looked like a kitchen sink kind of comp. Um, and just through target calling and execution, um, bring out a commanding victory. If you can master those aspects of target calling and just identifying what your comp wants to do and what you need to do in a certain matchup to win the match, uh, that's a very, very powerful skill to have. And with that, Brave Collective are going to take it home 100 to 8. And after this, uh, I believe we are going to start to see teams eliminated. So we've got three more matches today before we send it back, after we send it back to the desk. Um, and yeah, one of three of those teams are going to be going home. Yeah, we actually lost a bet as CCP collectively, uh, so that's why that Alliance logo is in the game. Of course, you could change your Alliance by leaving, but that would be kind of a jerk move. That kind like, of, oh, you don't like it? Ah, just leave. This, this logo sucks. I'm going to go join. Welcome to Eve Pandora. 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 Brave Collective taking a commanding victory there uh, over Fancy Pants Alliance. And I knew it. I said this during the tier list stream that we did. Brave is going to be good. Fear tried to t uh, convince us otherwise. I didn't believe him. I was right to not believe him. Uh, they're going to be a strong team uh, this year for sure. They, they flew very well there. They had a good comp. They executed Fancy Pants. are not a bad team at all. Uh, so being able to pull out a commanding victory right there like that makes me uh, have uh, high hopes for the Brave Collective team. Now, I'm joined uh, once again on the desk by uh, some incredible people uh, and Nash Cadaver. Uh, Nash, how are you today? I'm very good, thank you. It's uh, getting tired towards the end of the day now, but we're getting through it. Yeah, it certainly is a, a long day, especially standing on your feet. Uh, I didn't realize how small you were, Nash. It's a bad posture. <coughs> oh, I I'm see. actually really tall, but... <laughs> now, Nash, we've been doing this uh, for, for a very long time uh, as part of EVNT. Uh, Take me right back to when it all started, the very first EVNT event here Oof. in Nottingham. Uh, I'll skip uh, all the boring details, but yes, it's been, a, it's been a fair few years. We're just trying to reminisce how long it's been, but we've been involved with the Alliance tournament since, I think, 8011, so that must be at least seven years ago, right? Um, so it started with, uh, with Bay RJ, my partner in crime, who's uh, continued this uh, and still does it, you know, especially he's in a great position now in the, the college that he teaches at. Um, where we now get to use some of the, the students that he teaches in the esports uh, scene, which, yeah, the, the team has been absolutely incredible. Other than the EVNT team, we're, we're about 15 strong here today. Uh, on top of that, we've got about 10 students who've like literally made this uh, a dream today, I think. Best, best production I've experienced so far. 
Yeah, it's been super smooth. Like um, these these students have, have come in, they've helped set up all the lighting, all the cameras, they've been doing all the framing, uh, they've been doing all the heavy lifting. I just stand here and they spent like about four hours on Friday, like setting up all these lights. There's so many lights. It's such a challenge to light this room because we have a curved, gigantic video wall. Um, and no matter how you set things up, there's like shadows and like blows out the wall or makes us not bright enough. But they've done a really great job, uh, like, like making everything look fantastic. Um, and there's like over 30 people working on this production yeah. right now. So yeah. uh, obviously we have about maybe 25 people here yep. in the venue yep. uh, doing all sorts of things, runners, sound, uh, audio, lighting, uh, like all the tech stuff. Uh, we've got people editing those those little replay clips you're seeing, yep. stats, uh, refs, um, we've got camera host. operators, there's a host, we've got some <laughs> amazing desk people as well. Uh, and then of course we've got our online casters. Uh, so there's over 30 people bringing this this whole production to you uh, which is which is incredible if, uh, if you compare it to where we start you know the, yeah. the whole uh, doing it from the bedroom yeah this is a bit different <laughs> exactly and ccpb how is this sort of production compared to like you know you've been doing your your huge twitch streams at home like as a one man show obviously like what's it like coming into like these huge studio setups i was very impressed coming here i i didn't know what to expect when i was coming here i hadn't done any research on how many people would be here so i was blown away when i was like oh well, there's 30 40 people here uh, I expected it to be like, you know, five, six, seven of us. And then it's just this gigantic, cool studio with a screen. And I was seeing videos of it coming here. I was like, okay, okay. This is a lot bigger than I thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's awesome. There's so many people who've made this possible. Uh, and it, for me, just like, thank you to everyone who's been involved to make this happen. Uh, Nash, you've, like I say, you've been involved in this from the very start. Um, and just like looking back, like what's been like the, the highlights over the last sort of like eight years of doing this? Um, it's always the production pr production days are always the best. Uh, I know the period leading up to the Alliance tournament are incredibly intensive, and there's uh, an incredible amount of prep that goes into it. And um, uh, I've been very fortunate to to be, you know, working these projects with Bay, and he's been for the last three AT, he's been working very hard in the background and in the lead up to these projects to make this all happen. Um, General Stargazer, or sorry, uh, CSP Zealus has uh, has done an a massive amount of work to make this one happen um, and uh, I'm very fortunate to just show up and uh, and come on a day and uh, do do a couple of bits and uh, manage the floor a little bit and uh, try and keep everybody happy so yeah I've got a relatively easy job these days yeah I mean this is an important job like back in the day though uh, one of your main jobs was running around changing the batteries for all of our <laughs> our mic packs but now we've got these cool Ugh. cool headsets because we're pro gamers now so we, pro we, gamers. we we have wires and that's what the pros use they don't use wireless anymore <laughs> like uh, it's one less thing <laughs> to yeah. have to run around and do thank god <laughs> now speaking of, of playing Eve you've uh, you took a little bit of a break I heard your back um, last I saw you had uh, your your fortune was still alive 300 billion esque about like what well, a month ago, how's that going? Have you been investing in it? Like, how's it how's it, how's it been going? Um, it's. I mean, I have to. St I didn't quite remember how difficult Eve was. Um, <clears throat> I thought it was like a, you know, it's going to be quite easy to get back into the swing of things. Um, I've not necessarily invested a three hundred bill. I've uh, kind of pretty much sort of lost it all <laughs> in the last four weeks, just trying to learn the game again. It's it's been a it's been a tough ride. I have to say, I tried a little most, bit. Of the most people try and learn by. Doing <laughs> nice, simple, cheap things. What is it you've been doing with your three hundred billion esque? Well, abyssals. He's been doing abyssals. I've been doing a little bit abyssals. of abyssal stuff. And you've fed, I have to say, it's it's hard. It's hard. Yes, he, this man it's has really fed three hundred billion esque into the abyss. As no, uh, uh, Swift, he put it. You're stimulating the economy. <laughs> that's what that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm helping the Eve economy. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I've learned a lot <laughs> spending and blowing up my three hundred billion in four weeks. Yes, it's been quantitative it's been easing for the Eve economy. <laughs> All right, let's have a look at our, our next match, which is going to be Ahil Nall versus Deepwater Hooligans. And uh, let's see what bands uh, these teams have chosen to, to bring. So Ahil Nall bringing, uh, are banning Locate, Scorpion Navy Issue, Scimitar, and Deepwater Hooligans banning out the Vindicator Typhoon Fleet Issue and the Armageddon, Armageddon Navy Issue. Nash, what do these bands say to you here? <laughs> Well, it's a very interesting choice. Um, I would certainly have uh, banned the Scorpion Navy issue as well. You never know with all those uh, jams. I think it does. So yeah, that'd be uh, yeah, it's a good shout. Excellent choice. And what would you bring against say what Deepwater uh, <laughs> banned here? They've banned a Vindicated Typhoon Fleet issue, Armageddon Navy issue. What would what would you bring against that? Uh, probably a, a Shield Kite Comp would work really well against this. Possibly, I'm not uh, hundred percent sure. I'll I'll uh, I'll wait and see until uh, the result is in. Okay.
Nice, nice commitment right there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, CCP B, um, what 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 jumps out here? Like we've seen a bunch of Loki bands. The Scimitar of course, a very very powerful uh, shield logistics cruiser, um, which is certainly going to make it more difficult to bring that shield kiting comp, considering it's the main shield kiting logistics cruiser uh, that has been banned. Um, wh what do you what do you think we might see? Well, what jumps out at me here is that it's three battleship bands from Deepwater. Uh, I'm not sure what they're thinking exactly, but I guess we're going to find out in just a few minutes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, the history of these teams. So uh, let's look at Deepwater first. Here we are. So Deepwater Hooligans. Uh, 19 pilots have flown for this team uh, in their history in the Alliance tournament. Um, they've had one win and uh, five losses. I think that says five. Um, and that is not the best record for them. Uh, Tamoxa Zero uh, has been around for a while. Um, in a couple of different corps, I believe, including full broadside back in the day. Uh, and they beat uh, Hard Knock Citizens last year in Alliance Tournament 17, uh, losing to uh, both a rival and local is primary. Pretty reasonable teams to lose against, like a rival or a solid team. Uh, we've, they lost against them earlier on today. Uh, local is primary, again, last year did really well. Ride My Turtle, um, they were pretty reasonable last year. They lost uh, probably one of the most expensive ships, uh, non-Alliance Tournament ships in EVA Online history, uh, losing, I think it was like a three or four hundred billion-esque uh, wow. faction, uh, sorry, Dead Space Abyssal um, Bar Guest. Uh, yeah, that was a very expensive one. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't see it because it was uh, Abyssal, so everything was one-esque. Um, ah, but yeah. uh, I was told uh, very explicitly it was incredibly expensive. Now, let's take a look at Ahil Na. I'm never sure how to pronounce, but uh, they have uh, also lost one match. Uh, that is today. Uh, they have had ten people fly, which makes sense because they've they flew in one match, and that was today as well, and you can only have up to 10 people. Uh, and unfortunately, they have yet to win a match, uh, but they lost against probably one of the best teams, the current defending champions, essentially, in Truth, Honor, Light. So there is no shame no in shame. losing to that team whatsoever. Uh, now, at CSPB, you've been flying and practicing and scrimming with uh, Truth, Honor, Light, essentially. Um, take me through all of their comps in great detail. Not a chance. <laughs> they'll, uh, they'll execute me. <laughs> <laughs> it has been an eye-opener, though. Um, like I said, I, I'm very new to the scene of, of the whole tournament and just getting to sit there and watch the theory craft just an endless amount of the same comp but tweak it a little bit, it's it's eye opening how how deeply seriously they take this. And I can understand why. I mean they, they they're really good at the game. You could see this when they went and did um the Nulsec deployment that I was with them fairly recently as well. Um but then when they take it, this is like a whole new level, the depths that they go to. Yeah, and they have some of the best theory crafters in, in the history of the game. Uh, I mean, people like Kadesh, for example. Uh, he's the maintainer of Pypha, uh, just an absolute wizard with with, uh, with spaceship fittings. Yeah. Um, but anyway, speaking of other teams, uh, Ahilna versus Deepwater Hooligans. We're ready to go to the arena and find out who's going to win between these two teams. Welcome back to the arena, everybody. We got Deepwater Hooligans coming up against, and take note, Ithaca, I believe it's Ahelna. Um, Ahelna seem to have brought this Lashak Armageddon comp with three pirate cruisers and Deepwater on the other side, Fear, have got. Well, Lashak with uh, no pirate cruisers, but quite a bit of low end and some jams in a Griffin. And uh, so Armageddon Lashak versus Duel Lashak. Let's talk about this matchup a little bit because I've heard people like the Armageddon Lashak more. I've heard people like the Duel Lashak more. What are your thoughts? Uh, I think it depends how the Armageddon is fit. And this Armageddon doesn't seem to have any guns at all. So I'm going to assume this is like a full Newt and Nos Armageddon, which is obviously very, very dangerous for Lashak to come up against um, because if you can keep cycling those newts on them, just spam them, you know, heavy newt cycles 24 seconds. If you put four newts on one Lashak, they're cycling every six seconds. If you stagger them, there's no way he can keep his gun running the whole time and you will stop his spool. And he is then essentially a 25 point bag of nothing. Yeah, and uh, this kind of armor control mirror match, one that we've seen many times in AET's past, not necessarily this particular version of the comps, uh, but still, uh, when you see armor control mirror matchups, it typically boils down to execution, less so than what exact ships you brought. We'll see which team has that higher execution as the match is about to go underway. Yeah, I think these kind of comps are actually really interesting because although the top end is pretty frequently similar you see you know three battleship core or double the shack but the stuff you can do in the low end makes it very very 
sort of varied in that regard. Some teams like Armour Jackdaws, we saw a Hecate earlier. This team has opted for a Griffin, which I don't think we've seen at all so far. Um, so all, you can, as Bjorn was talking about earlier on, uh, well, just now, um, how Truth on a Light go through their comps and they make minor alterations. There's so many different little twists and turns of the Rubik's Cube you can come up with and try and figure out what comp is actually the one you want to run with. Um, and it makes it very difficult for teams to sort of nail down what the best variant actually is. So you come up, you can see two not mirror comps, but similar sort of archetypes come up against each other and not really be sure who actually has the upper hand here because both of these teams think theirs is obviously better. Yeah, and it is an armor jackdaw in addition to that green, uh, griffin from the side of Deepwater Hooligans and having that hyena uh, for the tackle. So you look at the control bar, both of them pretty much maxed out. I uh, held not slightly more because I got more modules, but still, uh, either way, they're going to do some poking and prodding, see what they want to do because neither of these little shacks from Deepwater Hooligans want to get under the newts of Lover Zero and the Armageddon. Yeah, to my understanding, the control bar is basically just a number of modules. And of course, as we said, the Armageddon seems to be full newt fit. Um, so that's going to help them out pretty heavily on that metric, as well as the webs and presumably newts on the Ashimu. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty control -y on that side. But they, their control seems to be more in the top end in terms of those newts on the Armageddon and the Ashimu, whereas the low end on um, the Deepwater Hooligan side seems to be where they've packed their control, presumably going to have some damps on the Armor Jackdaw. There's going to be some jams, obviously, on the Griffin. they got webs on the Hyena, so... Yep, very slow play, though. Neither team really wanting to commit at the moment. Uh, and they'll just be plinking away with uh, high-range uh, ammo from these little shacks. And the further away you are on the little shacks, probably the better against the Sarmageddon. Uh, not wanting to deal with the new pressure, but the Cineros of Tamoxa appears to be the primary, uh, at least for now, from Ahana. Yeah, the thing is, they need to be, at the start, both of these teams, neither of them is a particularly sort of fast comp in terms of having a massive impact early, then neither of them are really rushy comps. They're both quite attritional, particularly in terms of new pressure. So I think it's going to be critical when the fight suddenly switches on, um, whether or not Deepwater Hooligans are able to deal with this Armageddon. They may want to focus both of their shacks on it and instantly get rid of it, because if that new pressure continues to attrition over the course, the Ashimu now of Kavegi is... Yeah. Tackled by the Ishkar. Senecal makes the dive for the rest of his team. Now the rest of his team's starting to move forward, including those two Lashaks. Uh, he's got the ADC. He's got uh, quite a bit of reps on top of him as well. So he's going to try to get uh, as much value out of that dive as possible. Uh, he is webbed off himself, though, and doesn't have any remaining webs uh, onto any members of Ahil Na. So they've been able to peel him off for the time being. But now uh, Senecal dives into structure. He's going to get one last rep in and probably going to fall. Yeah, this seems to be sort of jumping the gun a little bit here by Senecal. We can see Tamox is doing everything he can to try and keep this Ishkar up, but the, the Ashimu of Kabegi is totally fine. He's been wrapped up by his frigates. He's managed to make it out. But of course, the Ishka, once he's in the middle of this situation, he is not getting out. So his life is now forfeit. And it's up to um, Deepwater to try and make something of his sacrifice. Otherwise, they've effectively lost an Ishka for nothing. But the rest of the team doesn't really seem to be pushing in with him here. So I'm not... That There seems to be a sort of... I don't know, like a, a, a sort of random push there from the Ishka that wasn't particularly coordinated with the rest of the, the members of his team. And meanwhile, Duxler and Athalia, he's getting plinked away at the moment. Uh, there are some tracking disruptors onto one of the little shacks from Deepwater Hooligans. Uh, not exactly sure where that one's coming from. It doesn't really tell us. Uh, but either way, uh, getting tracking disruptors onto a uh, little shack is always a great thing to do. And the Thalia Duxlayer, I mean... He's going into low armor, and he hasn't really been repped up all that much. I'm curious to see, like, how exactly that has happened. There are newts on one of the Lashaks now, Crimson Serenity, under the pressure of either the Armageddon or the uh, Ash and Moon newts. Looks like the Armageddon from him. Yeah, and Duxlayer catches back up. I actually saw um, the whole team there recall their damage bots. I think they had damage bots out to kill the Ishka and immediately put out rep bots and issue them straight onto Duxlayer, and Duxlayer catches just fine. Obviously, he's keeping pretty significant range. He's keeping his speed up quite a distance from the enemy fleet here. So those rep belts are able to, to, you know, leisurely get him back to full health. But it is now Shanna who's going to need reps in the Phantasm. Phantasm, pretty fast ship uh, with that afterburner bonus. We'll see how it's fit afterwards. Uh, I think some people don't necessarily like to see Tenement afterburner phantasms that aren't blinged, but uh, either way, resistant to scrams at the very least. Neither team really doing a whole lot of damage at the moment. If you look at the attack bars, they are pretty anemic compared to the rest. This is really a war of attrition, as you have mentioned earlier on in the match. And that one kill might be the only one we see all match. We're about halfway done and no one else has fallen. 
Yeah, um, I think these Lashaks are both still scared about the Armageddon, but obviously with that loss, they need to do something. The onus is on them to make something happen here. And yeah, they're going to need to do something about that Armageddon or the Ashimu, because otherwise if this match goes longer and longer and they, they're in new range, they the don't Magus. deal with it. Yeah, they're the Magus, Magus goes down. They're going to plank him out with long range ammo with a sipple of X Rander X is the primary from the side of uh, All Hell Na. And Sipple, he's got defensive mode, can reduce his SIG, still tracking from Lashak is very difficult to deal with, especially uh, with the uh, rest of the utility that the side of Ahil Na has brought, but he's able to rep back up to full armor, and I've got to start the cycle all over again. Yeah, that was a good spot on the Magus, that was a very good catch, they just sort of were taking it leisurely, and then suddenly the Magus dropped. Um, the most part, Ahil Na seemed to be doing a pretty good job of staying fairly compact, keeping everything within these rep frig ranges, but as you say, I assume they loaded long-range ammo on the Lashaks and just plinked that Magus out of existence very, very quickly. Yeah, they're under the Aneros, though, uh, at the moment. We'll see. Is the Aneros tackled at the moment? Does not look like it. Uh, does have Newt's on top of him, though. And new pressure on top of Aneros, not something you really want to have happen to your sole Logi Cruiser. I'm trying to figure out who exactly has the Newt going on to him at the moment. I do believe that is getting Newt's on top of that Aneros, and he's not able to rep at all right now. Yeah, and the Lashak is also beaming him, and I'm going to hope for his sake that the Lashak has long-range ammo so that Saneros can't actually get out of range, although I think the beam has stopped. So I expect damage to drop off pretty dramatically, but the Hyena now does just get plapped as well. Yeah, webs off the table, low end slowly, slowly dying from Deepwater Hooligans. They found the Griffin as well, volume to half armor, now into half structure. There's nothing left in the tank for that Griffin, and he will die. Uh, jams not going to do enough, because when he jams someone, you're just taunting them to him. He is able to wrap back up to full uh, armor, however, so the Lashaks have to uh, get some lucky shots to kill that Griffin. Yeah, and this is the other thing with the Armageddon is... If it's sort of a, a protracted close range brawl, then the new pressure becomes overwhelming. But you can also use the long range of the newts on the Armageddon to sort of alpha frigate capacitor and then use that as an opportunity to, to gain an opening and just, as we saw, plink away at something and just take it out very, very quickly before it has a chance to cap up and, and get moving again. Yeah, Dano Els Lashak, though, very extended out right now. They're finally deciding to commit with both of the Lashaks, but they've turned the damage from this uh, Lashak from Ahel Na on top of Dano L, as he will be the primary, but they're going to try to go for the Lashak trade. This Armageddon, though, should be smart enough to get the Newts on top of at least one of these Lashaks. Yeah, they've decided to flip the switch. They've realized they need to make something happen here, and both these Lashaks have burned in, and they're trying to break through the first Lashak. I don't know if that's the right call or if they're going to be able to kill him before these newts from the Geddon start to take effect. Um, we're going to have a little look at the battleship piloting here as well. Are they going to be able to control space and do what they're tracking, or are they just going to burn around? I think both of them have successfully slowed down, so they are going to be applying pretty decently, and this Daniel Sunkist in that Lashak is actually going down pretty quickly here. Yeah, but one of these Lashaks has full new pressure coming in from Lover Zero in the Armageddon. The uh, Lashak in question being Dano I. It, I said Dano I and the Lashak. I already said he was a Lashak pilot. So he's got no way to uh, use an ancillary armor wrapper at the moment, and his guns are turned off. But full spool coming in from uh, one Lashak on his team and from Daniel I, or from uh, Daniel Sunkiss, excuse me. And he's into structure right now, should end up going down. With that Lashak down, there's not a whole lot of damage left from Ahel Na. They might end up having this one slip away from them. Yeah, it turns out in the end to be a good call from Deepwater Hooligans. The power of those two Lashaks in the right place at the right time. Very, very decisive play to just charge in and break through the Lashak. And of course, as we've said, it's a full new Geddon, so there's not a huge amount of damage actually left on the field here. Um, so that's, that's a good pickoff from Deepwater Hooligans. There. That's a very decisive move, and that's the kind of thing they needed to do in this situation to, to swing the match rapidly rather than you know, sort of stay in a range where, they can, where they're taking losses, but they're not really making much progress very quickly. It was a, it was a good, decisive move. Just about a minute left in the match right now, and I hail Nah, they need to kill something, but uh, they've got nothing in the tank as far as DPS is concerned. Their team's kind of spread out at the moment, trying to not give too many points over to Deepwater Hooligans, not like that matters. It is double elimination after Hall, and their elimination's on the line. Thalia goes down. Next should be either this Ashramu or this Phantasm, as the damage is split from Deepwater Hooligans. So the damage is going on to the Saneros as well from Ahel Na, but it's too little too late. Deepwater Hooligans, 30 seconds left in the match, should be able to one, uh, win this one and move on in the tournament. Yeah, and it's going to be disappointing for Arhale now because we saw the feeders. They put up a very strong performance. I think they went 4-0 overall and 
got an entry into the Alliance tournament and to then go 0-2 on the first day and earn the dubious honor of being the very first team to be eliminated from the tournament is it's got to be a little bit disappointing for them but uh, I think they put up a good showing um, it's just it's you know maybe this matchup was perhaps a little bit difficult um, keeping that Lashak alive is obviously going to be a Herculean task against two of them coming in simultaneously but with that we're going to send it back to the studio and we're going to say goodbye to our hail now Connected. Channel switched. Well, it would have been an easy fight, right? But guess what, dude? I'm not if seeing and people can't get their f it together! And there we have it, Deepwater Hooligans take the victory and unfortunately Ahil and I become the first of the 32 teams to exit Alliance Tournament 18 uh, as that was indeed a loser's market, uh, bracket match. Uh, we say goodbye, we say thank you for competing um, and good luck next time to the Ahil and I team there. Um, that match was uh, it's just intense uh, for both sides because that looked like one of those matches where it's just high APM, like lots of piloting and changing decisions and moving stuff around and, and kiting and when to commit and things. And then it was nine seconds until like a minute and a half to go. And then those two Lashaks from deep water did what you called from like like 10 seconds into the match, which was just barrel in on that one Lashak and spool on it. Bart, take me through kind of what, what happened in that match. Yeah, I think you're right that it was a lot of like high APM and piloting and skillful play that in all honesty, did not need to happen in any way, shape, or form. Like, as soon as that they realized that two Lashaks is more than one Lashak, they just pushed them in and blew up the other Lashak. And, I mean, you know, we know that math is something that works every single time, and two is more than one, uh, so they were able to defeat it. But, you know, to be serious, like, there wasn't enough ability to shut down those Lashaks unless they had gone in and tackled. And so, like, while well, the teams were sort of flying around or perhaps jockeying for position as we uh, are known to say over and over and over again um, at any point those two Lashaks that weren't tackled could have just pushed in and then just started ramping in DPS and uh, the thing about the Ah Hell Na team is that they had a lot of energy neutralizers which are more effective as the match goes on I think we we talk about it a decent amount but um, because of cap boosters cap booster 3200s you only have so many of them once you run out that's it so it was a 10 minute match. It could have been like a probably two or three minute match. Like at least it would have been one within two or three minutes. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think Jin had an actually interesting comment about their piloting. He was uh, criticizing it in a much more interesting way than I am. Jin Tan? Uh, no comment. No comment. <laughs> oh, <laughs> do you want to, do you want to say that Tomoxa actually played that game exceptionally well, he keeping did. alive um, frigates with very very low EHP? You're looking at like maybe three, four thousand EHP on that Griffin. Um, obviously the Ishka went down early on, and that was more due to the fact that the Ishka decided uh, to meet Valhalla in glorious combat rather than play things safe with the rest of his team. But yeah, especially with an armor comp like that. You have to predict when the damage is going to be applied and cycle your reps beforehand, or that Griffin's going to go bye bye very quickly. Yeah, super uh, e excellent piloting there from Tomoxa in that on Euros. Um, it's just, uh, keeping a Griffin alive with the like uh, armor reps uh, land at the end of the cycle versus shield, which land at the start. Like it's just that's just super hard to do, and uh, he did it really well. That Griffin as well was flying away uh, from the enemies when he was getting primary. He was like paying very close attention and then bailing out. You know, just really good 
really good piloting from both sides. Unfortunately for Ahil Na, uh, they didn't come out victorious. Now, we have another elimination match coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, tree, uh, try versus Boundary Experts. So let's take a look at the bans for, uh, for this match. So try banning out the Mollus, the Kerries, and the Scimitar. Interesting bans there. Uh, CCB Swift came on and talked about how great the Kerries was and everyone should bring it. Uh, Try took that uh, a personal offence to that and just banned it out. Boundary experts banning the Nighthawk, the Balgon, and the Curse. Uh, Jin Tan, what do you make of uh, these bans here? Yes, these are bans are kind of we're starting to see a bit of a pattern with the generic bans, the power bans. Normally, you're banning one rush ship. Balgorn Curse. That's That seems to be quite a common trend now. But on the other side, Triumvirate haven't played their part in it. There's no bans on any of the drone ships that we've seen quite heavily targeted, no bans on the frigate Logi. Instead, they are just dealing with things that would probably be brought by Kite. So Triumvirate are probably going to be playing some sort of three battleship setup or um, something similar that, that wants to be close to, uh, wants to be able to project but is relatively immobile. Something that would be more heavily. Uh, more heavily interrupted by the game plan of those dams. That said, the Celestis is still open, so Boundary Experts do have options if they want to you know, read in too deeply into that bands. Now, if I'm correct in remembering, both these teams earlier on in the matches which they, uh, they sadly lost, both of them fielded their flagships, and both of them lost their flagships. Um, so we're, what we're looking at here is the first match of the tournament, I think, where not a single flagship could even be possibly fielded because they're all dead at this point. Uh, Bart, do you think it would it would maybe make a difference right now for one of these teams if they still had that flagship? You know, it might. Um, I think that, you know, Jin is totally right about the triumvirate thing. Like, they don't want to have to deal with a uh, a team that can kite them. Because, like, if you, you, know, you throw, like, a Mollus and a Carries in there and then you just fly around while well, they can't enjoy their lock range and they have, like, a 20-kilometer lock range. Um, since they did have, uh, I think both teams had Bargusts, I believe. Yep. And now they don't have Bargusts <laughs> anymore. Yep. Uh, it's, like, it's possible that maybe like with the flagship Bargus you could do a kite team that would like counteract the fact that they banned the molluses and the carries um but i don't i don't know it's hard to tell like i feel like both of them kind of lost their Bargus in ways that the Bargus didn't matter in the match and now it doesn't matter because it's dead and you know like jen said they still have celestuses and i think celestuses are actually probably better than molluses and carries so earlier on, um, the Tri team lost against the Tuskers Co. Of course, a very experienced team. They they look like they could be quite strong this year. Um, and the Boundary Experts lost versus Polaris Mercenary Alliance, uh, who again performed super well uh, in that earlier match. I think um, maybe a lot better than some people had kind of given them credit for, um, especially compared to someone like the Tuskers. So what do we think here? Um, who Gentan do you think is going to be able to take this one here? Is it going to be Tri or Boundary Experts? I don't know. This is a really hard one to call. Um. I think my money is on Triumvirate. Uh, they're just a team that has a longer history. Um, but, you know, I think uh, Boundary Experts always have a chance to bring this out. They've got so much tournament experience as well. And despite everything, they did execute fairly well in their last match. Uh, they just needed to, you know, uh, pick a better comp, basically. <laughs> and Bart, what about you? Well, now that uh, now that we don't have the script anymore, uh, <laughs> we, we accidentally burned it. Um, I believe that this time... Try will actually win, as opposed to last time where it was uh, stacked against them from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's find out as we go to the arena to see uh, who will win between Try and Boundary Experts. Welcome back to the arena, guys. Try, Boundary Experts, both on the verge of annihilation here. Three bar guests coming out from Try. That is an unusual comp, heralding back to, to last year, I think, but. Yep. Um, what have Boundary Experts got? Oh, Kingslayer from uh, the Bar Guests and uh, Kingslayer uh, from Boundary Experts. They've got double arm and got a navy, navy and a Typhoon fleet issue. So triple rapid heavy from both of these teams. One shield, one armor. We'll see how they match up in this match. I don't believe there are any flagships in this match either. So it's do or die for both these teams. I'm excited. What about you? Yeah, I'm curious about more specifically about the difference in Logi here because you've got the Deacon and Thalia on one side who may actually be pretty difficult to take down for these bar guests who obviously are going to be spending their mid slots on tank and not particularly as much on application. Whereas on the other side, you've got the Armageddon navies and the Typhoon fleet who obviously can afford to spend those mid, -lo mid slots on application against the Burst and the Bantam who are just going to get obliterated here, I would imagine. Um, if they do get looked at by you know drones from the Pontifex or the Exacron navies guns um, or indeed, of course, the missiles from the Armageddon navy. So I, I think... On the surface level before the match starts, I would actually favor the armor Kingslayer in this situation. 
I think I would as well. Uh, they have hit points to go through, but at the same time, neither team really has any battle cruiser or cruiser hulls, which is what rapid heavies are good against. Remember, you got to clip out somebody, or you have to kill someone before your clips are dead. And both of these teams, they only got three clips of rapid heavies uh, a piece, although those are bonus clips and they do quite a bit of damage. No rate of fire bonuses because rate of fires on rapid heavies is bad. Either way, the match is about to go underway, and both teams starting to pull back from one another, although one team much quicker off the line, that being Triumvirate. Yeah, and I expect the win con for both of these teams, based on my understanding, would be that they need to deal with these battleships. Obviously, both of these teams have committed 60-odd, in fact, 75 on the side of Triumvirate into these battleship um, setups. And there's going to be, obviously, therefore, very little DPS outside of those. So whoever can whittle through those battleships with their clips, pick the right target, pick the right timing to, to unleash those volleys and break through um, the opposing battleships. Although, of course, in missile v. missile matchups, I think there is a benefit to being the team that's burning away as the other team is forced to run into your missiles and you're potentially able to get out of range of theirs as the missiles sort of expire uh, by the time they get to you. And it's Triumvirate here in the shield comp who's running away. And they're faster. They're shield fit. They're going to be able to outkite the enemy team. It's just whether or not boundary experts can actually catch up to them uh, using better positioning. Either way, the Exec Navy is the primary from Triumvirate. They're like, all right, rapid heavies. They're good against cruisers and battle cruisers. There's only one cruiser on the enemy team. We're going to shoot him first. Uh, they should be able to kill him within the clip, although he is getting good reps in from the Steakin and Athalia combo. Yeah, and there's a lot of rep drones on him as well. Of course, the Typhoon Fleet, Armageddon Navy, both have ample drone base to spew out rep bots on him, although for the Armageddon Navy is perhaps less desirable than they'd like, given the new uh, drone damage bonus those hulls have. But he is now actually picking up total ownage. I think the Deacon and Thalia might have been a little bit off him to the start, but they've managed to sort of get in range and get those reps into optimal. And now Alex Lennon on the other side in that shield Bargest is going into armor here, and that's definitely not a good sign for him. Yeah, he's got some repping power on top of him, but the shield EHP from uh, these bar guests is rather large if you fit them up correctly, but they only got six mid slots uh, to deal with, and you have to have utility as well. It does look like he survived the first clip in half armor, should be able to rep back up pretty close to full, but he's only got T1 Logi frags to try to help him with that. Yeah, and in, as that happened, the Jackdaw, of course, just got volleyed as well. I don't know if uh, the Exec Navy and the Jackdaws on the other side managed to plap at him or what, but um, this is looking pretty good for Boundary Experts so far. Um, they're staying pretty compact together, which is exactly what you want to do when you've got these Logi Frigates, which enables them to sort of stay in range and, you know, not not have difficulty applying those short-range reps. Um, as they, as we saw, that they caught the Exec Navy, and now they're still just sort of running around after this Bargess, but they seem to actually be in range. The, obviously, the Bargess, as you said, are going to be a faster comp, but they don't seem fast enough to actually outrun um, these Armor King Slayer setup. Yeah, and... Arena's a sphere, right? You have to be able to position properly if you're going to kite someone, even if they are a little bit slower than you. Alex Lennon, the Rapid Heavy Clips, uh, should be coming back up pretty soon, and he should end up falling. There's some damage coming from the rest of these ships as well. As he moves up into one-third shield, he's going to try to survive this, but the Clips are coming, and they should be able to get the kill. Meanwhile, this Exec Navy of Tonal Odinage, full armor, he's going to be the primary once again. We're going to see if they can get him to bleed a little bit more hull, but still, that's not a trade you want. Alex Lennon now up to half shield. But the clips are about over, and I'm expecting to see that attack bar from Triumvirate, or sorry, from Boundary Experts go to the moon. Yeah, we are seeing that Exec Navy. He seems to be their sort of frontliner for their comp. He's the one pushing in at the front, leading the charge. And the Redbots were otherwise occupied, um, I think, on the Deacon. But they are now, the Exec Navy has now turned around and the Redbots are being reassigned. But the Exec Navy does just go down before. But they are going to take out this Stork in exchange. And as you say, they've reloaded. Those missiles are coming out again on the Barghest. And he only was able to rep up to like a third shield. He is going to go down on this second clip of these Armor Kingslayer ships. I mean, really well done with the Rapid Heavies there, but at the same time, they've lost their kind of primary engage tool in that Exec Navy. We're going to see if that might actually shift things a little bit towards Triumvirate's favor. They will lose Alex Lennon. It's just a matter of when. They actually went for the Skybreaker next. I think they're going for smaller targets with these Rapid Heavies now. Uh, some split damage, though, between the low end and the high end. Yeah, I think actually the Hyena would be a good target here to focus for these Jackdaws because it is going to be basically their only application. And they have invested the, the points into this Deacon and Thalia. They have these Tech 2 Logi and they've proven 
the, I mean, they were able to keep the exec navy up for an extended period. They would surely be able to keep the Armageddon navy, the Typhoon fleet, the core of their comp alive. And if they can deal with the application from this hyena that will provide that those webs and paints to the bar guests, um, it effectively saves their lower end from any real risk in this fight. Yeah, jackdaws, armor jackdaws, though. They got plenty of damps on them. We see uh, a lot of them going towards one of the, uh, or a lot of them being spread. Alex Lennon's got a damp on him. McRose, Mr. Rosen has a damp on him as well, trying to keep these bargains at bay. But now Alex Lennon, he's been going through his armor, through his shields, the attack bar, about halfway up for boundary experts, and they should be able to get this bargast finally and take a significant points lead. Yeah, and just going back to the armor jackdaws, I'm actually surprised how few jackdaws we've seen. I don't think we've seen it banned basically at all. Um, and we've, you know, in this match we've got two, but and I think there was one, there was one for Triumvirate as well, but I think most matches haven't actually had that many jackdaws. But coming into the tournament, I was expecting jackdaws to be everywhere because in a damp war, the jackdaw with its e wall resist basically automatically wins. If you have a jackdaw against a carries and they're damping each other, the jackdaw wins because jackdaw has, what is it, 60% E-War reduction. If you then stack that with E-War protection link, it's basically undampable. And Armor Jackdaw, as we've seen, gets, you know, three, maybe four um, damps in those mids. So you can be a real pain in the ass with it. Um, and this now the second bar guest, of course, the, the ships get less on the Triumvirate side. These damps are going to become more and more oppressive. But at the same time, Boundary Experts doesn't need to kill anything more. Their low end is working on the logic frigates right now. This bantam of Chi Chi down to about one third, now one quarter shields. Uh, and meanwhile, rapid heavies, three sets of rapid heavies, good enough to take down a lot of things. Two sets of rapid heavies, you're going to have a lot more trouble going through someone's entire EHP in one clip. Yeah, it's all about having a critical mass. And as we saw, they were able to just about get that Navy exec roll, but everything else on the grid here. Is going to be a very, very tough ask to take down with just these two Barghests. Soon to be one as Mr. Rosen, having already lost the flagship Barghest earlier in the day, he's going to add a second Barghest kill mail uh, to his kill board here. Yeah, one more lost mail for the books. Goes into structure and the attack bar fully meaty from battery experts. They'll be able to chew through him just fine. we got about three minutes left on the match. This one's got to be a bit of a grind. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what we expect to see through this lower bracket, right? Teams now, they've got to pull out all the stops because one loss means that they are out of the tournament. Yeah, and looking at the bracket, I think boundary experts having won this match are likely to go up against... Well, it'll be the loser of Lock Range Enjoys against No Forks Given. And again, that's a match that could go either way um, in terms of No Forks Given against... I would expect No Forks Given to drop down. Lock Range Enjoys look very, very competent. I know they've been scrimming with Hydra. Um, and Boundary Experts here dropping down to the lower bracket in the first match. Um, that's anybody's game to take. And once you start getting through the lower bracket, you start inching closer and closer to those prize ships. But every match, of course, as you say, is a must win. Yeah, win two matches and your guaranteed prize ships placing in the top 16, getting a handful of ships for your trouble of each variety. And all these teams, I mean, you're in it for the prize ships. You want to at least make back your entry fee and uh, go into the next tournament uh, is the thing. But some teams end up being valued prize pool contributors. And today that appears to be triumvirate. Uh, we talked a little bit during the uh, pre view of the tournament about the split of Vidra Reloaded and how those pilots ended up going between Darkseid, Besot, and Triumvirate. Triumvirate ended up getting the short end of the stick in terms of those pilots, and we're seeing this time around uh, one of the three Russian teams is out of the tournament, and uh, Darkseid and Besod still in the upper bracket. I'm excited to see how they fare, maybe if they go up against each other later in the tournament. Yeah, of course, those two teams generally more tournament predigreed in the history um, than Triumvirate has been. I know Triumvirate came, I think it was third or fourth in Alliance Tournament 14 or 15 a couple of years ago. But overall, I'd say Dark Side and Bright Side of Death are the more sort of experienced teams. So for those sort of displaced Russian pilots from Vidry, they may have seemed like the more attractive options to, to join up and join forces with the other Russian groups. And yeah, there's a, there's a real chance that those two teams bolstered by those Vidra pilots could make a really strong run through the upper bracket. Yeah, and through the lower bracket, uh, boundary experts, you know, Radicos will be uh, happy about that, you think? No, he's not with boundary experts anymore. He's with Pandemic Legion, who also have a lower bracket match coming up tomorrow. Uh, either way, uh, hats off to him for uh, making the one veto that didn't make any sense whatsoever 
in the uh, pre-Alliance tournament show. Uh, we're getting some boundaries coming out from Triumvirate. They're going to go for the Edge of Glory. This burst, 115 out, about to hit that 125 mark. Uh, 30 seconds left in the match, though. This one should not go 100 points for boundary experts. Yeah, it is going to be, unfortunately, the end of the road for Triumvirate. They're going to be going home with nothing. As you say, valued price pool contributors and boundary experts are going to move on. Yep, 15 seconds left in the match. One is down. The burst, 60-ish kilometers away from the center. Now getting taken down by the rest of Boundary Experts. Four seconds left in the match. Three, two, one, and it is over. We're going to send it back to the desk. Break that one down. Bring us into the last match of the day, which will be Paper Numbers versus Esports Potopia. Yeah, we actually lost a bet as CCP collectively, uh, so that's why that Alliance logo is in the game. Of course, you could change your Alliance by leaving, but that would be <laughs> kind of a jerk move. That kind like, of... Oh, you don't like it? Nah, uh, just this, leave. This logo sucks. I'm going to go join. Welcome to Eve Pandora. 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 Unfortunately for Triumvirate, they are the second team to say goodbye, and we thank them for their valued contribution to the prize pool uh, as they are eliminated from Alliance Tournament 18 contention by the Boundary Experts team. Um, Blackbart Pirate, uh, I can't help but notice that that team fielded three bar guests, and thanks to the point inflation rule, they went from uh, 23 points to 25 points. So essentially, by bringing three of them, they just threw away six extra points uh what's your what's your thoughts on this yeah the uh not only do they throw away six extra points but uh looking at this historically like perhaps if we go back in time about a year-ish where we had a tournament that was uh sponsored by mordu's uh, legion where the bargus were even less points and people were flying triple bargus constantly and then we realized it wasn't that good of a comp because everyone figured out how to beat it um I was a little confused. I was like, why are you bringing something that has already been solved that is worse significantly because you are spending so many more points on it? Uh, the I don't remember what the exact name of the rule is this year, but basically it's the duplicate rule. Points inflation. Ah, points inflation. Yes. yes. Um, inflation everywhere, even in yes, the Alliance even, tournament. Even in the Alliance tournament, we are suffering from inflation, but uh, every ship you bring in uh, of the same hull increases the point value by one, so... Vargas is 23 points, you bring two Vargas, now they're 24, and you bring three, and now they are 25. Math class is still in session for at <laughs> least another about 20 minutes. Um, but yes, you, you spent uh, 75 of your 100 points on three ships, which means the other seven of them have to spread out a very small amount, and uh, I think we kind of saw the weakness of that. Like, you're, you're really lacking the ability to, you know, tackle uh, E-War, Counter Screen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they just really didn't work. Uh, Jintan, do you think if uh, that comp had one of those ships as a flagship Bargas, it would have been a different um, different outcome? Or do you think it's just the triple Bargas, just not the right meta for Alliance Tournament 18? No, I don't think there was um, there was much to do there in terms of DPS. Whilst we did see that Navy Executor get very, very close to dropping during the start, that was more of an execution issue on Triumvirate's part rather than um, a lack of DPS. Uh, they kind of blew their load early. They started uh, engaging all their RHMLs before the webs and paints of their hyena had taken effect, and that gave them just not enough D uh, DPS to break through the reps uh, before they needed to reload. Yeah, that's a super important thing, um, being able to hold your DPS until you've got the right tackle, and especially in things with clips, because uh, as Jintan mentioned, uh, if you don't have the target webbed, if you don't have them tackled there and painted, etc., then a bunch of that damage is just wasted, it's mitigated. Uh, and you rely heavily on those clips. So you want to maximize the amount of damage one single clip will give you. 
Um, so a lot of times teams will hold off, hold off, hold off, and then just apply when they've got the optimal uh, chance of killing something. And uh, we saw there just uh, unfortunately didn't work out for try. Now let's look forward to our last match of the day, which is going to be between Paper Numbers and Esports Potopia. This should be a very exciting match. But two very good teams uh, who have found themselves here in the elimination bracket. Paper Numbers uh, banning out the Loki Nighthawk and the Jackdaw, interesting choice there. And Esports banning out a bit more of a traditional set of ships here, the Scimitar, the Curse, and the Slepnir. Bart, what do you make of these bans? Uh, I think we have a, I think this is officially, like we haven't seen a single Curse yet because they are banned so much. And maybe we've seen one, but uh, you know, it's it's kind of turning into like a, what Jin called power bands is like this curse is like everybody's getting rid of it. But um, I think this is the first time we've seen a Nighthawk ban. Uh, we have seen a couple Nighthawk rushes today. Uh, they have met with varying success. Um, but it does look like the Nighthawk Loki was uh, a extremely powerful rush setup in the past like two or three tournaments. I understand why they're getting rid of it. Uh, it is not necessarily difficult to counter but if you aren't ready to fight it and it lands on you, you are going to lose. So uh, Paper Numbers probably making a smart choice. Maybe, you know, they figured out, hey, we can't beat this. Just get rid of it. Pretty simple. Works as it is. Kind of, I understand it. I get it. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I think the Sletmere is um, probably one of the most flown ships in Alliance Tournament history in general. It was a, a staple for many, many, many years in various comps. as a command ship, as a high DPS ship, as a kiting ship, just a super powerful ship. Uh, we don't see it quite as much as we used to, but it's still very popular and very powerful. And of course, it removes um, a lot of skirmish and shield links from the field, forcing teams to either bring um, one of the Kaldari ones, bring a Claymore, or go down to uh, uh, command destroyers instead. Now, Jintan, this Jack Jackdaw ban from Paper Numbers. Um, what do you think about the this ban? That kind of implies to me that Paper Numbers is going to do something that uh, involves a lot of damping from their side. Something I've talked about before is the power of the sharpshooter mode of the Jackdaw, especially in uh, a damp setting. Um, so the, that gives a resistance to E-War, which enables you to counter damp Kerries's, Celestis's, and all manner of uh, damp bonus ships really effectively. So by banning out the Jackdaw, that kind of tips Paper Numbers' hand a little bit. I would expect them to be bringing some form of damp control, probably in support of a uh, battleship core or something similar. Awesome. Now let's take a quick look at the Esports Potopia team history here in the Alliance Tournament. Um, so they have fielded 17 different pilots over the uh, times they've flown in the Alliance tournament, um, with uh, most of the, the core being clearly hanging around for quite a number of ta uh, matches. Uh, they've went one match and lost three. Uh, last match they uh, won against today, uh, Deepwater Hooligans, um, and lost against Nanofiber Tokens. Again, that was earlier on uh, today. Sorry, Deepwater Hooligans was last year. My apologies. Um, they lost against Odin's and Psychotic Tendencies. So three pretty solid teams to lose matches to. Um, I mean, nothing to be ashamed of there at all. Uh, Psychotic Tendencies, of course, did very well last year. Uh, Odin's Call, a very strong team. We expect to do well this year. And Nanofiber Tokens uh, doing really, really, really good. So um, I think we have... Uh, I'm trying to get confirmation that teams are on grid. Um, uh, great, great. So we have a, a, a ship... Uh, uh, screen to show you. Uh, one of these teams fielding uh, a ship we don't see very often in the Alliance tournament, fielding a Badger. Um, so the Badger, in fact, uh, has got four wins to its uh, its name, which is great, uh, but unfortunately nine losses. But look, we saw a whole bunch of uh, usage in a tournament a couple of years ago, and it tends to uh, survive, actually, uh, less than it... Uh, then it doesn't, basically. <laughs> so uh, Veloricors love to use it. Uh, Pandemic Legion, perhaps they know something that we don't. They're using it twice as well. Uh, Blackbird Pie, what's your thoughts on the Badger? Why would a team bring an industrial ship, a Tech 1 industrial ship, to a tournament? It's not really a known for its combat abilities. No, it's not. And uh, it actually has functionally none, but um, it does have a lot of mid slots, and it's relatively tanky and extremely low point cost. So in a, uh, in a world that we're in now where you can do scripted E-War or you know, some of the things that you might use to counter script it, you were, uh, it's not a bad pick. Like, it's super low cost. Uh, you can throw, like, a bunch of remote SIBOs in it. Uh, you could throw, like, damps, guidance disruptors, uh, counter damps, counter guidance disruptors, uh, tracking things. Like, there's a lot of stuff you can put in the mid slots of it and just kind of use it as, like, a little bit of a utility knife ship. Um, obviously, it doesn't do a particularly good job, uh, according to the statistics, but we did see it a lot in the uh, feeder rounds, and there were a couple teams that actually won thanks to it. Like, you could tell that it's like, oh, they had this cool idea, 
and then they executed it, and it was great. So it'll be kind of cool to see how they use it in this match. Yeah, so let's see if that Badger can indeed take the win um, as it goes into a match against two separate flagships here, a flagship Vindicator and a flagship Barghest. As paper numbers go up against Esports Potopia as these teams fight to avoid elimination, let's go to the arena and find out. Welcome back to the arena, everyone, for the final match of the day. As Ithaca was just saying on the desk, we got two flagships here. Both of these teams obviously in the lower bracket on the verge of elimination. The sunk cost here, you know, they've spent all the money building up these flagships, presumably going to have some fancy mods on them. They want to use them before they go out, otherwise it's kind of wasted. Um, and both teams therefore have opted to bring these comps. Um, this looks like a fairly standard shield kite comp from esports. What about paper numbers? Paper numbers, the broad armor control, they got a Vindy, flag Vindy. Uh, we'll see what type of webs he has on him if he ends up dying. Uh, expect the purple, though, I would uh, hope from this uh, Vindy. So we actually see some uh, a well-fit flag vindicator, unlike what we saw from ABA earlier in the tournament. Either way, the Saksak Navy of Captain Shinken is the primary from Esports Potopia as I continue to kite out of the way. We'll see if they're able to catch up from paper numbers or if they're just going to get kited in this armor control setup. Yeah, but so far, Park Bank, we all know Park Bank is a very, very capable logistics pilot. If you've watched the Lions tournament before, he should be a name you're familiar with. Last year, and literally triggered, he put up some very, very strong performances in his iconic Guardian. And yeah, I mean, going back to the Vindicator, as I think we were discussing earlier off air, we agreed the Vindicator is really, it really values really splashing the cash on those officer webs. If you're going to cheap out and get some Fed Navy webs, don't bother. If you're going to put some stinking zeros on it, I don't know how much they cost, God knows. Um, that's when it becomes a really, really valuable ship to field here because that range is so important for the Vindicator to get on top of what it wants to get on top of. And some damage has been traded from both these teams. We see some webs on top of this Claymore, on top of this Navy Osprey. Vindicator himself uh, was webbed for a bit, but now the webs are gone from him. Don't quite see who Rifusen has webbed at the moment. Actually, it doesn't look like he has I anyone it, webbed at the I moment. No, the, he's got the claymore. the claymore. I think it is the Claymore. They have managed, and that was quite a far distance that he was having him webbed as well. So this could be actually a fancy web on this Vindicator. He's caught that Claymore, and he's just going to start pumping into him here from close range. That Claymore is as good as dead. Yeah, the rest of his team has abandoned him to die, potentially, uh, as they're completely and totally scattered needing to keep the rest of their team alive. It's a kite setup. They need to kill something in trade for this claim because the skirmish links are off the table now. They're going to be a little bit more difficult to kite without the rapid deployment links from that claymore. Yeah, and as we said earlier, I think in a shield kite setup, it's not the end of the world if you lose a ship, but at the same time, you don't have any sort of recourse of going back and getting them out of trouble. You can't turn around and bail them out or the rest of you are going to die too. But now this Osprey Navy for alternative is also getting junked here. He is going to go down as well. Yeah, and he was uh, caught by this exact Navy issue, basically uh, soloed him out. So really well done from Captain Shinken to make that happen. Now they can continue to move in and try to catch more members from Esports Potopia. Park Bank, meanwhile, he's currently dancing the dance uh, with his armor reps at the moment. As the Hyena gets completely blapped from Esports Potopia, that's a huge amount of application off the table now. Yeah, and with that, the webs come off Park Bank, but I don't know if he's just going to be able to hold. There don't seem to be any red bots really on him. There's only a handful. I think the battleships have sentries out, and Park Bank is slowly bleeding into hole here. He is probably going to go down from these volleys. Obviously, he can't outtrack the missiles. He can mitigate somewhat, but he is still going to take some damage. Meanwhile, Fu uh, Fubuki in the Orthrus appears to be the tackled pilot now. This Vigil Fleet issue right on top of him. This Vindicator, though, diving towards this Osprey Navy issue on the backside of Deer. Another pilot falls from Esports Potopia. This one, Gemma Dawson and the Flycatcher. And now Esports Potopia, they've scored zero points and they keep on losing ships. They want to get Park Bank, but I don't know if losing all of their low end is worth it. I don't think it is. I think this is going to be another Bargus loss mail we're going to see maybe towards the end of the match here, but I'm sure paper numbers aren't going to let them get away scot-free. They want those modules. They want to find out what's on that kill mail. Uh, the possibility, of course, of bolstering your own flagship strength if you've maybe they've you know got a cheap damage control and there's a fancy one on the Bargus, for example. They are going to take down Park Bank and the Aneros. They've still got a reasonable amount of damage left with the flag Bargus and these three rapid ships, but it's, it's going to be a difficult job to deal with two battleships. 
Yeah, they've taken him down. They have T1, two frigate launching, at least to help keep the rest of their team alive. But you're staying balled up in a kite setup versus a brawl setup. That's not exactly what you want to see happen. And so uh, these Logi frigs are going to be a lot further away than they would otherwise be. The Vigil Fleet issue of CEO. CEO does go down, but they will trade for this Osprey Navy issue of Dear Mumu-san as their exec Navy Captain Shinken, now without the nearest reps, should end up falling. Yeah, and I think this is actually a good demonstration of what a flag of indie comp should do. I feel like paper numbers have correctly set up a setup here um, that is aiming at facilitating the Vindicator on getting on top of things. They got the Crusader, they had the exec Navy issue. They got the Barghast. They, they had the Fleet Vigil, and they are now going to catch the Barghast, yeah, as you've spotted. Yep, Siron already into armor at the moment. That is a bye-bye flag barg. Got to try to get some damage on Rifusen, but he's only got a Drake Navy issue and a couple of rapid light boats to help him out at the moment. Just absolutely deleted by, I would assume, Officer Blasters on top of Rifusen. We'll have to take a look at the kill mail to see uh, what exactly uh, has been shown to be fit to this Vindicator, because I don't think it's going to die and it's going to move on to the next round. Yeah, hopefully paper numbers will be kind enough to link it in local, and then we'll be able to just see immediately after the match on the desk what this bar has had. Of course, we all love seeing juicy flagship kill mails, but this is looking like it's going to be the end for Esports Potopia. It's close in points, but it won't be for long. This bar guest is going to go down. They are trying to pump back into Rife Eisen, but it's going to be too little too late. He can hold under the under his own local rep, um, and once yep. this bar guest goes down, obviously there's not much left. Byron Nikaruka, though. He's wrapping up his shield a little bit at the moment, maybe able to get some tracking uh, out as this ABBA and Vindy are right on top of him. They should be able to track him, but uh, Vargas, of course, a very fast ship. Finally dips into 5% hull, and he is dead. Riveson should be able to stabilize now versus the remaining DPS from Esports Potopia. And paper numbers, this is a team that placed second, much to everyone's surprise in the Anger games. Some people were doubting whether the 7v7 will have any app application into the 10v10 format they had a very close match versus odin's call to start off the tournament and they had a very convincing match now against esports potopia going through this lower bracket yeah i think the most important thing is that this is a bunch of guys who've stuck together i believe they were on literally triggered in the last at and i can see some names here i can see six or seven names that i recognize from those literally triggered matches and when you've got people who are confident in each other's ability you're confident in that each other understands your win conditions what needs to be done in a match how to fulfill your role that's a very very good strength in having that institutional knowledge maintained within an organization and uh, on top of that you know esports potopia they've Continue to improve, I think, a little bit uh, over the last couple tournaments. First showing up, I think, in Alliance Open, if I remember correctly, which doesn't get counted in the AT stats, which is why we saw only uh, last year's stats for them where they pulled off one win. This time going out 0-2, but still respectable, losing to such a uh, very good team, I think, as paper numbers, who uh, will move on to the next round of the lower bracket. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we've all noticed from the bracket this year is that there's just so many good teams and you have to be exceptionally lucky to actually dodge any of the good teams, to be honest, because they're everywhere. It's like a landmine out there, like a minefield. Um, and yeah. yeah, unfortunately, Esports Potopia coming up against, as you say, the second place in the Anger Games, a very, very competent squad here. And uh, they brought a battle badger. This is something chat's been pointing out the entire time, and I think was pointing it out on the desk that it would happen. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that, as you don't see the effect that a battle badger has uh, on the fancy UI because it doesn't tell you uh, what type of boosts or, or tracking boosts uh, the badger is giving to the rest of his team, and I assume this is an RTC badger. Yeah, I think... The situations where a badger is useful are very, very niche, but I think this is one of them. Like I said, when you're running a flag Vindy, you need to have that comp focus around getting that Vindy doing what it wants to do. And you, when you've got a badger that can just stick three remote tracking computers or whatever it's got onto a Vindicator, that is massively helpful for that Vindicator. And for just two points, it's an absolute bargain in that scenario. I think a lot of other scenarios, it's probably not great, but in this particular one, I think it's very, very valuable. And flag Vindy? We'll see how it fares throughout the rest of the tournament. They're one of only a handful of teams that have brought it. Uh, most teams favoring this Bargus, but the Flag Bargus has only won once today. Uh, unfortunately for it, every other Flag Bargus has gone the way of the Dodo. Uh, we spoke a little bit uh, about the flagship choices uh, in the Alliance Tournament preview show. We saw a lot of uh, Flag Bargus 
why do you think that we have seen that throughout the tournament or, or have seen so many of them uh, being picked up? Uh, I think one of the strengths of the bar guest is it's just so versatile. You can fit it into a bunch of different comps. You can rush with it. You can kite with it. But I mean, as you say, they've all died today except for one, the one I spent 15 billion on included. Um, so maybe, um, you know, this this sort of idea of bar guest being the best choice is totally wrong. Although I know that a bunch of the, the top ech echelon teams also have their flag bar guest. They just haven't chosen to use them there. So it, on, you know, it could just be a skill issue. In fact, it probably is. Oh, you're you're calling your own team out by saying <laughs> skill issue. What, 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 what is this? You're not allowed to do that. Uh, either way, 30 seconds left in the match. This Kieran of Rusan saw. Uh, no one's on top of him at the moment. Uh, now the Mauler is. He should end up falling now. Yeah, so this is unfortunately going to be the end of the run for Esports Potopia. I remember, actually, I think it was, as you said, Alliance Open. They had a pretty impressive run, but unfortunately, it's going to be 0-2 for them this year. Paper number's going to move on in the lower bracket. That's going to be all from us today. Uh, of course, same time tomorrow, more matches, more explosions. Um, I've been the Basilisk. He's been Fear Vine. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, we actually lost a bet as CCP collectively, uh, so that's why that Alliance logo is in the game. Of course, you could change your Alliance by leaving, but that would be <laughs> kind of a jerk move. That kind like, of, oh, you don't like it? Ah, just this, leave. This logo sucks. I'm going to go join. Welcome to Eve Pandora. 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 Pay for numbers there, taking the victory as uh, Esports Potopia sadly exits from Alliance Tournament 18, becoming the third team to leave. We came in today with 32. We've gone through a whole bunch of matches and 29 teams remain going into day two tomorrow. Uh, that was our last match of the day and what a match it was. Park Bank, the, uh, the nearest pilot there for pay for numbers, just flew so well. He managed to uh, kite off and drag drones around and survive for two, maybe two and a half, absolutely critical minutes keeping himself and his team alive as the other team had to just keep shooting and shooting and shooting Bart how how important are just minutes like that when you just don't die I mean it's it's huge like we've talked about the tunnel visioning of DPS but it, like that's not a tunnel vision they just couldn't uh, finish him off but uh, especially when you're using something like a flag Vargas right where you have a limited number of shots and then you have to spend 35 ish seconds reloading um, maybe a little less depending on what the modules on it but uh two minutes is like when you add in the fact that you have the rapid heavy clipping it is just huge. Like it potentially won the match for them. So very, very good piloting on Park Bank's part. Absolutely. And we've seen Park Bank a number of times before in different uh, different tournaments. Uh, he always uh, flies super well. Uh, one of those uh, like rare logistics pilots that we talk about being like a critical member of the team. Anyway, as I mentioned, that was our last match of the day. Uh, so we are pretty much going to wrap up now. Uh, we're going to go to the pub and celebrate. Uh, and we'll, get, we'll be back tomorrow for more explosions uh, from 14.45 Eve time. Stick around as we're going to drop uh, all you lovely viewers onto the uh, Alliance Tournament After Show, hosted by DTM135 and 404 HD. I've been Ethica Hawk. Right now, I've got with me Jin Tan and Blackbird Pirate, and we have so many people. We'll talk about them more later on. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>